Good morning. How are you? Long time. It's so nice to see all of you, man. After a long time, some of you I recognize, some of you may not have seen me. Hi. So welcome to the revision classes. All right, guys. So it's gonna be three days of classes. A little bit of basics. Uh, it's gonna be three days. So on that note, let's begin, my dear friends. So if you see the summary book, we have all these clusters. Fourteen clusters are there. In fact, fifteen were there, but now, of course, because of uh, removal of some syllabus, uh, surface and all those things, we have made it 14 clusters. Uh, predominantly, as I told you, we'll be doing from this book itself, but whenever possible, wherever needed, we'll have to consult the other book also. So first of all, it is the uh, directors, that is the basics of the directors and all those things. That is, of course, important from the examination point of view. Everything is important here. A every cluster, one question will come for sure, guys, minimum. Generally, that's how it is. And uh, today, let's try to finish cluster 1, 2, and maybe 4. Because 3, if I do, tomorrow nobody will come. That is, loans to director is little tricky. It requires a you know, fresh mind. So tomorrow morning, we'll do that. Uh, when I say nobody will come, it means because it's slightly tricky. Because it uh, requires a fresh mind. So tomorrow morning, we shall do this. Uh, today, we will try to finish 1, 2, and board meetings also. Of course, it's a lot of work. But let's get on with it, OK? Shall we start? Brilliant. So first, director's basics, page number one. Page number one. Those of, who, those of you who do not like the AC, do not sit within that circumference. It's little, gets cold. You can shift elsewhere. All right, guys. So if you see, yes, if those of you don't have that uh, summary book, you can purchase it. If you don't want to purchase it, it's OK. You can see the screen. Everything is here in that. So it will be easier for you. So let us begin. Director, obviously, the definition says director means a director appointed to the board of a company. Means, it's an exhaustive definition. Means, no other meaning can be given. Okay, no other meaning can be given. It's not an inclusive definition. It's exhaustive. And means a director appointed to the board. So, basically, guys, you have to appoint a person to the board of directors of the company. Appointment provisions are given under 152.2, read with 160. So, only if you are appointed to the board of directors of, uh, you know, to the board, only then you will be called as a director. Which means if you are just, what do you say, controlling the show. If you are just controlling the show, in the sense you are not a director, but you are controlling the entire company. Now, that is not called as a director. He will be called as a shadow director. So, shadow directors are not liable, is it? They are liable, but under officer or, you know, officer, you know, that officer, one, one uh, definition is there. Then also officer in default is one more definition. Under officer in default, definitely they will be liable. So shadow directors are definitely not directors since they are not appointed. However, they are liable for actions of dummy directors as they are included in the definition of officer in default. And uh, 149 says every company. So using the concept of literal legis means literal construction. When I use the word every, it means every single company. Every company shall, shall has a mandatory force have a board of directors consisting of only individuals as directors. So obviously you can't have companies etc directors because you need to be, you need to have somebody responsible on the board of the company and if I lift the corporate veil, there should be people who are behind the show, who I make them liable. Can you just close the door buddy? Thank you. Uh, individually a person has no role to play as the director of the company unless specific authority is given to him. So basically authority should be given either by the act or the uh, shareholders. So, coming to the act as such, there is section 179, which speaks about two-tier management system. Company is at the center and it is controlled by two people. One is by the board of directors, one more by the shareholders. So, when I ask who is more powerful, it's not a clear-cut answer because for the day-to-day -day operations, the, who is powerful? Board of directors. And for the other things, it is shareholders. So under section 179 of the act one, it says whatever the company could have done, if company had brains of its own, who can do? Board of directors. But the shareholders cannot do those things which the board can do and board cannot do those things which the shareholders can do. Shareholders powers are limited. Shareholders powers are given under the act, under the AOA and MOA. So basically these uh, three uh, things govern the powers of the shareholders. Whereas for board, they have not given any powers as such. They have said whatever the company could have done, if company had brains of its own, then the board can do the same. So if specifically things are given in the act, for example, removal of director, it should only be done by the shareholders. 
and whatever is going in the AOA and MOA, then it should only be done by these people. Others cannot interfere. On the other hand, what will override what? Act will override AOA, MOA, or it's the other way around. So, yes, Section Six is very clear. Yes, Act only will override AOA and MOA. That we have seen. But there are certain areas where AOA and MOA, uh, the Act has given power to the AOA and MOA to sort of uh, go against what is given in the Act itself. For example, in quorum. In quorum provisions, it's how it is. Anyway, that is beside the point. Now, coming back to this, every company shall have a board of directors and the directors of the company collectively are the individuals who direct, manage, supervise and control the affairs of the company. Yes, but the shareholders, can they inspect the books of accounts of the company? Under section 128.3, shareholders cannot inspect the books of accounts. Unfortunately, they cannot inspect the books of accounts. Nevertheless, then what can shareholders do? So, shareholders have four incredible powers which are given to them by the Companies Act. One, of course, is the appointment of directors. Since you are linking it to directors, I am doing this. Uh, appointment of directors can only be done by shareholders under 152 to read with 160. Nobody else can do it, only the shareholders. Then, uh, removal of directors under 169 can only be done by these people. Third one, appointment of auditor. 139 and removal of auditor under 140. These four are called the pillars of corporate democracy. Nobody else has the power except the shareholders. So basically, this is what they do. Uh, 152 2 also says every company, uh, what do you say? Every director of the company shall be appointed by shareholders unless otherwise mentioned. So there are some other sections where power is given to the board to appoint the directors. But predominantly, if everything is silent, the only route to enter the company would be 152 to read with 160. And the only person who can throw out a director would be the shareholder. Directors cannot throw out directors. Similarly, auditor, that is you guys, very soon, uh, you can only be appointed by shareholders alone. And even you can be removed only by shareholders. Directors have absolutely no say. Directors can only recommend, but uh, removal can be done by, has to be done by shareholders only. So, the board, body corporate association, LLP, etc. cannot happen. They cannot, what do you say, become directors because of separate legal entity. You need to have some responsible people on board. NRI or foreign national also can definitely be a director. There is no hard and fast rule that they cannot be directors. Then there is of course no age limit also for uh, appointment of director. But uh, minor cannot be appointed as a director since minor obviously you need to obtain a DIN. So, you have to be a major. But uh, as a managing director, is there any age limit? Yes, 70 years. Beyond 70, you can. I'm not saying you cannot, but there are certain resolutions that you need to pass if you want to link it to cluster number 5. So, we have divided everything into clusters, which makes it very easy. Uh, this is how uh, even in the examination it will come. Uh, cluster 6 is one of the biggest clusters. Of course, a lot of marks will come, but every single thing is important. There can never be a question paper without a question on each of these clusters, especially, you know, board meetings, etc. Those are quite important. Uh, yeah, cool. Then uh, when they exceed their authority, whatever authority is given to them in the AOA, MOA, if they exceed, then it be, it's called as ultra virus. That is beyond the powers. They incur a personal liability. Apart from that, you know, whatever is relevant, we'll see. Uh, cool. Directors are generally not employees, but sometimes they'll be employees also. It depends on what type of contract it is. Is it a contract of service or for service? Depending on that, we need to see. Of course, we just did 179 as to see who is more powerful. So, four powers can be clearly segregated only to the shareholders and nobody else. Then uh, some important things that come in the exam is we need to know what is the meaning of business. We need to know what is the meaning of resolution because every step of the way we will be you know, seeing stuff. Uh, uh, ordinary resolution, special resolution. Ordinary business, special business. So we need to know. And of course, ordinary notice and special notice. So this chart will clear things up for us. Interesting to know that ordinary business is only four things that happen at the AGM. So two keywords are, it should be those four things. I, you can either call it the ADDA points or the DADA points. And it should happen at the annual general meeting. What are those? Adoption of accounts, declaration of dividend, appointment of director, appointment of auditor. If these four things happen at the AGM, only then it is called as ordinary. If the same ADDA points happen at EGM, it is called special. Similarly, if other than ADDA points happen at EGM, obviously any business that happen at EGM will be called as special. 
and other than ada points ap apart from these four anything else that is happening at the agm like amalgamation or uh, in, you know issue of bonus shares whatever it is then ultimately what will happen it will be called as a i mean special business even if it's happening at the agm so very simple to understand that if these ada the other points happen at the agm only then it will be called as ordinary business everything else will be called as special business very simple so that's regarding business so we should uh, understand what it is ordinary or special moving on resolution now resolution is given in 1141 and 1142 ordinary resolution and special resolution so the keywords are very simple notice under section 101 must be given in every ordinary resolution how many days notice would that be 21 clear days 21 clear days notice next the votes cast in favor must be greater than the votes cast against the votes cast in favor must be greater than votes cast against so if there are let us say 1200 people 1000 uh, are equity shareholders and 200 are preference shareholders uh, what is the ordinary resolution 601 or 501 501 because preference shareholders as per section 47 of companies act do not have voting rights so only equity shareholders have voting rights now in this uh, 1000 equity shareholders 800 actually come for the meeting 200 go and watch a movie so in this 501 or 401, 401. yes of course it is 401 because of course those who come uh, to the meeting only of this uh, 800 people there are only 700 people who are genuinely interested who want to come for the voting and the remaining 100 check on the catering and they are only coming for other things right eating now this now is it 351 or is it 401 yes because of this dialogue here those who are entitled and voting the entitled means what right which only equity shareholders voting means what they actually have to vote present and voting simple so these are the keywords an examiner will only see these keywords guys that's it that is regarding ordinary resolution moving on to special resolution notice has to be given same under 101 notice must mention that the intended resolution is a special resolution so if this dialogue is not there in the notice even if you pass a 90% majority 95% majority it would be void so most important thing in the notice you should clearly mention that the intended resolution that i am going to pass today will be a special resolution and majority here mind you it is more than half in ordinary resolution whereas in special resolution it is greater than or equal to 3/4 that is votes cast in favor must be at least 3 times the votes cast again so 3/4 majority is what you can think of 75% and again those who are entitled and voting same so these are the keywords with respect to resolution very very simple you just stick to these keywords you will get full marks uh coming to notice and of course in resolution there is one more type of resolution called unanimous means what everyone will agree that we'll see later so notice notice we have what ordinary notice and special notice ordinary notice and special notice so what is ordinary notice ordinary notice is 21 clear days before the meeting now what is clear is unclear that's the best part we don't know what is clear so we need to use some interpretation of statute and then we'll figure out that when i say 21 clear days date of sending the notice and date of the meeting must be excluded So when I send the notice, that should be excluded, and also the date of the meeting must be excluded, and also because of course it says before the meeting, so that's one interpretation uh, using reasonable construction. And one more is what if sent via post, then 48 hours postal transit is to be excluded. So basically, if I am sending anything via post, it will be 21 plus 2 plus 2. If I am sending anything via email, it will be 21 plus 2. So there is a combination of harmonious construction and reasonable construction. If you have never heard this in your life, forget it, leave it. It's not important. So this is a regarding ordinary notice. Then special notice. Special notice is what section one one five red with uh, rule number twenty three. This rule and all is just to show off. Don't use this in the exam. You can't remember. Leave it. So next, uh, what is this? One percent voting power or five lakh paid up capital. Though the act says uh, maximum five lakh, it's pretty stupid. It's minimum five lakh. Again, we have seen in the regular batch that it should be treated as minimum five lakh. Okay, it's not maximum five lakh. Anyway, anybody. So the beauty about ordinary notice is origination is from the company. I mean the board or the shareholders, board of directors. Who will give ordinary notice? Board. So it's again interesting to know here. Again, it comes back to this uh, particular chart. Who is more powerful and all those things? Then, if the act is silent, no general rule. If the act is silent, it doesn't give who should do. Then who should do it? Board of directors. So if you see the notice section under one zero one, nobody tells who should give it. So who should give it? Obviously, board of directors. 
A peculiar thing about special notices, this is coming not from the board of directors, it is coming from shareholders. How many shareholders? 1% voting power or 5 lakh paid up capital. Such members will give a special notice. To whom? To the company. And uh, what, are the, what is the timeline? Not earlier than 3 months. Not earlier than 3 months and not less than 14 days before the meeting, right? And the company will give it to all members when? Not less than 7 days before the meeting, uh, they will give it to all members. You can come in normal aram say clothing tomorrow, don't wear jeans and all that. Come in you know track pant if you want. Come in shorts guys, I have no problem. You can bring something to eat also. You can eat in class, I have no problem. To drink also water. Uh, uh, water you can bring, yes. Uh, and other things if you want. Other things means juice and etc. You can bring. Be comfortable guys because it's uh, going to be long classes. So come, you know, as comfortable as you would be at home, you come here, no issues. Coming, moving on. So 1% voting power, 5 lakh, not earlier than, I have to wear all this because I have to record, otherwise I would have come in normal thing, yes. Now, then company to all members, not less than 7 days and uh, before the meeting you should give. Next, special notice can only be given in 4 cases, that's all, only 4 cases. So what are the 4 cases? These are the only 4 cases in the whole Companies Act where special notice is given. Initiated by whom? Members. Not anybody else, members. So what are they? First, 169.2, removal of director before his expiry, no, before expiry of his term. Before expiry of his term. Before expiry of his term. 169.5, appointment of new director in place of old director who is removed at the same meeting. So in this what I will do, I will remove a director, I do not know who to replace him with. In this what I will do, not even, not, not only will I remove a director but also appoint a new fellow in his place. Now in this case I would need a special notice. The act clearly mentions the word special notice. On the other hand, 140 subsection 4. And this I can say it is removal of director before expiry. Removal of director before expiry of his term. Fair enough. Do you require a special notice for removal of auditor also? No. Removal of auditor before expiry of his term is given under 140. 140 subsection 1 does not talk about special notice at all. It talks about special resolution. Both are different. Special notice, special resolution both are different. You cannot combine them. So basically, why do you need special notice? It is not for removal of auditor. No, it is actually replacement of auditor. When? At the AGM. So if you see appointment of auditor other than the retiring auditor, expressly providing that retiring auditor shall not be reappointed. They have used the word retiring, which means you know in auditor's uh, provisions, you know. There is no space, let me write here. Auditor's provisions, you know, one auditor will be appointed from what? First AGM till the conclusion of the sixth AGM and thereafter again 11th AGM like that. So basically that if two terms, then if it is rotation is applicable for firm two terms after that cooling period, all that you know. Between first AGM to sixth AGM and between the sixth and 11th AGM, whatever, if I throw you out here, if I throw you out here, this is 140 subsection 1. This requires special resolution. It does not require special notice, mind you. Special notice is needed only here, retiring auditor, 6th, 11th, etc. Uh, predominantly it is called replacement of auditor. So this auditor is on 6th AGM, he can continue, I do not want him to continue. So I will have to pass a special notice. But let us suppose you have a rotation mechanism for a firm, uh, two terms they have already done. Here mandatorily I have to replace, right? Anyway I have to replace. Should I pass special notice? No. Special notice is not required, these are some hidden points, special notice is not required when the rotation is applicable and obviously you have finished your, your exp, the term is expired already, so that is fine. But here you can continue but I do not want him to continue, then only I have to pass a special notice. So it is actually for replacement of auditor, not removal of auditor, it is a wrong notion. So appointment of auditor other than retiring auditor expressly providing that retiring auditor shall not be reappointed. These two are different than removal of auditor before expiry. This is removal, actually the institute unfortunately uses the word removal only. They use the word removal of auditor on or after expiry. They only should understand what it means but anyway. They use removal on expiry or after expiry. It is actually replacement of auditor but since they use the term, let us stick to that. So removal of auditor on or after expiry of the term whereas this is removal of director before expiry. So as a corollary, which are the cases where special notice is not needed? 
removal of director on expiry in the sense when his term is over i have to replace him not needed or second one removal of auditor before expiry of his term not needed special notice not needed a special notice can only be sent to him in four cases that's about notices we have ordinary notice special notice then resolution you have ordinary special and unanimous also we'll see that later then items of business would be ordinary and special so this is the basics for us based on which we should can dive into concept of disqualification of directors so first we are entering into cluster number 1 now disqualification of directors so we need to understand that whenever a director is coming into the company for the first time ever or when he is being reappointed either appointed or reappointed whatever the case may be what would it be called as it will be called you have to check whether he is qualified or not that is section 164 i need to check whether he is qualified or disqualified that's called section 164 after he enters the company 164 will no longer come i have to see other things like if the pointers under 167 is covered vacation of office or if he chooses to resign he doesn't want to continue section 168 or i can remove him also as a shareholder 169 and there once you enter the company you will go into a rotation mechanism that is 1526 so basically rotation is different from vacation vacation is different from resignation resignation is different from removal so we cannot say that when a director vacates office is removed technically is removed english word but you cannot use that in the exam when i say removal it is very technical 169 only when i say resign it is 168 only when you say rotate it is 1526 itself so words are not interchangeable and you cannot use the word disqualification disqualification is only at the point of entry so how does he enter the company under 164 so based on that we need to see this So 164 sets the grounds which makes a person in ineligible to become a director. Thus, 164 arises only at the point when a person is proposed to be appointed. 167, on the other hand, sets the grounds for automatic vacation. If any of those points come, automatically is vacated. Now, 164, one, a person shall not be qualified. So it divided into two subsections: 164, one and 164, two. Uh, both are, of course, important. so there are few pointers let's see first of all he is an unsound mind this section doesn't apply to women directors no he includes she let's say he includes she general clauses act he is a, of unsound mind unsound mind means what declared by a competent court so unsound mind is a medical condition as well as a mental condition it is both it should be certified by the court if you tell that fellow is on mental guy it doesn't work it should be what medical and mental condition certified by the doctor of course approved by the court and what do you mean by court here court if you see the definition it is district court high court and special court why is supreme court not there supreme court will only look at question of law it doesn't see whether you are unsound or not they will see the law whether the law is framed properly or not that's why court is only district court high court special court all there is in the definition it's just revision that's why second is an undischarged insolvent b and c should be read together is an undischarged insolvent he has applied to be adjudicated as an insolvent and application is pending so basically if uh, under ibc now you can also go uh, you know as an individual you can go for insolvency once it is notified of course but yeah under personal guarantor route they have already notified it anyway so if i enter the i mean let's say like 8th march i apply to the court to be adjudicated as an insolvent and the application is pending till 8th may assume so 8th may 22 it must be done now these people will obviously take some time the court will now say that until the liabilities are i mean of course assets are taken over sold and liabilities are set off everything i will give you let's say one year for one year 8 march 23 you are not discharged from the tag of being called as an insolvent that's why it's called as an undischarged insolvent so from 8th may 2022 to 8th may 2023 you are called as an undischarged insolvent you are not discharged from the tag of being called as an insolvent hence you cannot be a director on the other hand from 8th march 22 to 8th may 22 you have applied to be adjudicated as an insolvent and your application is pending so this is point number c this is point number b this is undischarged insolvent c is what you have applied to the court to be adjudicated as an insolvent under ibc if your friend if you have if you owe 1000 rupees to your friend every day coffee tea you go and you have not paid on split wise the balance is showing 1016 can he sue you under ibc 
under IBC, yeah, 1000 rupees you can sue you, it is not yet notified. So, start clearing your bills immediately, right. So, if you see 1000 rupees, he can sue you under IBC. Now, your friend has gone to the court and told my friend has not paid 1000, insolvency proceedings has to come against him. Now, can you become a director from 8th March 2022 to 8th May 2022? You have not applied, your friend has applied. Yes, you are qualified guys because it says he has applied to be adjudicated as an insolvent and the application is pending. He, not his friend. So, the proposed director has to apply. If a creditor has applied, then there is no disqualification until the application is pending. Next is an interesting point. He has been convicted by a court of an offence involving moral turpitude or otherwise it says and sentenced to imprisonment. So, wherever interpretation points are there given in purple and the keywords are given in red. Convicted, the key word is convicted guys. Convicted means proven guilty by a criminal court. Please do not use in the exam committed, even though you are committed, charged, accused. Do not use these words. In the exam, it will be dangerous. By a court, by a court and court again, of course, here is a criminal court because civil court cannot convict you. So, it is a criminal court here in this context. Uh, offense involving moral turpitude. Now, what is moral turpitude? Something that shocks the moral values framed by society, moral conscience of a society. So, if uh, like Ramalinga Raju, he committed that fraud, it shocked the entire conscience of a society. Any uh, person in high office, if he commits any fraud, etc., then of course, that would be the scene. In cricket, if you take the example of uh, David Warner and Stephen Smith, who did the ball tampering, though actually the ball tampering is the least offence in the uh, list of offence of ICC, it shocked the conscience of the uh, sporting country called Australia. That is why they were banned. So, basically this will be decided by the court. It is not the degree of the offence actually, it is the shock value. So, uh, me and you cannot decide that, court will decide. Or otherwise, now otherwise can be other than moral turpitude. If it is otherwise than moral turpitude, then there is no need to give moral turpitude. You can simply say any offence. So, here otherwise should be read as, of course, they have given in the definition rules. It is offence under Companies Act only. Offence under Companies Act. And sentenced to imprisonment for a minimum of 6 months. Minimum of 6 months. So, basically, if you have been convicted by a court, but you have been sentenced to imprisonment for 5 months, you can still be liable no problem only the minimum sentence should be what six months and if the six months is getting triggered the next point also gets triggered five years has not completed from the date of the expiry of the sentence so if i have been charged of moral turpitude on 8th march 22 and imprisoned for one year let's say 8th march 23 so i'll have i am disqualified for five years from 22 or five years from 23 five years from 22 or 23 Yes, 5 years from 23 because it says date of expiry of the sentence, date of expiry of the sentence, not date of conviction. So, if I am uh, sentenced for 3 years, 5 plus 3, 4 years, 5 plus 4 like that and uh, connecting it with auditing under auditor's provisions disqualification 141, if you are convicted for fraud etc, you are not, you cannot, what do you say, become an auditor for 10 years from the date of dash conviction, that is the date of conviction. So, here that sentence is also covered there, slight difference between the two. Not 5 years from the date of conviction. So, it is not 5 years from the date of conviction, it is from the expiry of the sentence. What if he is convicted for 8 years? So, one extra proviso is there, if convicted for 7 years or more, permanent disqualification, permanent disqualification. So, that is how it is and uh, let us say you would have seen no, on good behavior they have reduced the sentence etc. So, reduction of the sentence does not mean the conviction is removed like Sanjay Dutt was left for good behavior, sorry good behavior correct. So, he was let out early. So, that obviously is what reduction of sentence does not mean that the conviction is removed only if the conviction is removed like Salman boy there is a app called Salman boy I do not know if you know it was deleted. So, like Salman Khan, if uh, that if the con conviction is removed, in that case conviction was removed. So, the, there were 7 people who died, nobody know, knew who killed him, even the driver did not kill him. So, then the, con the f initial court convicted him, the higher court because of lack of evidence, what did they do? They removed the conviction. Now, Salman Khan can definitely become director. On the other hand, uh, Sanjay Dutt, he was convicted, but they reduced the sentence based on good behavior because law punishes the body or the mind, law punishes the mind. That concept is called mens rea. It 
punishes the mind only not the body body is attached to the mind so no choice so if you see if i on good behavior or sentence is reduced to like 2 years 1 year the 5 years will become from the reduced sentence but no way conviction is removed unless they remove the conviction itself that is you know rare next an order disqualifying him has been passed by a court or tribunal this can be any order uh, which is under companies act even the tribunal can pass under mismanagement operation etc for fraud misfeasance whatever the case may be these are any reasons next he has not paid any calls on any share since they have used the word any share it can be any share equity or preference but predominantly uh, generally articles will say it's only equity because voting rights are there now if i have not paid call money i am a shareholder of a limited and shareholder of b limited i have not paid call money for of a limited and 6 months have already elapsed from the last day fixed for the payment of the call what to do in b limited i have paid in a limited i have not paid in both the companies i am a shareholder in both the companies now i want i am proposed to be appointed as a director i am disqualified from both the companies or only a, a? only a because i have not paid call money in a so if you see there because they use the word any calls of any shares of the company the company means which company the company in which is proposed to be appointed as a director either singly singly or jointly single holding or joint holding will be taken into account uh, and 6 months have elapsed from the last day fixed for the payment of the call last day fixed for the payment of the call it has been taken into account any calls any shares the company not a company the company next he has been convicted of the offence relating to related party transactions under section 188 so when we see cluster 8 we will see and moreover they use the word convicted it is difficult to get a conviction under related party because it's a civil offence so it is wrongly framed but nevertheless it's there based on this there was an examination question mind you first question in one of those papers two three uh, attempts before they had asked that you know this guy had did all these things uh, will he be liable to be appointed in uh, okay can he be appointed in some other company 90% of them wrote yeah he cannot be because 188 provisions no here they have used the word convicted there they say he was uh, what do you say accused of uh, 188 offense and the board of directors said it was definitely contravention of 188 contravention of 188 will not result in disqualification it is only conviction that's why it is marked in red so already asked in the exam so like this they are asking we need to be very careful next not complied with din provisions december 21 paper you have seen yes that's all not complied with din provisions but it's okay you guys can manage it's just about you know seeing the reading between the lines Uh, not complied with din provisions so if you have not complied with the uh, of course din provisions if not obtained din if you have obtained duplicate din if kyc is not proper and of course gone next he has not complied with section 165 what is this this is yes maximum number of directorships that can be held if you can do that is 20 companies of which 20, 10 are public so in this if you are what do you say if you have breached that limit more than 20 etc or more than 10 public then you are liable to be disqualified that's how it is now practically how it happens and all in revision class not needed uh, 164 1 will apply to all companies no doubt about it whether it's private company public company and it applies to all types of directors unless otherwise clearly specified 164 1 is this very very simple keywords are given just study this and go one day before the exam you sort it 164 2 on the other hand is a, a very interesting director of the company will be disqualified if the company has not filed financial statements and annual returns for three continuous financial years should not have filed both financial statements and annual returns financial statement should be filed within dash how many days 30 days from the jmin form number aoc4 annual returns should be filed dash 60 days section number 92 in form number mjt7 if you have not filed both for how many years three continuous financial years then de definitely you will be disqualified that is one part second part company which has not okay let's come to that and come to this point later so there are various scenarios so scenario number 1 financial statement has been filed annual returns have not been filed so that definitely there is a problem second scenario uh, financial statement has not been filed annual returns have been filed that is also a problem because i have to file both if both are not filed then definitely problem only if both have been filed only then there is 
no problem so let me just go to my uh, regular module to do some exercises here just to understand whether you will be disqualified or not financial statement filed annual returns not filed problem or not yes definitely there is an issue then uh, what do you say uh, first one the financial statement not filed annual returns also not uh, annual returns have been filed still it's a problem both have not been filed problem so the problem will arise when it is 3p because i have not filed either three years continuously if it's a problem only then it results in disqualification second example uh, both not filed in the first year problem both filed in the second year now no problem third year both not filed problem since there is no 3p concept here it is not continuous uh, what do you say contravention so there is no disqualification here is qualified on the other hand this one uh, yeah one not filed problem one not filed problem one not filed problem so definitely disqualified fourth one is interesting uh, first one of course you know problem second one problem third one i have not filed both on due date but what i'll do immediately i'll file belated returns by paying all that fine whatever is needed i'll pay now the thing is belated filing will it cure the disqualification no mci has told belated filing will only cure the defect what is defect not filing on time but it will never cure the disqualification if it was yes no i could I, this section is waste then i can easily pay money and uh, file related returns so basically belated filing will not cure the that anyway will be here so it should be continuous years continuous years and not anything else if you see here even if the default sub subsequently cured I'm reading my summary notes point number 6 even where the default is subsequently cured by belated filing the disqualification shall remain once defaulted subsequent rectification of default is of no consequence belated filing will cure the defect but not the disqualification that's what it is uh, then that is the first part of it and then the second one the company which has not paid or repaid triple d points what is that dividend debentures and interest deposits and interest interesting to know dividend and interest on dividend is not covered dividend is covered debentures and interest is covered deposit and interest is covered and here they have used the word repay debentures repay deposits because that's you have taken money you need to repay and repay you will have to pay interest dividend is no repayment dividend is just payment that's why they have used the word paid failure to pay dividend interest on dividend of course it is there but it's under different sections it will not come under this so if you have not paid interest it's okay under 164 it's not okay under 123 where it's okay under 164 no problem but if you have not paid uh, dividend and it's not just dividend now it is what failure continues for one year or more failure continues for one year or more interesting to note in 1642a the failure is not one year failure is immediately in the three continuous financial years if it is over from the due date itself like for example 30 days you have to file financial statement 60 days annual returns so on 31st day only or 61st day only it will happen that is after 3 years here on the other hand even though you have committed a default it's okay i will give you time for how long one year failure if it continues for one year or more only then there is a problem so there is an internal relaxation here for one year so if it's interesting to know under 1642a the punishment is for non filing whereas under 1642b the punishment is not for non paying or non repaying the punishment is for your negligence for waiting for one year that is the interesting point here the con failure continues for one year or more that's the logic so that's why there are two separate subsections or clauses otherwise they could have just given one and closed it so here the punishment is for waiting for one year whereas here it's a another thing now because it's one year waiting there can be various scenarios uh it's given here and when i say failure to pay first of all your failure to pay dividend what what failure is that failure to pay after declaration of dividend or is it failure to transfer to a separate bank account after declaration or is it failure to transfer to uh, what do you say unpaid dividend account after 30 days or is it failure to transfer to iepf account if no one has claimed what is the failure to pay here yes failure to pay only after declaration that's it that's the only failure to pay nothing else Uh, moving on uh, if you see failure to pay interest repayment uh, again again interest on dividend not covered repayment of loans not covered though 
if you see here deposit if you see the definition of deposit deposit includes a loan but in deposit rules they have clearly excluded term loans term loans or long term loans etc or loans given by banking uh, or financial institutions are not within the purview of deposits hence even if you do not pay loan even if you do not pay interest even if you do not pay any working capital loan taken from a bank or financial institution even if you don't repay for over a year it's okay it will not result in disqualification right npa and other things will happen but will not result definitely in disqualification that's what it is very simple moving on eighth point uh, director on due date now the thing is because there is a one year gap many scenarios will arise first one you are a director on due date what is the due date the date on which you are supposed to pay those triple d points but on the effective date that is one year later that time also you were a director obviously you will be disqualified because you were not only a director on the due date but continued to do so even on the effective date second you are a director on the due date yes but okay the reverse uh, okay we'll come to that step by step only we'll go no problem but one few days before the effective date you have resigned now i need to see what was the reason for your resignation did you resign to escape because you are the person who knows the law you know that if i continue gone because the punishment is for what continues for one year or more continues for one year or what if i don't continue only i am no longer a director on the date of effective date so can i escape so here it depends if you are has been continuously following up with the company to rectify the defaults then you can resign before the effective date by giving reasons to the roc in this case disqualification will not apply generally under section 168 uh, do you have to give reasons to the roc of your resignation law says may give reason may give reason means may or may not but basically if you want to protect yourself should you give or should you not give yes so only in this context this resignation uh, reasons may will be read as shall may will be read as shall so generally director may give reason for resi resigning under 168 but uh, if it is what do you say if he is resigning before the effective date and is been following up the company to pay and they are not doing it then if he wants to escape obviously to protect himself yes he has to give detailed reasons while giving resignation right if b has resigned just to escape disqualification without putting any efforts to rectify the defects then the disqualification will definitely apply so here i need to see the intention on the other hand Bak bakra director c poor guy he was not a director on due date some 3 months before the effective date he became a director so he just joined then he has to leave is it like that no to sort of give some hope to these people they have inserted a you know amendment which anyway it's no no longer an amendment it's little old only now what does it say it shall not incur he shall not incur the disqualification for a period of 6 months from the date of what as appointment date of his appointment so the idea is 6 months time is there you will see what you can do you can probably ensure that you know it is uh, it's rectified or you resign right that's what it says so this is one extra point that has been given so these are the three scenarios so also uh, the disqualification will be for how long it is always from 5 years so under 164 to it says 5 years from the date from the date where you fail to do so fail to do so means what and our point number is very easy due date you did not pay 5 years but point number b it creates confusion because there is one year gap so is it 5 years from due date or 5 years from effective date because one year later only effective date will come is it 5 years like for example in 22 i had to pay one year 23 i have now 5 years the uh, continuously you have not done for one year so definitely uh, disqualification will arise okay fair enough but it is is it 5 years from 22 or 5 years from 23 <laughs> yes it is 5 years from actually 22 itself because the wordings 164 2 is there a and b is there and then 5 years comes so that 5 years should be read for both a and b and the common point of a and b is what date of default only so it should be read as 5 years from the date of default and not from the effective date of default anywhere in any book if anything ulta is given 100% wrong correct so please stick to this it is 100 there are some things where uh, two interpretations can be made and there are some places where it is blatantly wrong so this is one case where anything else given would be 100% wrong so please take this into account even icai feels the i mean icai interpretation also is the same 
So we'll just stick to what ICI says because that's what we are here for. What I say doesn't matter, but I say also says the same thing. Yes, so you need to keep that in mind. Anyway, coming here, if you see here, yes, uh, 164 2A, point number nine, five years from the date of default is one, and 164 2B, five years from the date of default itself, or four years from effective date of default under 2B, of course, because that one year is a relaxation given. 164-2A covers only filing default, whereas 164-2B covers financial default because you are, you know, uh, leaving it just like that for one year. That is not done. Now, interesting point is Mr. X is already a director of company A, which is a defaulting company under 164-2. He is also a director in company B. Company B, there is no default. The question is, and there is now a default of 164-2, mind you, that is what I have told in company A. Three questions asked in November 17, first question only four marks. How long should he, I mean, should he vacate his office as a director in both these companies? No. Second, how long can he continue as a director in both these companies? And can he be reappointed in both the companies? Reappointed at least we can answer no. He cannot reappoint, be reappointed in both the companies for sure because it is qualified. Now, should he vacate his office? Now, 164 is disqualification. After he enters, I told you, you should forget about 164. Then it is only 167. 167 1A actually links to 164. They say the moment you are disqualified under 164, you will have to vacate your office, which means uh, disqualification is not only at the point of entry, but also after entry, but not under 164, but through 167 1A. So 167 1A. So basically, it links both. Technically speaking, whenever I say, yes, you will have to vacate your office, that office will be the defaulting office, obviously. But by a logic which I explained for over 40 minutes in regular batch, we will not be doing it now. For 164.2 alone, they have reversed the concept. For 164.2, if there is a default, you will vacate in which company? Ideally in the defaulting company, but here reverse. You will vacate in the other company, but you will continue here in the defaulting company will continue here in the defaulting company, right? So if you see here, there, he should vacate in company B. Should he vacate as that in both the companies? Should only vacate in company B, which is a non-defaulting company. Only under 164.2 reverse concept. In any other 164.1 ABCD and all those things, only in the defaulting company will have to vacate. Only in 164.2, you will continue in the defaulting company, but you will vacate in the other companies. So, but can continue in company A. But a second one, how long can he continue that in both the companies? In both the companies, how long will he continue? In uh, B, there is no concept of continuation. Only in A, can continue till the end of the tenure. He will be in that company which has committed default. Third, can he be appointed in both the companies? Reappointed? No. Every reappointment is a fresh appointment which requires 164 compliance. So, obviously, he cannot be appointed or reappointed in any company for how many years? Five years. That is fine. That is absolutely fine. Now, private company can uh, provide additional disqualification points because uh, public money is not involved. They can have whatever they want. They can say you should be a CA. Yes. First attempt only. I'm just saying. You can add whatever you want. Private company. Your money is not involved. Uh, only private money is involved. Public money is not involved. So, they can provide additional disqualifications, but not public company. And 164.2 shall not apply to a government company which has not committed a default in filing its financial statements or annual return. But if it has committed default, then for that also 164.2 will apply. Now, 164.2 actually applies to all directors, honestly speaking. But ICI is of the view that 164.2 will not apply to nominee director. Right? So, in this revision batch, you are only sticking to ICI view, obviously. So, you should stick to this view. Though it is 100% wrong, but leave it. For the, to get the uh, marks, you have to write this. So, please write only this, nothing else. 164.2 will not apply to a nominee director as per ICI. Y and all is out of syllabus. Yes. Director to inform company about disqualification, DIR 8, and con company to inform ROC about 164.2 non compliance in DIR 9. That's all. These are the important pointers of this particular section. Very simple. Now moving on to number of directors and directorships. Uh, number of directors are given in 149.1. Public, private, OPC. 
public members how many members can be there guys seven in ca inter we studied uh, mem unlimited members in case of pub uh, public company directors on the other hand three minimum or oh, uh, maximum 15 private company minimum members two maximum members 200 directors two maximum 15 as far as opc members are one maximum members also as one that's why it's opc one person company on the other hand directors can be minimum one maximum can be 15 anyway in private public and all these things if the directors are going beyond 15 i can obviously do so by passing a special resolution but mind you i cannot start a company with 18 directors I can start with less than 15 or 15 if i want to go beyond 15 pass a special resolution whenever i use the word special resolution three things should come to mind one notice must be given second in the notice please mention that the intended resolution is special third one three fourth that is minimum 75 percent so that's what it is very very simple and is opc is opc a private company yes opc is a private company then you have other things also like small company and all that that you should know what is a small company again it is a private company it has been amended that's why i'm saying what is the paid up capital now two crore less than or equal to two crore and turnover how much 20 so this is the amendment it is amended figures so paid up capital minimum less than or equal to 2 cr sorry not minimum less than or equal to 2 cr and and not or and turnover should be less than or equal to 20 crore earlier it was 50 lakhs and 2 crore change now right so you, this you should keep in mind opc also can a non-resident be, become a member of opc earlier and all it was not possible but nirmal aunties changed everything so what is it now opc yes resident or otherwise that's the amendment and uh, generally resident was the definition where 180 days and all you should be 180 days now nothing it is 120 days this is actually inter syllabus but you should know opc now 120 days in the previous year if you stay you are called as a resident under opc regulations right that is the change now that's all anyway now maximum number of 15 directors etc will not apply to government company and section 8 company section 8 company is for a philanthropic purpose it is obviously to help people more the merrier is what they say so for section 8 company and for government company more than that maximum number will not apply now some examples here again obviously we have not defaulted in filing a financial statement or annual return you can't make a default there and then uh, take the benefits of all these things so if there are 12 directors as per articles and the number of directors in the company are also 12 now i'm making it 17 two types of special resolutions are needed one special resolution under section 13 why amendment of aoa alteration of uh, sorry yeah, moa that is alteration of moa because in memorandum uh, aoa and moa you will have these provisions so you will have to amend them and 149 1b 149 1b section 13 and 14 you write actually you can add that you should uh, alter the articles of association and memorandum in case it's needed otherwise it's okay 149 1b that is what special resolution 149 1b is special resolution under the different section so guys two special resolutions are needed one if the articles are fixing only 12 i have to amend the articles that is section 14 please make the change and then what resolution special resolution then one more in the same meeting two special resolutions are to be passed one is to amend the article second one is to amend i mean to increase the limit to beyond 15 now if there are already 15 as per articles and uh, number of directors in the company is 13 from 13 to 15 if i have to make nothing no special resolution or any uh, or, or section directors will be appointed by passing you know 152 to red with 160 now in the law if everything is silent what resolution will i pass ordinary resolution for it to be called a special resolution clearly the word special resolution will be mentioned otherwise it's always ordinary on the other hand there are 17 directors as per the articles which means some some before only they have already passed a special resolution it's already 17 and now i have 15 to make from 15 to 17 what do you think because i'm going beyond 15 right so this is for any other company uh, for that matter so i have to pass a special resolution very very simple now one more thing they can ask in the exam this is okay they have never asked but this they have asked many times what if the number of directors will fall below the statutory minimum statutory minimum is this no three and all that what if it reduces below that for example uh, there are company has three directors one out of three directors have resigned but the quorum is still can be formed two directors are quorum 
statutory minimum of director in a public company is three. What has happened now? It has fallen below the statutory limit, but quorum can still be formed. So what to do? First, I should convene a board meeting or an extraordinary general meeting to appoint directors. Board meeting by the power vested under 179, they can call any EGM can be called by board or any board meeting. I mean, they'll only convene a board meeting and appoint one additional director or they will call an EGM. Again, by the power vested under 179, they can call an extraordinary general meeting and ultimately give the power to the shareholders. Any business transacted after such reduction, apart from increasing the number of directors, any other business means anything that you do would be invalid. Now, if two out of three resign, which means the company only has one director, quorum actually is two, salary minimum is three, but you have only one director. Now, that one director can appoint one more director to form the quorum. And once that happens, it goes back to the same scenario. Or best is convene a EGM. Let the shareholders appoint directors as they want. It's the best solution. Now, if all three resigned, company becomes directorless. Then what to do? Promoters. Yeah, promoters will become directors. And in their absence, the central government will appoint temporary directors until shareholders appoint directors in EGM. How can uh, in their absence, it means sometimes companies may not have promoters, they would have left. For example, your uh, LNT, LNT doesn't have any promoters only now. So whoever had started have left. Now if all the directors resign, then of course the, there are no promoters, so central government will come and they will appoint temporary directors only, temporary, until what? Shareholders appoint directors in EGM. So that's all, it is very simple. And of course, a person shall not be a director in more than 20 companies at the same time, including any alternate directorship. In the 20 companies, maximum 10 companies can be public. So out of 20, 10 can be public. For calculating the ceiling of uh, 20, there is slight mistake here, guys. Uh, some of you, one of you have pointed out, there is a typo error. You have to uh, change it here. Section 8 company should be excluded. Though it is correctly given in the table, here the type that should be excluded is missing. Section 8 company for calculating the ceiling of 20, Section 8 company should be excluded and private company that is neither holding or subsidiary of a public company, what? Included or excluded? In the ceiling of 20. In the ceiling of 20. The ceiling of 20. That has to be included. In the ceiling of 20, guys, nothing else. In the ceiling of 20, you should include it. Right? Anyway, the table will make it very clear. Don't worry. Just stick to the table. Dormant company, on the other hand. Dormant company, it is very peculiar, but it's ICI view. Dormant company, dormant public company especially, should be excluded from 20, but included in 10. It's weird. ICI view. Right? Excluded from 20, included in 10. Right, but uh, this thing, the section 8 company to be excluded, private company to include, you leave this, you stick to the table, table is fine. So let's see the table. Directorship in a government company incorporated as a public company, of course, since it's a public company, in 20 also it will come, in 10 also it will come. First column is 20, second column is 10. Will be included or excluded is the question. Directorship in a public sector undertaking being a company, in 20 also it will come. In 10 also it will come. Directorship in a foreign, it's, I'm talking about PSU being a company. That's why both it will come. In a foreign company, foreign company is a company which is not incorporated in India. So if I am a director in Tesla, for example, I am not, not incorporated in India, so a company that will not come. So obviously, both the cases, it is a no. Directorship in a foreign company, which is a subsidiary or holding company of a company incorporated in India. Still, it's a foreign company incorporated outside India. So basically it doesn't matter. Directorship in a foreign body corporate. Now body corporate of course is not a company. It can other forms it has. Not being a foreign company, obviously no. Companies Act will not come at all there. Next, directorship in a company licensed under section 8 of the Companies Act. So clearly the explanation to that section says it is not included at all. It will not come in both. Small shareholder directorship in a listed public company. Doesn't matter what type of uh, director you are. Since it's a listed public company, it will come in 20 also, it will come in 10 also. Holding directorship in a public company as a nominee director, doesn't matter what type of director you are, it will be covered in both the cases. 
holding directorship in a public company as an alternate director because including alternate directorship is what is given here including alternate directorships so what should i take yes include both holding directorship in a public company as a managing director or a whole time right? i don't care in what capacity you are holding since it is public company both uh ah, holding directorship in a pure private company of course include in 20 but exclude in 10 that is what the same thing was there directorship in a private company which is a subsidiary of a public company so any private company which is a subsidiary of a public company is deemed to be a public company is deemed to be a public company so what should i do include obviously in 20 include in 10 also so we have seen the definition of uh, you know pu public company and private company in private company especially and even in a public company what is it for example what is deemed public company if you are a private company x private limited but you happen to be the holding company happens to be a public company why limited so if you are a subsidiary of a uh, holding company is a public company or if you x private limited is a subsidiary of a public company this is what deemed to be a public company so obviously if i am a director of this company this will anyway be included in 20 and 10 what about this same it will be of course in uh, included in both included in both when i say pure private company doesn't have any holding subsidiary no relationship it doesn't have anything that's why it will be included in 20 but not included in 10 what about the reverse case private company which is a you know holding company of a public company reverse so x private limited is holding y limited so generally is this a public company no is it a deemed public company no it is no for the for the purposes of 2 clause 68 and 2 clause 71 this is definitely not a deemed public company but under this explanation 1 they have told if you are a private company which is a holding company of a public company it is deemed to be a public company and counted in 20 it is counted in 20 will it be counted in 10 yes obviously if it's counted in 20 it will be counted in 10 also correct it will be counted in both the companies it will be counted in 10 also 20 also directorship in a dormant company which is a public company dormant so what is a dormant company under section 455 dormant is obviously if you have do not have any significant accounting transaction of the past two years or if you are holding on to a intellectual property right now in this case ideally dormant company which is a public company it should be i mean dormant company which is a private company that's easy but if it's a public company as per ICI they say though in 20 it should be excluded as per explanation 2 but on a conservative basis you should include in 10 this is as per ici right so this also you need to write in the exam for conservative it's pure conservatism where i'll exclude in 20 no problem but since it's a public company i'll include it in 10 i will exclude purely because of explanation 2 yes so that is regarding this particular chart is important so this is the final thing consent for directorship 1325 every director is has to file his consent with the company on or before i mean before his appointment in dir2 to be filed by the company with the roc within 30 days of appointment dir12 for unlisted public ifsc company that is international financial services center in special economic zone it is 60 days 30 days will be converted to 60 days that's it in case of uh, independent directors appointed in the general meeting explanatory statement shall include a statement that he fulfills the conditions specified in the act that is all 149 onwards now explanatory statement should be given for every item of special business mind you we have already seen businesses in that only those adda points at agm explanatory statement need not be given because the report itself will have all explanations whereas for any matter of special business under 102 you have to give an explanatory statement which is anyway there in 102 apart from that some sections give some extra explanations that are needed like this for example that he should fulfill he should give a statement saying that all the independence requirements i fulfill that way anyway we'll see tomorrow 
the concept of consent under 152.5 shall not apply to a government company where appointment of the director is done by either the central government or state government. So there is obviously would have taken consent that is why they will be appointed anyway provided there is no default in filing financial statements or annual return. The director identification number every individual shall obtain DIN. The DIN will be allotted within one month this can all be MCQ questions must code DIN everywhere. Then central government or regional director NOIDA or any officer authorized by the regional director on application in DIR 5 received for cancellation or deactivation of DIN should do go ahead if the DIN is found to be duplicate or it is obtained wrongful or fraudulent means or that person died the director. Concerned individual has been declared as a lunatic again similar to unsound mind by the competent court. Concerned individual has been adjudicated as an insolvent. So obviously since he will be disqualified they will also deactivate the DIN. These are simple points this is regarding DIN provisions. Now two other things that are there with respect to what do you say uh, cluster number one of course it be vacation of office resignation and removal. Vacation of office section 167 we will finish this off then we can go to cluster number two. There are certain things which we will have to uh, come back later we will see that but yes let us finish. The vacation of director under section 167 shall be automatic here. The moment any of these points come into force automatic no resolution needed unlike removal and all here no resolution is needed. On happening of certain events it will I mean obviously the you will be you will forthwith cease to be a director any of the events happen you will go. Second there is no third one no need for opportunity to show cause that is why it is automatic. So the principles of natural justice will not come here. You have to exit the company then fight for yourself prove that you are not guilty then come inside. The board need not pass any resolution it is automatic. The board shall not have any power to waive the entire event here waive means to condone or to pardon not possible. Where a director disputes the vacation as I told you should vacate the office then resort to the court for a direction of the section was not applicable only and then he can be reinstated. What are the grounds for vacation? First ground he incurs any of the disqualifications in 164.1. Does it imply that the disqualification for a director would arise not only at the point of appointment but also during his tenure. When I started off I told only at the point of appointment but now because of 167.1a it is also during the tenure. However, where will he uh, vacate the office only the defaulting office but if he incurs the disqualification under subsection 2 of 164 office of the director shall become vacant in all the companies other than the company which is in default non defaulting companies under that subsection. Second one he absents himself from all the meetings of the board absents himself from all the meetings of the board during a period of 12 months with or without seeking leave of absence from the board. Now if you see connect this with we will connect this later again with alternate director for now there you leave this point we will see it later. But of course uh, whether to consider whether I have absent myself or not uh, if a person does not like a director they may the one thing that can be easily manipulated is minutes of the meeting. So for 12 months I will not call any meeting or even if I call I will not call you and 12 months later I send a notice saying that you did not attend any meeting so you will hereby you are vacated. So now obviously the director will be the plaintiff he will go to the court and say this my vacation was illegal. Who has to prove that vacation was illegal should the director prove that he did not receive any notice or should the company prove that they actually sent a notice and this guy did not come company. So the onus of proving these two points we will see with uh, alternate data later. The onus of proving rests on the company it has to prove the following that the notice of the meeting was duly sent under 101 they should have proof of sending. Director has actually received the notice right this is shareholders meeting and also board meeting notices 173 both. They are telling that he did not attend any meeting as such he is not big because they basically did not call him only. Next because if he comes to the shareholders meeting also they will come he will come to know what is happening right. So they did not call him for anything not even shareholders meeting not even board of directors meeting nothing but we predominantly have to see 173 notice. Director has received the notice which was actually here 7 days before the meeting you should give. 
meeting was actually held and the director did not attend the meeting all these things have to be proven by the company otherwise this fellow will not be vacated will not vacate the office will not be vacated so the he does not follow the provisions of disclosure of interest or does not disclose his interest under section 184 this again you'll have to see with cluster number 3 so cluster number 3 you have to see two things one is uh, that is qualification of 188 and then vacation under 184 he becomes disqualified by an order of a court or a tribunal so he becomes disqualified by an order of a court or tribunal this was similar to what you saw in disqualification so there it is the same thing then again you see convicted by a court is there of an offence involving moral turpitude or otherwise and sentenced to imprisonment for 6 months 5 years is irrelevant here because it's talking about vacation yes so and he is removed as per the provisions of the act so removal provisions can be two things here one is removal under section 169 that is removal by shareholders one more type of removal is there in the under companies act under 242 this is removal by the tribunal for oppression and mismanagement removal by tribunal so the moment he is removed as per the act he obviously has to vacate his office immediately cannot stick around if you are removed under 169 again cannot stick around you have to vacate your office so that is what they have given under point number f on the other hand you see uh, d and d are the same d and d that is regarding same disqualification disqualified by an order of the court or tribunal so you need to understand one thing that uh, 1641d talks about moral turpitude 1641 e talks about that court order on the other hand 167 1 so if you see here 167 1 d also talk, talks about the same thing becomes disqualified by order of the court and this moral turpitude point it's the same but if you have observed 167 1a talks about all disqualifications under 164 1 or 164 basically when it is already there we will already cover these two things why have they given two separate points here this is one thing we need to understand he becomes disqualified by an order of the court and convicted that's anyway covered here there is a point here because for these two cases there is an appeal saving clause means what if you that is for point number d and e above that is court order and moral turpitude vacation does not take effect for 30 days from the date of conviction or order of disqualification if appeal is preferred if appeal is preferred so within 30 days that's why two separate points are given point number d and e so point number d and e should not be part of 167 1a 167 1a should be read as all points other than d and e because for d and e there is separately appeal saving clause you will be disqualified under 164 okay but should you vacate your office no because now i am going to challenge the disqualification or rather challenge the vacation also how within 30 days that is why those points are given 30 days from the date of conviction or order of disqualification i have to prefer an appeal to the higher court higher court will uh, hear the appeal of course and then dispose of the appeal dispose means what either accept it reject it or they may set aside yes so in all these cases i can further appeal to the higher court no again they say 7 days so first 30 days from vacation what should i do i should prefer an appeal and the, the again further i can prefer one more appeal within how many days 7 days from the date of disposal of the appeal so i have a full set here i can go to whichever court i want higher court of course so i can save myself from vacation so in these two cases only general rule is what i have to vacate the office first and then resort to court what is the exception that is court order and moral turpitude are exceptions 
court order and moral turpitude are exceptions if i can appeal within 30 days then i can escape vacation i can protect myself against vacation that is why two separate points are given otherwise i could have simply given 161 one everybody will have to vacate that's exactly why the points seem to have been repeated but it's actually not repeated only because of the appeal saving clause separately given So here, this uh, when we connect with alternate data, we'll see this point. Apart from that, A disqualification, B, C, D, uh, C again with cluster number three, D and D we did now. F removed removal provisions under 169 and 242 to H. Point number G: If he is appointed in a holding or subsidiary or associate company. Now, what is a holding company, subsidiary company? Just quick revision. So, if a company called H and a company called S. If it has how much? More than half of what? TVP, total voting power. Total voting power is actually equity, share capital. Earlier it was paid up capital, that is equity and convertible preference. All that has been removed now. Either a holding company has more than half of TVP or holding company controls what? controls the composition of the board of directors means they can appoint majority directors they would have given a loan and they'll say yes i have only like 20 percent in your in your company or 15 percent in your company that's okay but i can control six out of ten directors in your company then it is called what control the composition and also you know subsidiary of a subsidiary is also a subsidiary what is an associate company then Yes, when one company exerts significant influence against the other company and that is how much? 20% of the total voting power, 20% of the total voting power. So here what they are saying is, if he is appointed in a holding company, subsidiary company or associate company as an officer or employee and because of the same he becomes that in any other company. So basically you are a director of or let's say a company secretary of holding company and because you are a company secretary mr a is a company secretary of a holding company and because he is a company secretary he happens to be the director by virtue of him holding an office in the holding company so why are you a director in the subsidiary company only because you hold the cs office here the moment you resign from here automatically here also you will vacate that is what it says very simple so if you see here uh, if he is appointed in a holding or subsidiary or associate as an officer or employee in my example cs and because of the same he becomes a director in another company that is subsidiary in my example he has to vacate the office of the director in the company subsidiary company in my example when his employment no longer exists in the holding subsidiary associate whatever in my example in the holding company he lost his company secretaryship here also it will go very simple so next private company may provide additional grounds in its articles it can have any other grounds also public company cannot provide for additional grounds only private company but uh, can the private company have grounds like this which says that this director i mean director will vacate the office on reasonable grounds can i have vague terms like this reasonable grounds no because the moment i say reasonable grounds the directors themselves will if they don't like one more director they'll say boss you under reasonable grounds you'll have to vacate your office what are the grounds i don't know so any ambiguous terms like this should not be used and uh, any ambiguous terms which will uh, virtually result in what removal of the director without going through principles of natural justice would be void ab initio. Public company cannot provide for additional grounds, that's what it is. That's all about 167, very simple. Moving on to 168, director may resign, again his choice, how? By giving a notice in writing to the company and shall intimate the ROC within how many days? 30 days. In form number DIR 12, should be posted on website and director's report also. However, the resigning director may, for him it is discretionary, may forward a copy of his resignation letter with detailed reasons to ROC in form number DIR 11 within 30 days. Now that may will become shall, as I told you in that 164 to when I have to protect myself, also may will become shall in listed company, SEBI listed companies, 
sebi regulations lodr says no no it has to be shall only in those two cases the may will become shall one is the uh, 1642 b where i want to protect myself other one is this one uh in dr 11 within 30 days foreign director resigning of course can authorize uh, practicing cacs etc power of attorney he can give and he can of course dr 11 has to file now when will the resignation take effect is it from the date of let's say i sent a letter resignation letter on 8th march uh but the but i posted it on 10th march the company received it on 14th march and they accepted it on 20th march when yes when the notice is received by the company or any date specified in the notice whichever is later so there will be a notice period etc so either whichever is later can i do a retrospective resignation no i commit a fraud today so i know from last month only i'll resign no so retrospect that's why whichever is later is given honestly speaking that's the reason why whichever is later is given so no concept of retrospective resignation and you will be liable till which date till of course the resignation date on the other hand this is resignation of a director but resignation of a captain captain is md resignation of a captain doesn't require 168 unless he is resigning as a director also if i just want to step down from captaincy like virat kohli i need not go to 168 correct i can just obviously the board of directors only can decide and they will have to accept the resignation there is no concept of uh, resignation of md under companies act it will be governed by the articles and some uh, extent it's given in secretarial standards so of course he is liable even after his resignation for the offenses is occurred during his tenure 100% during his tenure it will also come into force promoters will become director in their absence cg will appoint temporary directors this we already know if all directors resign 1683 will come in case of resignation of md or old time director apart from compliance of 168 assuming they are also resigning as directors the resignation has to be accepted by the board and should be relieved from his duties but if he is only stepping down as an md but not as a d only stepping down as an md and not as a d no need to go to 168 that is the additional point that is regarding 168 167 168 so next removal of directors under 169 removal of director under 169 i guess you are attending face to face after a long time right yes fine sometimes at home you will feel sleepy sometimes here also your eyes may be closing when it's closing just remember ca results.nic.in <laughs> website right when the website opens you'll put in your pin and your sro captcha code to prove that you are not a robo from morning we are dying and once you hit the submit button round 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 comes correct the best possible result is of course pass second worst is what fail worst is what page cannot be displayed <laughs> server error result withheld who are you all those things yes so so the moment that i, I always used to do that whenever i used to feel sleepy and all i used to remember see result or nic dot in fail and that's why you have all these motivational things ca students read this in a different way decide commit suicide no, no sorry <laughs> succeed yes so yeah come back uh, removal of directors section 169 basic conditions removal by ordinary we already know what is ordinary resolution guys removal by ordinary resolution only this is one of the very few sections where the word ordinary resolution is given it is never given anywhere only this and section 16 this is out of syllabus leave it so only ordinary resolution that is generally if you want the word special then special resolution is given but if you want to know what is resolution they'll never give anything they'll just say resolution but this is one peculiar section where the word ordinary is given which means no other resolution that's the intention of law is no other resolution can ever be imposed even via articles or anything it is ordinary only simple majority i can throw out a director if you don't like a director you can throw him out articles cannot provide for special resolution for removal there are certain directors who cannot be removed which uh, this part will not understand if uh, we will see later director appointed by tribunal under 242 the director will uh, the tribunal will remove one director we saw that already uh, will remove a director and once that fellow is removed he will vacate the office then they'll appoint new directors the new directors is to ensure that the 
sins of the old directors are cleansed so they are obviously there to revive the company can you remove them no so that fellow cannot be removed this we will see later after cluster 2 will automatically realize financial institutions nominee directors cannot be removed because if icici bank gives a loan they will say i want two directors on the board okay fine you are there now can i remove them only no because otherwise until the loan is subsisting under 1613 the loan agreement will override the law loan agreement will clearly say until the loan is subsisting i will sit on the company as the director so that those people cannot be removed so all other directors your first director rotational non rotational everybody can be removed there is no concept at all of anything called permanent directors under companies act any single person every person can be removed right there is no second thought about it even if you are a founder director you can be removed you see that bharat pay fellow he removed even uh, steve jobs was removed from his own company so you can remove anybody for that matter yes special notice so as we have already discussed you require special notice for what removal of director before expiry of his term so normally in the general meeting board which proposes the items of business but here it is the shareholders who will propose 1% voting power or 5 lakh and this is the most important concept the principles of natural justice the same procedure is also there for removal of auditor except the fact that for removal of auditor before expiry special notice is not needed so this is equally applicable to 140 subsection 1 and 140 subsection 4 that is your auditing subject paper 3 so it will come the same way principles of natural justice what is the principle what is the procedure first 1% voting power or 5 lakh puc will give a special notice we have seen all this not earlier than 3 months but not less than 14 days they will give it to the company company will give it to all the members not less than 7 days before the meeting now that particular uh, special notice will also be forwarded to the director who is proposed to be removed and this director has a right to give written representation written representation now this fellow always wanted to be an author so he'll write one book why i should not be removed find it pages chapter 1 my childhood right no so if you see it should be of reasonable length some 4 5 6 pages and reasonable time he cannot say coming soon to a bookstore near you it should be reasonable time reasonable time reasonable length written representation it should be written representation and then that written representation should be forwarded to whom to the company company has two other rights i mean rather duties they should circulate the representation among all the members and also state the fact that representation is being made in the notice when they are sending no they should say representation is received will send it to you shortly like that you should write so what is the first right of the director of course first right is right of the notice being sent to him first of all second right is right to give written representation third right is right to have the notice circulated fourth right is right to have the fact of representation being made stated everywhere and now of course you should do all this if the company does not do it either due to a delay or the company's default then he has one more right right to read out the representation at the meeting he has a right to read out the representation at the meeting however these rights if the director abuses by what writing all false stuff in the false accusations to bring down the company because we are all indians when we are down we are going down we bring down everyone so so if you see he wants to bring down the company then it says on the application of the agreed party or the company they have re received the representation all false allegations now the thing is the company does not want to send it to everybody but the company is bound to send to everybody what to do they will immediately apply to nclt saying that sir all these are false allegations here is the proof so the nclt is convinced have to apply in nclt 1 that the rights of the director have been abused by him to what this is a companies act beautiful language secure needless publicity for defamatory matter i am defaming the company right i am putting a black mark on the company when it is not there at all so secure needless publicity then the tribunal will pass an order for the company not to send the representation and also for the director not to read out the representation so if they ask in the mcq for example they'll say that the nclt was convinced that the uh, what do you say director was abusing his right and thereby they ordered first one 
not to circulate second one not to speak at the meeting c either a or b d both a and b option two marks mcq yes it is only a guys why second option was not to speak can the nclt put a gag order against the director not to speak no nobody has the right to take away the constitutional authority so in this law only they have given one line without prejudice to his right to be heard orally which means what nobody can take away freedom of speech so nclt if they pass an order not to speak it is 100% invalid so here only one thing either a or b both and b not to speak at the meeting cannot so i have given it here cannot take away the right of the director to speak at the meeting i can only tell you not to read out but whatever you supposed to read can you still speak yes nobody can take away the right to speak at the meeting this is because of the wordings without prejudice to his right to be heard orally given in 169 this all this procedure is called as pong principles of natural justice r o o b h reasonable opportunity of being heard in india everybody is innocent until proven guilty so everybody should be given an equal chance to speak right so all these things are there so this is the full procedure same procedure for 140 subsection 1 removal of auditor before expiry of the term with the exception that special notice is not there and same procedure for also appointment of auditor other than retiring auditor under 140 subsection 4 same no change so that is what it is then after all these things are done an ordinary resolution is passed and the director will stand removed if the vacancy i'll fill in the same meeting if it is not filled then of course i can fill it as per the companies act other provisions and the director removed is entitled to claim compensation for any loss of office that again i'll connect it with 202 later so normally only managing director whole time director entitled to compensation for loss of office in 202 if the terms of the employment so provide so this is what it is then directors appointed under the proportional representation route only by that method cannot be removed that we will see later in in uh, cluster number 2 you will understand this 169 will not get attracted if i want to remove you as an md only if i want to remove you as a captain but you will continue as a player then no need of 169 but if i am removing you as a director obviously md position also will come to an end the court will never interfere in why you removed that person court never interfered why you removed cyrus mistri they did not ask tata why did you remove cyrus mistri they only asked why was the procedure not followed that went up to the supreme court level and then tatas were given a clean sheet saying that all the procedures were followed so if you see court can never interfere with respect to your corporate democracy you have a right to cho choose whoever you want the court may interfere only if the procedure relating to appointment and removal is not followed otherwise no scene next register of uh, some miscellaneous provisions register of directors and kmp and their share holding so you have to maintain a register of the uh, all the directors and the kmp who is this kmp 2 class 51 who is a kmp managing director all time director manager yes cfo ceo cs and others one level below all those people are key managerial personnel so that's about it these are the people who are there uh, form number uh, direct uh, dir 12 in respect of directors and kmp should be filed within 30 days from the appointment or 30 days from any change 170 this entire director thing will not apply to a government company in which 100% share capital is held by cg sg or any combination now what is a government company guys government company means two clause 45 government company is a company in which central government state government or any combination hold how much greater than or equal to 51% of total voting power no here it is paid up share capital these are some of the keywords it's not tvp and it's not more than half it is greater than or equal to 51% of the paid up share capital of any company now if this company let us say g1 uh, has given a loan of 100 crore to g2 and in that 
agreement, loan agreement, they have said that I will appoint six out of ten directors in your company. Is G2 a subsidiary of G1? Yes. Is G1 a government company? Let's say it has 60 percent bid up capital. Central government has 60 percent bid up capital in G1. So is G1 a government company? Yes, definitely. Is G2 a subsidiary of G1? Yes. Is G2 a government company? Is G2 a government company? What do you think? Is G2 a government company? No. Generally in law, four steps you have to follow. Some of you already know. Step number one, close your eyes. <laughs> Step number two, take a deep breath in. Just like, you know, deep breath in, breathe out. Third one, your gut feeling always gives you the correct answer, guys. Gut, you always trust your gut. From the pit of your stomach, feeling will come. Butterflies in your stomach, right? That will come. Fourth one, reverse your gut. That's the answer. So if you say no, answer is yes. So because if you see 2 clause 45, government company is a company in which this is say, they, they say, then also includes a subsidiary of a government company. Includes a subsidiary of a government company, which means G2 is a subsidiary of G1. When G1 is a, what do you say, government company, G2 also is a government company. Includes a subsidiary of a government company. Now tell me, G1, I mean if you want to link it to paper 3, who will appoint the auditor of G1? C and A, where it's a government company. Who will appoint the, what do you say, uh, auditor for G2 also? C and AG. Very simple. Now, if I reverse this concept, just for your knowledge, because this also they ask for four marks once. They can ask anything. Uh, so, if you see, if I reverse the concept, central government, state government has given a loan to G1. It just controls around 15 percent. That, that's beside the point. But they have given a loan to G1. And now, they have appointed six out of ten directors of G1. Right? So, basically, G1 Central government, state government control 6 out of 10 directors. Composition of the board of directors. Next, G1 on the other hand control 60% of the paid up share capital or let's say total voting power of G2. Question number 1, is G2 a subsidiary of G1? 100% yes. G2 is a subsidiary of G1. First one, is G1 a government company? Is G1 a government company? No, why? Because guys, government company doesn't talk about controlling the composition at all. Government company doesn't talk about controlling the composition. It's only subsidiary company definition. Government company definition only says this one. 51% of paid up share capital. It doesn't say anything about controlling the composition. So, is G1 a government company? No. Is G2 a government company? No. Because G2 is a... But is, is G2 a subsidiary of G1? Yes. But G1 and G2 both are not government companies. Since they are not government companies, who will appoint auditor of G1? I mean, share, uh, shareholders or C and AG? Shareholders or board or uh, basically either of the two or C and AG? Shareholders or board, whatever it is. G2? Shareholders or board? Wrong answer. For this, C and AG only is needed because if you observe in 139 and all those things, 139, 567, they have not used the word government company. They have used the word government controlled company. Yes, deafening silence. They have used the word government controlled company. Control definition is 2 clause 20, uh, you know, 7. If way there you see control will include what? Appointing majority of board of directors. So guys, that's why they have given, they have never said government company. If you see 139, 567, they have used the word government controlled company. So be careful in paper 3. Right? So, government controlled company means what? Majority of board of directors, which means this is not a government company, but it's a government controlled company. This is not a government company, but it's a government controlled company. Even for government controlled company, who will, who will appoint? C and AG. C and AG. Right? So, we should be very careful as to what they ask. Even in 139, the wordings are different. Right? Anyway. So, this is definitely government company. This is a government controlled company. But uh, appointment will always be done by Comptroller and Auditor General, that is paper 3 concept. Yes, so next, right to inspect. Now, that is again here. Shall not apply to a government company in which, now here, peculiar, 100% share capital is held by. So, this is only applicable or other 170 is not applicable or exemption is given only to whom? Only to a 100% government company. Right? 100% government company plus there is no default in filing financial statements or annual returns. Then, uh, yeah, members right to inspect, 
the members have a right to inspect the registers also open for inspection these are all mcq questions during dash business hours only can they take extracts on request yes they can take extracts within 30 days generally nothing in india is free except this 171 free of cost you will get free open for inspection at every annual general meeting of the company so again when will it be inspected etc shall be made ac accessible to any person attending the meeting if inspection is refused or if any copy is not sent within 30 days registrar shall an application made to him order immediate inspection on supply of such copies again you see section 170 shall not apply to government company in which 100 percent share capital is held by cgsd or any combination and no default in filing financial statements or annual return so it is not a blanket exemption this is also important they should not have defaulted in filing annual accounts or annual returns penalty uh, what i have given in green if you can just remember and go it will be great because these are all as per companies amendment act last two amendment acts have only been changes in penalty only many of the things which are in fine has been shifted to penalty what's the difference spelling change no what the difference between fine and penalty fine is paid to the national company law tribunal that is court Whereas penalty is the internal adjudication mechanism, that is it is paid to the ROC, correct? So this is called decriminalization, uh, this is not exactly decriminalization but this is the wordings given, ease of doing business and decriminalization, 2019 and 20 amendment acts were only about this, conversion of fine is still there but there are some 100 sections, now there are only some 20 sections that speak about fine. To save the time of the NCLT, they have converted most of the fines to penalty and many imprisonment sections have been removed. So in imprisonment, if they use the word uh, fine or imprisonment or both, it is called as a compoundable offence. Means what? I can escape imprisonment by paying fine. And if they use the word fine and imprisonment, it's called as a non-compoundable offence. So in these amendments, what they did, they removed the non-compoundable offences and made it compoundable. Some of the compoundable offences also they removed and converted to penalty. And wherever there was all fine, they made it into penalty. So those are the changes. Now I personally do not like remembering penalties. It is humanly impossible. That's why I am saying at least the amendment part if you remember it will be great. A again in this material only later I have given all the set of uh, penalties, threshold limits and I have underlined those things are amended. Only that if you remember if possible you can go ahead otherwise you can leave it. So if a company is in default in complying and knows this is like a residuary section here, no specific penalty or punishment is provided in any of these sections, company and every officer in default will include a shadow director also liable to a penalty of 50,000 rupees plus 500 rupees per day up to a maximum of 3 lakh rupees in case of company and 1 lakh in case of officer who is in default this is a residuary penalty section again it is liable to a penalty not a fine so this is what it is very very simple cluster 1 and 2 so we will take a probably short break you need a break I can go on need a break please ask if it is on no need no 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 voice no sound Tell me, you want I can give 10 15 minutes or else you can give take later your wish. All right, let's begin, guys. So, we'll uh, probably do a little bit and then take a break. Types of directors again, very, very important cluster, cluster number two. Types of directors. So, the Companies Act does not specify any category or type. There is no wordings called executive director, you will never see any of these things. Non executive, professional, not there. These are just uh, terminologies given in Norman, uh, common parlance. It does not have to do anything with uh, the actual types given here. But uh, executive directors are the ones who obviously take care of the day to day affairs of the company. Whereas the non executive directors do not hold any executive position as such. But if they have what you say, uh, they are coming into the company because they are chartered accountants, company secretaries, or they are, uh, you know part of a profession then of course they are called professional directors experts in their respective field independent directors are the only directors who are actually required to be appointed as per law so you need to appoint them there 149 is the section and you have for in in your 
SEBI guidelines also you have this independent directors concept. As per Companies Act on the other hand, every company is required to have at least one director who has stayed in India for a total period of not less than 182 days during the financial year. Earlier it was previous financial year and all those things. So people used to stay 300 days, this year escape. When I lift the corporate veil, nobody is there. So this was predominantly because of Sri Vijay Malya, resident director concept came because when they lifted the corporate veil of Kingfisher, nobody was there. So that's why this section came into force honestly. Uh, during the during the financial year is what they say. I have to have at least one person responsible for everything that is happening in the company. There are these many directors, if you see, categories. You have the first director. Who is the first director appointed at the beginning of the company, at the time of incorporation. Second, reappointment of retired director. This technically is actually a mechanism. It is not a type of director as much as it is a mechanism. Appointment of a person as director other than a retiring director. So this, uh, you know, is another concept where you can appoint a director afresh. Additional director is a person if you want some extra hands on deck, then you uh, can appoint additional directors. Alternate director is a person who is appointed in place of a director who has gone abroad for three months, three months. So or more. We will see that. Nominee director is your financial institution appointed director during the subsistence of the loan. Casual vacancy director is a director who is appointed in place of a director who has of course tenure has is a basically who died or who resigned. His tenure was still there but before the tenure he resigned. Before the tenure he resigned or died or whatever. Tenure comes to an end. Though the tenure is there he exits the company is what I am saying. Small shareholder director is again to uh, protect the interests of the minority shareholders, you will see that later, then independent director we have. So basically though all the directors powers, duties etc are the same, peculiarly all of these people have what do you say, the way they come into the company, method of appointment is different and how long they stay in the company is different, that is the reason why they are di different directors. Now can a managing director, I mean, why is MD not here? If you see why is MD not a type of director? Yes, first of all you should be a director. So MD can be any of these people actually. So MD can be a first director, MD can be a 160 director, MD can be an additional director. That's why it's not given here. However, three types of uh, directors cannot be a managing director. One of course is the nominee director. Nominee director is only there to look after the bank or the financial institution which is representing he cannot be a at any cost nominee director cannot be MD. Then making small shareholder director director only is a big thing. Asking for MD and all is little too much. So this fellow be a director it's okay but not MD. Then of course independent director the concept only will of course, you have to be independent you cannot work in the company full time. So barring this FHI all other people can become what? Managing director, managing director and of course you have all, one more concept called woman director. So woman director also will be appointed and even a woman director can be a managing director, no doubt about it. So of course with respect to woman director concept, again this is a very important thing. Every listed company has to have at least one woman director and every other public company, so private company not needed, public company with a paid up share capital of 100 crore or more paid up share capital 100 crore or more and uh, turnover 300 crore or more mandatorily has to have one woman director. And when should I see all this paid up capital etc turnover LABS last date of latest audited financial statements or latest audited balance sheet is what you I mean generally LABS is what the term that we use. So that you have to have now various types of directors and their uh, special points is what we need to see but you know we have to do it slightly more in depth than what is given here. So anyway this chart will help you understand very clearly all the types of directors, first director then you have 152 1 that is section number applicable to what company is also given private public not applicable to also is given here. Then there is a concept called power derived from or power subject to articles then appointment provisions and appointed by whom and what is the tenure. So take a quick revision one day before and some extra shots which give some extra hidden points. 
though we'll do it but we'll slightly do more in depth first the uh, what do you mean by power derived from or power subject to article so what do you mean by that concept the power derived from or subject to so if i okay, let me also check the open the notes as well here because that will also definitely help us so if you see the first director bear act generally this is the wordings where no provision is made in the articles of the company for the appointment of the first director where no provision is made in the articles of the company for the appointment of first director subscribers to memorandum or individuals shall be deemed to be the first directors of the company until the directors are duly appointed and in case of a one person company and individual being member shall be deemed to be the first director until the director or directors are duly appointed by the member in accordance with the provisions of this section so first of course we need to understand what do you mean by this power subject to articles and derived from articles so when i when the act when the articles so if generally the articles say that for instance uh, in issue of bonus shares or you know buyback of shares they say that you can issue bonus shares only if the articles authorize the act says you can issue bonus shares only if the articles authorize which means if the articles are silent will the section apply or not no so if the articles are silent section does not apply in certain cases if articles are silent and section does not apply that is called as the power derived from articles example is you know your bonus shares bonus buy back 63 2a 68 2a and all these sections what happens is it clearly they have given that even 55 issue of preference shares if the articles do not authorize you to issue preference shares then you cannot issue if the articles do not authorize you to issue bonus shares you cannot do it so basically this uh, bonus buy back preference shares etc if the articles are silent in the section at any cost does not apply it's a very beautiful thing where act is giving power to the articles to actually override the act itself though it is technically not overriding it's actually act only is giving power these are the examples on the other hand in some cases the articles have various terms and conditions and the act you know what it says it first says follow the articles follow the articles it says blindly follow the articles if articles are silent then follow the act if articles are silent then follow the act those are the provisions where they say i have to see first the articles basically those are the sections which has a star point conditions apply what conditions go to the articles articles don't speak about any conditions then okay come to the section come to the section and see what is there now based on this also they are asking questions every section you need to figure out whether it's a power derived from articles or power subject to articles now this is called power subject to articles the wording sometimes are in default of and subject to in default of articles means what articles are silent subject default means articles are silent doesn't talk about anything default of articles subject to articles means what articles have certain other conditions so follow those conditions if articles are silent follow the act best example would be quorum under general meeting quorum provisions are given under 103 where uh, you know there are quorum 5 15 20 whatever people but the section starts with a line unless the articles provide for a larger quorum so articles can say 100 now minimum number you have to follow the articles in default of the articles if articles are silent then follow the section that's the beautiful thing of power derived from and subject to now every section we need to figure out now if you see the bear act here it says where no provision is made in the articles of the company then subscribers is a classic case of power subject to articles 
So first follow the articles. Is there any provision made in the articles or appointment of first director? No. Then only come to the act. That's what they are trying to do. This is a classic example of power subject to article. So basically, there can be now coming to our uh, summary. There can be two things here. This will give you the clear picture. Because it is a power subject to articles. Articles can prescribe the names of the first directors. This is something else given in the articles. Articles can prescribe. If articles are silent. then section will come classic example of power subject to articles now articles can prescribe the name of the first directors if the articles prescribe the names of the first directors those persons will be the first directors as simple as that only if the articles are silent then i have to come to section 152 and then what it what does it say sub it's not subject sorry subscribers to memorandum subscribers Typo. Two, three things will be there. Cannot be infallible. So, subscribers to memorandum, who are individuals. Why? Because we have already seen every company shall have directors who are individuals, or individuals who are directors. So, company cannot be a. Better. So, if uh, can company be a subscriber to memorandum? Yes, definitely. Four, five companies can start one more company, but individuals only. And now the beauty is, they say. these subscribers to memorandum who are individuals are not directors they are deemed so law is creating a fiction deemed to be the first directors of the company they are deemed to be the first directors of the company until directors are appointed by as in accordance with the company what is accordance with the company we already seen 152 to company by in general meeting so there are two types of meetings one is agm and egm that's all so in whenever they act uses the word general meeting it should either be agm or egm if act uses the word any general meeting obviously agm or egm some cases act uses the word agm which means it has to happen only at the annual and general meeting sometimes it uses the word egm specifically it should happen only at the egm if they use the word a gm or any gm it can happen both at agm or egm so here also they say until the directors are appointed duly regularized they have not told which meeting so we will leave that so basically here guys uh, one is what first if the articles can prescribe the names they will come if the articles are silent under 1321 subject uh, in subscribers to memorandum who are individuals only are deemed to be the first directors but they have to be regularized under which section 152 to red with 160 so technically speaking the only section which will make you a regular director is this section 152 to red with 160 152 to talks about the mechanism that is your uh, what do you say ordinary resolution resolution to be passed 160 talks about the procedure this procedure is only applicable to public company so a private company they still have to follow 152 to red with any procedure given in the articles but otherwise this is the scene any person who wants to come into the company in a regular way has to go through the rigors of 152 to red with 160 after he enters the company under this section then he will enter into a rotation mechanism of 150 to 6 where in some cases he will retire some cases he will not retire that's called rotation mechanism but then he has to enter the company through this 152 to red with 160 now the only exception to this the only possible exception to this is in the articles if you have named the first directors that's the beauty of this section if the uh, in the articles if you have named the first directors they are the only people who get to bypass this section and directly come into the mechanism of 152 to 6 that's how we need to interpret this as so you see here those persons will be the first directors they will bypass 152 to red with 160 and automatically go into 152 to 6 rotation mechanism rotation mechanism on the other hand if articles are silent section 1 to 1 subscribers to memorandum who are individuals are deemed to be the first directors they are deemed to be the first directors and these people they will be regularized 
under 152 to red with 160. They will be regularized under 152 to red 160 and then again they will enter the mechanism of 150 to 6. Mind you at this meeting they can change the directors if they want to. They can appoint other directors because here subscribers only are directors. So, shareholders also will be the same people. So, they can choose saying that okay we are just temporary. I want to appoint a better management, they can do so or they can regularize their appointment. So, what is the tenure of the deemed first directors? You cannot write, they will go into this, no. Deemed first directors only till here, till the general meeting in which they are regularized and once they are regularized, then they will go into the mechanism of 6. However, what is the tenure of the first director who is appointed by the articles? His tenure is directly will go into the mechanism of 152.6, rotation mechanism which we will see shortly. So, that is the concept. So, now if you see here, you will understand both public and private company, it is a power subject to articles, means what? Articles can give the names of the first directors, if articles are silent, then section will apply. Who will be the, what do you say, what are the appointment provisions, subscribers to memorandum or individuals? And in case of OPC, only a member, they will act as the first director and appointed by whom? Usually it is named in the company's AOA, else section will apply and how will they be appointed? 152, 2, red with 160. What is the tenure? Of course, the deemed first directors, their tenure is still the directors are duly appointed by the members in the general meeting. Anyway, this chart will give more clarity with respect to that. So, if you see here. The di first director extra shots named in the articles need not vacate the office. These directors will enter into a cycle wherein some directors retire by rotation in AGM and some do not. The deemed first director shall hold office only until the first EGM held. Generally, practically they will hold the EGM. You can also hold till the AGM, does not matter. After incorporation but prior to holding of the first AGM. The new directors appointed in the first GM under 160 will then go into a cycle wherein some directors retire by rotation in the AGM and some do not. Very, very simple. Very, very simple provisions of rotation easy. Next concept before the break, after this we will take a break. 152, 6 and 7 rotation mechanism. Rotation mechanism. Reappointment of retiring director, this is the mechanism. So, I told you here they will go into a rotation mechanism. What is this rotation? Mind you guys, rotation is applicable only and only to public companies and rotation happens only at annual general meeting, happens only at the annual general meeting. It is not applicable to these companies. What are those companies here? Obviously public means private is excluded, I will not say. Apart from that, unlisted government company plus subsidiary of such government company, right? Not listed government companies, unlisted. Again, no default in filing FS and AR. Next, unlisted public company, since it is applicable to public company, in that non-applicability I have to see. Private company is immaterial because private company anyway is not covered. Unlisted public company operating in a IFSC, that is International Financial Service Center like an SCZ, so that will not apply to them. They can appoint director, I mean the rotation mechanism will not come. Again here, if you see the wordings of the section, this will only apply to what if you see it is a, yeah, it's a couple of other points. If none of the subscribers are individuals in uh, that previous section, what is the course of action? None of the subscribers are individuals. What is the course of action? I mean all are companies. So, a company obviously cannot be incorporated because if all the, I mean what do you say, first of all you have not mentioned anybody in the articles, that is one mistake they did. Second one, all the people, all the subscribers are companies. So, then when I say I have to have individuals, no individuals. So, company cannot start. I will request you to add the first directors in the articles. Or if the company has more than 15 individual subscribers, let us say the company has 20 individual subscribers, possible. But then the articles are silent, if articles are silent, all 20 will become first directors. But you have already seen, you can only start a company with maximum 15. So, in that case also, they will request them to choose those 15. And articles cannot give some other mode of appointment, mode of appointment is absolutely clear. So, here in 156, the wordings begin like this, unless the articles provide for the retirement of all directors at every annual general meeting. 
again we have can figure out that this is a power subject to articles because if the article say all will retire all will retire if articles are silent then this section will come which speaks about two third one third and all that so what does this section speak about how many people will be uh will be what do you say retiring etc very simple so as per this section of the total number of directors of the total number of directors two third will be called as rotational directors mind you they have used the word not less than two thirds so minimum two third will be called as rotational who is this total number we'll see later two third will be called as rotational one third will be called as non rotational directors there is no section in the entire companies act which speak about who are non rotational directors non rotational directors are given directly in the agreement in the agreement where i'll appoint you i'll say look you will be called as a non rotational director you will not uh, what do you say what do you mean by this rotation very simple where you will come in front of the shareholders every time and seek reappointment now i need not disturb managing directors full time directors that doesn't mean that tenure is permanent but i don't want to disturb them every year where they'll come in front of you and seek reappointment hence non rotational directors appointment will generally be given in the agreement itself and generally it will be for whole time directors and managing directors there is no immunity for them mind you everybody can be removed but just that i don't want to disturb them with rotation on the other hand two thirds will be called as rotational directors rotational directors and of the two third one third will be called as retiring directors retiring directors means what they retire at that particular annual general meeting which means just to you know make it easy for us i'll take 18 as a number because it's divisible so if you see six directors are called non rotational directors one third and two third twelve directors are called rotational directors and of the rotational directors again one third will be called retiring which means four four and four the first agm four people will come and stand before you and seek reappointment it doesn't mean that they are actually what do you say they are going they are going to go away they are just coming in front of you and seeking reappointment then the remaining other four will come next agm these four will come the next agm right so they will seek reappointment at that agm what can happen you can either choose to reappoint all four or choose to reappoint choose not to reappoint all four or you can appoint somebody else in those in place of those four or you can appoint one and re, not reappoint three anything can happen this is just like a very ideal scenario this will never happen 18 12 6 like this so assume these four are appointed then next time who will come remaining four will come now these guys who have already been reappointed will go again and stand at the last in the last they'll stand now these people again will be reappointed they'll go here that is called rotation mechanism now every year it changes because this is an ideal scenario this will not happen i will only reappoint a and b i'll not reappoint c and d right so 12 are called rotational 6 are non rotational purely appointed via agreement in the agreement you'll specify what type of director you are these people are not immune they can be thrown out under 169 but just that i don't want them to have this entire procedure but if the articles prescribe that all the directors will retire that is possible that's why it's a power subject to articles i don't want this nonsense everybody 18 out of 18 come in front of the agm possible but generally most companies follow this and this has to be seen every year because number keep changing number keeps changing you will have to check this every year two third are called rotational one third are non rotational now of this two third one third shall retire when i say shall retire it means they'll come and stand in front of you at the agm anything can happen all four reappointed all four not reappointed some new four in place of this four anything or only few of the four can be reappointed anything can happen so now the question is i just said okay a b c d will come so how did i say a b c d will come is it any alphabetical order no so for that tenure. yes tenure those who have served the longest in office shall retire longest in office shall retire so basically if i have been reappointed here again 
so if i take 12 as an example no then it will be different 12 if i say 12 one third will be 4 two third will be 8 in that 8 what is one third of 8 now any fraction that it comes what to do any fraction so first of all here in the first two third if something comes as 6.33 i'm just giving an example should i make it 7 or should i make it 6 i should make it 7 because they have used the word not less than not less than two thirds because they have used the word not less than two two thirds it should be uh, you know the next whole number on the other hand if i am calculating one third and in one third calculation it comes as 3.33 or something then i have to go to the nearest if it comes to 3.67 i have to go to the nearest four here it is three because that also they have given number nearest to one third shall retire from office so in this example for example one third of eight will be two point something so three three will come two points even it's even it's 2.33 or 2.67 whatever it is next number so it will be three so let's say a b c will retire d e f will retire then g h only eight are there now there's a problem let's say they are reappointed they are also reappointed g h one person has to come so who among this will come is the question is it alphabetical order no those who have served the longest those who have served the longest now one more hidden point a was always in this company for 20 years b has served for 15 years c has served for 10 years but because of this rotation mechanism all of them have been appointed on the same day later well reappointment every reappointment is a fresh appointment so they have been appointed again afresh the question here is gh and who will come now a has served the longest in the office should i take a should i take b should i take c or what you see the things longest in office since their last appointment that also matters a lot when was the last appointment all three were appointed on the same day before so this is immaterial your experience is immaterial correct longest since their last appointment all of them are appointed on the same day those who have been become directors on the same day those who shall retire will what again first have to see if there's any agreement between them I need to check if there is an agreement between them. If it is not there, easiest way, lot. Correct? Put, you know, chits, A, B, C, pick the chit. Whichever chit comes. So, here, let's say B comes. Then the next meeting, A and C will come plus one more guy. Like that. Now, this can also change because I need not pre-appoint D, E, F. I can appoint anybody else. So, this is the concept of rotation mechanism. So, now if you see this, uh, you will understand. Not less than two-third of the total number of directors shall be retiring directors or, or basically they are called as rotational directors one third of that shall actually retire by rotation so this two third generally are called as rotational directors one third of two third is called as retiring directors so all rotational directors need not retire at that agm but all retiring directors are necessarily rotational in nature so basically they will enter the entire mechanism if you just take out the entire company as a house the front door entry is where the shareholders allow you to enter and that is nothing but 152 2 red with 160 back door entry will be board of directors so basically when you enter the place the rotation game will be happening that like musical chair it is so here obviously the two third will not be allowed to participate but they are eligible to participate but the ones who actually participate will be one third of the two third. The remaining one third non-rotational directors will not participate also. They will not be allowed to participate also. So two third of the main total number are eligible to participate. And the one third of the two third shall actually participate at every annual general meeting. And of course it is a uh, power subject to articles. Articles can provide for the retirement of all the directors, doesn't matter. Mind you, can articles fix a higher percentage than two-third? No. Two-third is 66.67. Can articles say 75% will retire? No. It very clearly says all directors. So it's all or two-third, nothing in between, right? That's all. That two-third as well as remaining one-third shall be appointed by company in general meeting, obviously. The only route to enter the company is 152 to red with 160. So non-rotational directors usually MD or term shall hold office for life or for a specified period of time as per the provisions given in the act or articles and of course they can be subject to removal.
so two thirds shall be rounded off to three. That is the higher number. One third shall be rounded off to one. That is the nearest. Vacancy of retiring director may or may not be filled. My choice. Those who have served the longest shall retire. <coughs> if appointed on the same day, I have to see the agreement. Any agreement if it's there. Agreement is not there. Lot. Yes, lot. Then if you see this total number, I'll come to that now. So one second. Then all point number six. All retiring directors are rotational. but all rotational directors need not be retiring now at the agm what all i can do i can either reappoint the retiring director or appoint some other person in his place as retiring director through 160 route or meeting may resolve not to fill up the vacancy you can do whatever i want now the problem is if the vacancy is not so filled up in the sense at that agm i have to do either of the three i i will reappoint all three or i will appoint somebody else in place of this three or i will resolve not to fill the vacancy i don't want all three and i'm resolving not to fill the vacancy also none of this is done by shareholders what do i do if i don't do that meeting there's an automatic adjournment meeting shall stand adjourned same time same place next week and if it is a national holiday next day which is not a national holiday it will be adjourned automatic adjournment correct now at that adjourned meeting also you don't do it then what happens there is a concept of yes deemed reappointment the retiring director shall be deemed to be reappointed this is only when at the adjourned meeting also you don't do either of the three what either or reappoint or choose not to reappoint or appoint somebody else in his place but resolve something one resolution you need to pass nothing you have done reappointment i'll means i'll vacate sorry i will uh, adjourn the meeting adjourn meeting also nothing you do automatic reappointment however automatic reappointment will not apply if the director is not qualified or disqualified from being appointed every reappointment is a fresh appointment so if he comes under the purview of 164 nothing can be done he cannot be reappointed he is not qualified means what he has joined some other company some other rival company same business why will i appoint him that's the meaning of not qualified right is not qualified or disqualified from being appointed he has expressed his unwillingness to be reappointed he has only given a letter saying that i wish not to be reappointed this is not resignation resignation happens before the tenure ends the tenure is already over right then a resolution for reappointment was put to the voting uh, put to vote at the meeting and lost of course there's a vote mechanism but it not gone through is lost it obviously the other two we will see later so this was a scene now the question is everywhere we need to understand what do you mean by this total number that is what we have to discuss so very very important total number as per 1526 the total number in the company whatever the total number of directors in the company 15 16 12 11 whatever minus first additional directors must be subtracted why because if you see additional director section under 161 it says they will only be till the up to the date of the agm up to the date of the agm up to the date is commencement or conclusion commencement again general clauses act up to the date means commencement if you compare it with auditors under 1391 auditors tenure is what conclusion of the first agm till the conclusion of the sixth agm i use the word conclusion but here they only use the word up to so up to means commencement this 1526 happens at the agm at the agm you are not there only at the agm you are not a director so why will i include you so additional director has to be subtracted some books have included additional director 100% wrong so please exclude additional director from the total number this is icai view and the correct view additional directors have to be excluded right total number of directors in the company subtracted by the following additional directors next alternate directors we will see that later next nominee director now nominee director is of two types nominee director can be from a bank or financial institution set up by a separate act of parliament like lic or right, uti sfc all these things now if they have given me a loan my company a loan and they say that they have to appoint a nominee director fair enough 
will i exclude them or include them and make them non rotational i have to exclude them so if you see nominee director of a financial institution set up by a separate act of parliament lic uti sfc etc they have to be totally excluded correct right? what about normal nominee directors of hsbc icici and all these private banks that i have to include and make them non rotational so in the exam if you see point number 5 very important if just nominee director is given without mentioning about the financial institution whether it set up by a separate act of parliament or not kindly include in the total number and make them non rotational that is the examination point include them and make them non rotational additional director then nominee director financial institution then small shareholder director is he an independent director there are various uh, what do you say different yes is he an uh, is he an independent director if you see independent director concept of course independent director should be uh, you know excluded he is given in the respective section 149 he has to be excluded for sure but is small shareholder director an independent director we do not know there are two what do you say yes he has to qualify for the independent uh, requirements on 1496 otherwise he'll have to vacate office it says however it also says that the thing is if you see the concept independent director should not have any interest in the company small shareholder director interest itself is small shareholders so by the logic itself you cannot call him an independent director there are two views to it both views are correct if you take him to be an independent director exclude if you take him to be not as an ind independent director you can include and make him non rotational but you have to write a note here i am not saying anything is right or wrong you can exclude so ici generally in some of the suggested answers they have excluded in some suggested answers they have included so write a note right for small shareholder director if he is considered as an independent director you can exclude him from the total number or you can include him and put him under non rotational category up to you and write a note you'll get marks but additional what do you say director and all you cannot what do you say include that is 100% wrong additional director has to be excluded then uh, <coughs> independent director has to be excluded nominee director i already told you what to do generally if nothing is given generally nothing will be given so what will we do include and make him under the non rotational category proportional representation let's change the section 163 so <coughs> we'll see that later when we come to proportional representation all these points will come into force then director appointed by tribunal under oppression and mismanagement obviously protection is given to him he cannot be included in the rotation category so this is these are the important things additional the second point we haven't seen 163 we haven't seen we will see that shortly and of course 242 you have to keep in mind then this retiring director what is his uh, tenure generally tenure is uh, not given as such but of course it will till the agm we know that that one third generally means three years he will get a uh, tenure but it can be two years also depending on the facts of the case now if that is still the agm what if agm only is not held so that some of the directors what were they doing they were postponing the agm adjournment of agm means i hold the agm but i don't discuss these points postponement means i don't hold the agm only they were in order to continue in the company they were postponing the agm so that's why mca uh, came out with the guideline saying that your tenure will be only till the last day on which agm should have been held under the provisions of the act agm provisions ca inter section 96 what is the last day within 6 months from the end of the financial year only in rare circumstances there will be a extension of 3 years classic example covid in 2020 they gave a 3 months extension so till uh, they could say they said till uh, december you do no problem only in those circumstances otherwise no so basically you can only be a director till 30th september the agm date beyond that if you keep on postponing the agm beyond that not allowed you will vacate on the day on which it was it should have been held then the company will become directorless then 1673 will take over where they say promoters or in their absence central government temporary directors will be appointed 
so this was a important provision given but there there are some uh, interesting cases one of which is ambika tea company case law where the directors did not commit any mistake but the company was having lot of there was a flood in the uh, area in which the company was located and there was labor strikes etc accounts are not prepared so agm was not held so if i the directors were doing everything in their capacity to ensure that the agm is happening was not happening so will i now throw them out and say direct no then it will go against the interest of the company in those that specific case only special circumstances may justify continuation of retiring directors if the meeting is not held as there cannot be a vacuum in the board of directors so in the ambika tea company case this is what happened so that brings us to an end of the to the end, to end to the all these provisions all rotational directors etc and of course there is one uh, i mean this example and all is you already know so it's fine not qualified qualified all that done yeah and uh, private company there is no such scene anything can happen in the private company there is no concept of uh, rotation at all that's about it guys so we'll take a breather 10 minutes 15 minutes 15 minutes 11:45 we'll start right so we will continue with the other areas all right guys let's begin resume rather okay so 152 67 done 152 1 done moving on to 160 this is the appointment of a regular director this is the procedure i already told you this procedure will only apply to public companies private companies can appoint anybody just like that no need of any procedure a uh, public company has to go through this procedure so obviously it will not apply to private company it will not apply to again here 100% government company and one peculiar thing and it's 100% subsidiary so not only will it not apply to 100% government company and also that 100% government company should have held all the shares in a subsidiary so 100% government company plus 100% subsidiary where there is no default in filing financial statement and annual return so some of you asked me about the book i just called the office just uh, whatsapp this number they'll guide you 9353164696 so by afternoon the lunch session i will give you it's somewhere there kept i don't even know where it's kept it's there it seems i'll give it to you so just whatsapp this number they will give, uh, send you all the details those of you who want the book now yeah that's the number anyway so 100% government company and 100% subsidiary no default in filing the financial statements and annual return same thing it will not apply to section 8 company it will not apply to section 8 company they can do whatever they want and it will not apply to ifsc company at scz and it will also obviously not apply to again any ifsc private company also where there is no default in filing fs and ar and normal private companies also it will not apply this anyway is given here yes articles of a private company can give any different procedure doesn't matter no problem so now here uh, in this section 160 it's a peculiar thing which says that anybody who gives a 14 day notice can 14 day notice to the company and company to should give it to all the members so here it says 14 days before the meeting shall be given to company company will give it to all members 7 days before the meeting if you see this it is similar to special notice but the problem with special notice is it should be given by 1% voting power or 5 lakh so that is not there here at all then it also says not earlier than 3 months not earlier than 3 months that not earlier than 3 months also is not there so that's why 160 notice is definitely not a special notice in the old law 160 notice was a special notice when i say old law 1956 but in 2013 they have ensured that because they have changed the special notice definition here obviously you cannot take the same meaning section 160 is not equal to special notice for sure because 1% voting power is not there and other thing is also not there so if you see uh, one second if i just open the notes which is our regular material only to check few things here 
so in this particular notes if you see they say if first of all at any general meeting so section 160 can happen at agm also can happen at egm also doesn't matter right and not less than 14 days that's okay now can an outsider propose himself can an outsider propose another member can an outsider propose another outsider is the question here one more is can a member propose himself can a member propose another member and can a member propose an outsider is other thing that we have to see if you see here uh, if he or some other member intending to propose him as a director has not less than 14 days before the meeting left at the registered office a notice in writing he he can be outsider also or he can be member also if you take he as an outsider outsider has proposed himself or he or some other member has proposed him him is an outsider here for example some other member has proposed him so member can propose an outsider or he can also be a member for that matter so member proposing himself is allowed member or some other member proposing him so a member can propose one more member so basically that's all a member can propose himself one more member or an outsider outsider can propose himself outsider cannot propose a member an outsider cannot propose another outsider to be appointed as the director so that's all is covered here member and outsider an outsider can only propose himself since an outsider also can give a 14 day notice that is why this 160 notice is not a special notice because outsider also can give 14 days is common 7 days is common this is proposal to do what appoint a director very very simple proposal to appoint a director left at the register of the company notice in writing under his hand signifying his candidature as a director intention to propose him with a deposit of 1 lakh rupees so 1 lakh rupees have to, has to be deposited why to enforce seriousness because if i am proposing myself i need to give a 1 lakh rupee deposit was tomorrow it should not be a frivolous application in the old law it was some 500 rupees in 1956 people were giving uh, once upon a time infosys had 1 lakh deposits 1 lakh what do you say applications so what's the point right so they basically 1 lakh you have to give will this be refunded so only be refunded if you win no not if you win you will be refunded if you get more than 25% of the valid votes correct even if you lose you should lose decently more than 25% you should get at least it shouldn't be like only you are voting for yourself right at least minimum more than 25% of the valid votes if you get no problem even if you lose the election no problem but i'll refund your money 1 lakh rupees now again one peculiar thing was there that uh, big big companies like infosys for example went to kiran mazumdar shah who is actually an independent director they went to kiran mazumdar shah and said why don't you come and be the independent director of the company she said okay no problem so by the time I mean, she was about to come company secretary asked for 1 lakh deposit it's weird she said sir please give me this deposit ma'am i'll again immediately give it back to you because provisions are like that so petitions were made to come uh, what do you say uh, mca saying that this is really if i have only proposed or rather if the board has nominated or if it's an independent director there is no need of this 1 lakh 1 lakh is actually only for the ones who are proposing themselves or some random no proposal has come from board then only 1 lakh is needed 1 lakh is not needed if a nomination and remuneration committee has proposed or if you are happen happen to be a independent director not needed so they took up the a uh, suggestion and it was amended saying that 1 lakh is not needed if the suggestion is coming from what nomination and remuneration committee as well as what the yes recommended by the board of directors so if you see here in the extra shots proposed candidate shall deposit 1 lakh rupees no problem at least 14 days before the meeting and deposit of 1 lakh is not needed if appointment of independent director slash director nominated by nomination remuneration committee or director nominated by the board deposit should be refunded if director gets more than 25% of the valid votes 160 must be complied with for appointment of director at any general meeting thus if an additional director casual vacancy or any of those other directors want to become a normal director you have to follow the provisions of 160 without fail 
Other procedural requirements you have to file DIR to concern with the company. DIR number 12 concern with the ROC. Update the register of directors. Update the register of directors shareholding. Inform the stock exchanges for listed in company and refund of the deposit. Very important for you to get the refund of the deposit. If you get more than 25%, of course, if you win the election, no doubt about it. So that is what it is. Ordinary resolution only. And they will enter into a mechanism of 150 to 6. The moment you go through 160, you will enter into the rotation mechanism of 150 to 6. Then sometimes you will retire by rotation, sometimes you will not. It depends on the facts of the case. So that is regarding this simple section 160. And 160 notice is definitely not a special notice. We have already seen that. And uh, one interesting thing, what will happen if that 1 lakh rupees is not refunded? These are some extra hidden points. It, I felt it was not needed to add all these things in the summary book. Summary book should only be like quick revision. But nevertheless, if uh, 1 lakh rupees is not refunded as a, what do you say, the deposit amount, interesting to know that, you know, this will obviously, uh, not only, what about the interest rate, etc. if they give, everything is immaterial. It will directly hit 164 2B. Because it talks about dividends, no deposits. Any That deposit should be taken as any deposit. So here, this is also a deposit. So definitely, since you have not repaid the deposit, and if the failure continues for one year or more only. So you are supposed to refund today. You have refunded tomorrow, okay. You have refunded five months later, okay. But if you have continued for one year or more, then it's an issue. Then what happens? It will result in 164 to be whereby you will have to vacate your office where other companies you have to vacate your office in other companies not here in this company you can continue this is only if the failure continues for one year or more failure continues for one year or more that's about it very simple that is regarding that section 160 applicability we've already seen moving on to 161 one additional director Additional director is only given for what? If you want some extra people on board, a project is going on and you need some extra person for that particular project, uh, you don't want to appoint him as a regular director, you want to see, test the waters to see whether he is compatible, then you will generally appoint an additional director, so to speak. So if you see the articles of a company, the wordings of the Bayer Act of a company may confer on its board of directors the power to appoint any person other than a person who fails to get appointed as director in a general meeting as an additional director at any time who shall hold office up to the date of the next AGM or the last date on which AGM should have been held whichever is earlier. So first of all it says the articles of the company may confer on its board of directors. If the articles happen to be silent then the articles cannot confer any power which means if the articles are silent section will not apply. This is an example of power derived from articles, not subject to. 152.1 and 152.6 were examples of power subject to articles. 160 articles is not there in the picture at all. 161.1, it is a power derived from articles, which means if the articles are silent, section will not apply. If articles are silent, section will not apply. So the article should confer the power on whom? On the board of directors. To appoint any person other than a person who fails to get, get himself appointed. So basically additional director, what's the scene? Who will appoint um, articles? If they happen to be silent, then you cannot appoint additional director at all. Articles, if they give the power to the board of directors, then the board of directors to appoint. Now the next question is, board of directors can appoint via two routes. One is, they can appoint via board meeting resolution or they can appoint via circular resolution. Circular resolution is where they don't sit across the table and discuss, but under 175 of the Companies Act, they will send the regulation, uh, the draft regulation to everybody at their residences and uh, to website, uh, that is through email, sorry. You can check it out and then respond. No need to discuss as such. So since they have never used the word meeting anywhere here, it just says board of directors. Since they have not used the word meeting specifically, hence, well, I can say that this section will not, you can obviously go through the board meeting route also or you can go through the circular resolution route also. Unless you have seen the word meeting anywhere, correct? Only then you need the board meeting resolution. For example, in 179.3, whether to borrow money, invest funds, grant loans, etc., it has to happen at the meeting of the board. 
here they have not used the word meeting so this also was one question asked can you do via circular resolution yes can you do via board meeting resolution yes your choice so that is the thing uh, then what is the tenure of this person up to the date means commencement of the next stadium wherever you are appointed i don't care your tenure is only till the commencement of the next annual general meeting or again the last date on which the agm should have been held similar to 126 126 it was a mca clarification but here they have put it in the act itself last date on which the agm should have been held so including extensions including extensions the last day on which it should have been held that is 30th september generally you should that fellow will continue if you do not reappoint him or whatever the agm is not held that's it he will vacate on the last day on which agm should have been held that's about it whichever is earlier that is what they say board of directors we have then one more question they are ask is can articles confer the power on shareholders can articles confer the power on shareholders asked in the exam if you see here some interpretation people say may confer on the board of directors which means they may also confer on the shareholders but that would be a wrong interpretation here when the article of the company may it says here may should be read as shall in the sense appointment of additional director is a discretion appointment of an additional director is a discretion but if you want to appoint an additional director it is mandatory that it should be given only to the board of directors shareholders will not know as to you know whether you are eligible or not otherwise that's what you have to keep in mind so if you see one second it will be after all these things if there are extra points otherwise we'll read it here only let's first read this the extra shots a person who okay we'll come to the first point in a while up to the date of the next stage you must interpret as what up to the time of commencement of the first stage you just turn this this side little yeah thank you up to the date means what up to the time of commencement of the next stage you that's it so again here can additional director be appointed by shareholders in the general meeting it is not possible as per the blair open hearth furnace company limited versus regard no need to remember the name if the board is incompetent only then shareholders may appoint only if the board of directors are incompetent to appoint then shareholders can appoint additional directors otherwise additional directors cannot be appointed by shareholders in general meeting even in in the exam you have to write the same answer is it possible or not not possible main answer is not possible note can be this that's all note can be this main answer always not possible and point number 5 is also interesting and important additional director is always excluded from total number of directors under 1526 we know why but always included in the total number of directors in the company obviously right directors in the company 15 that you have to always include otherwise i mean in the other thing it should, you should always exclude so if you see in any question if they ask you the company has around 15 directors in which two are additional directors and one is independent director just like that they'll ask so what would be the number now 12 right so then they say that uh, the company now wants to take loan from hsbc bank and they want to appoint one nominee director how will you insert this what will you do if they ask like that so if you see 12 what is the status as of now 8 and 4 right 8 and 4 now if i want to insert one uh what do you say hsbc fellow who is a nominee director he has to come into this 4 plus 1 i cannot convert anybody from non rotational to rotational it is banned nowhere it is allowed in companies act you can convert rotational to non rotational if they are good that's okay but non rotational to rotation not possible which means i have to maintain this as 13 12 plus 1 13 only because this one hsbc fellow is coming but this non rotational category should be fixed at 4 and i have to somehow manage an appoint one and this will remain eight the problem with this is if you see 13 8 and 5 if you see 2/3 of 13 it comes up to 8 point something which means this has to be nine so in order to accommodate one non rotational fellow i actually have to appoint one more rotational guy to make it 14 to make it 14 this will be 8 plus 1 9 and this will be 4 plus 1 5 again there is a problem if you do 2/3 of 14 it's coming to 9 point something so which means it's very simple guys when there is already 2/3 and 1/3 if i am accommodating one guy in the non rotational category simple maths i have to accommodate two people in the rotational category so basically 
if there are 12 i am just adding one in the non rotational category i have to add two in the rotational category so overall it should be 15 right there are 12 i have to add 2 plus 1 so earlier it was a i mean 12 8 and 4 right so this one person should come here hsbc guy to make it 5 and i have to appoint two rotational directors i have to appoint two rotational directors in the exam you should never write appoint two additional directors because additional will be 1611 and 1611 fellow will never be included in this total number i have already excluded your 15 minus 1 already excluded this guy never included him in the total number so though additional means extra we should never write two additional directors it should be two rotational directors so this is the scene but so what is the procedure here to appoint one non-rotational director i have to appoint two rotational directors under 152 2 red with 160 so that 12 will eventually become 15 but one more thing we are missing 15 will become what 18 15 will become 18 so special resolution both amendment of articles as well as 149 1b two special resolutions have to be passed this was a four mark question asked two three times so like that they can ask that's why we should know here that additional director will always be excluded from total number and always be included for the total number of directors under 149 1 always so that's how it is then uh, what about this uh, i gave you an example that if you have let's say you have not repaid the deposit on uh, let us say some august or july july 2022 you have not repaid the deposit that guy did not win the election but he got 30 percent valid votes he also didn't ask one lakh you also didn't give one lakh one year has already elapsed 8th august 2023 auditor is checking all these things then he figures out that you have not refunded which means disqualification will come vacation will happen now to prevent this from happening the directors will rush to the director who had got 30 percent votes and they'll say look um, you got 30 percent you lost but it was not a hopeless loss what we'll do is we will now include you as the board of directors you please uh, give a declaration that you have received this money we will do some you know gold mal in the accounts that you don't worry but you please say that you have already received the uh, what you said deposit and as a token of gratitude we will make you an additional director because we have the power under 161.1 people were doing this to curb that only this line has been inserted what line other than a person who fails to get appointed as director in a general meeting so if you fail to come through the main door there is absolutely no backdoor entry under companies act you will not be allowed to go through the back door that is point number one extra shot person who fails to get appointed as director in a general meeting cannot be appointed as additional director under 161.1 absolutely no backdoor entry no backdoor entry under any you know circumstances so up to the date of the next AGM is what? That is up to the commencement of the AGM. Next AGM, no backdoor entry, fine. Person who fails to get appointed will of course eventually he will be appointed uh, through normal route only. If I if the shareholders have rejected you, shareholders only have to accept you. It's not that backdoor entry is possible. Uh, apart from that, yeah, we have already decided that he should power derived from articles is it so basically if aoa is silent additional director cannot be appointed and additional director should be appointed only for some special projects and if you just need extra hands on deck it cannot be for any other reason can it be to sort of what do you say four companies a limited b limited c limited d limited enter into a contract to appoint i mean to sort of start a company e limited a has almost 49 percent majority b c d together have 51 percent majority can they join hands now collude and a has around four directors b c d together have five directors can they collude now so that basically there's a majority in the board what will they do they will appoint six more or five more directors or six more directors only to listen to them so overall earlier it was 5 is to 4 now it has become 11 is to 4 clear cut any resolution whatever majority you require 70% uh, majority 80% majority can easily be passed by B, C and D 
A can go to the court and say the appointment of additional director is invalid. Have they broken any law here? No. The law says board of directors can appoint. 5 is to 4. Who has majority? 5. They can appoint. But it appears to be they have broken a law because the intention of legislation in 161.1 was not to just increase the strength. It was to increase the strength only if it is needed. So there were many case laws where they say it should be for the bona fide interests of the company. Bona fide means good faith. Bona is good, fide is faith. Bona fide interests of the company and not for, not for strengthening the board which will obviously amount to oppression and mismanagement, oppression of minority and mismanagement. So there are various cases which have held that your intention of law is supreme, just don't go by the provisions. You have not broken any law, I agree, but it is still that you have broken a law for sure. And as I told you, it can either be a board meeting resolution or a circular resolution. They cannot be appointed by members, that is what you should always think, but there is an exception that you can write. I see I have you again, I have written it. On confers on the power, I see a view. Only exception is the second point. Only if there is this incompetent Baron versus Potter. As an exception, you should write as a note. But the main answer should always be this, already discussed. And whichever is earlier is what you need to see. Now, one more thing is, if you are an additional director, and this is the AGM, I appoint Mr. A as an additional director, who is really good in his work. I appoint him as an additional director. Somewhere down the line, I also feel that he should be made managing director also because of his expertise. He has suddenly taken the entire, what do you say, company by storm and is doing really good work. So, by the power vested under section 197 and schedule number 5, uh, by passing around 18 to 20 procedural points, which we will see in cluster 5, uh, they have appointed this person as an MD. So, captaincy is given to additional director. Now, the problem happens when at the AGM, at the AGM, Mr. A loses the directorship position. When you are no longer a player, how can you be a captain? You cannot be a captain. When you are no longer a player, you cannot be a captain. If you are a player, you may or may not be a captain. But when you are no longer a player, you cannot be a captain. So, the problem here is at the AGM, Mr. A loses what? directorship. If A loses directorship, the office of the MD, they say, goes hand in hand. Hand in hand with the office of what? Director. Like this we cannot write in the exam. We have to write some decent word. Coterminus. Hand in hand all don't write. Yes. Coterminus. The office of the MD is what? Coterminus with the office of the director. It goes actually hand in hand. So, the Director position goes means MD position goes, but the other way around is not possible. MD position goes, director will not go, right? So, that this actually is attached to the director position. Now, the problem is the moment I vacate just before the AGM because my tenure is over, what will happen? The MD position also comes to an end. Nevertheless, in this particular AGM, though there is a difference of few hours, one day, whatever it is, in this AGM, since he was really good, I told you, once an additional director, always an additional director. If you want to be a re regular director, you have to go through 152 to red with 160. So, they actually appoint him afresh. So, you are actually a backdoor entry. I will say, please come from the front door only. You are now, I am welcoming you as a normal director. Plus, I am going to give you the MD position. I want you to continue as a captain. Should I follow these 18 to 20 regulations again is the question asked in the exam because there was a technical break. It can be 5 hours break, 6 hour break, 1 day break, break is a break. There is a break whereby your captaincy position goes. Now, I am reinstating you as a captain by following all those 18 to 20 procedural points. Now, will this, what do you say, amount to? Should I follow these 18 to 20 pro provisions again? Answer is 100 percent yes. You have to follow all the 18 to 20 procedural points again. However, MCA has given a relaxation. You need to write yes. If you write no, gone. You should write yes. However, ICA has given a, sorry, MCA has given a relaxation. ICA will give you relaxation if you write that. So, MCA has given a relaxation what? They have given a relaxation of what? That if you follow this concept where you are a 161 one director, 
additional director then you have been given an md position captaincy position at the agm you are vacating your office but at the agm i am regularizing your appointed under 1522 red with 160 and then again reinstating you as an md notwithstanding the technical break though you are supposed to take all the approvals there is a relaxation no need to take any approvals this is the thing that they can ask in the exam it is there in point number 3 point number 3 same point is given so every point in the summary book can take 10 15 minutes you know explanation but then in such revision we are only doing since assuming that you already have studied all this yes 1611 plus md and 1322 red with 160 plus md that's it on the other hand if i am an additional director here only in the same scene mr a was an additional director 1611 okay then appointed i appointed him as an md okay again here at the agm at the they immediately before the what do you say agm they hold one more board meeting or immediately after the agm they hold one board meeting or through circular resolution again they make him additional director they'll say let me see for one more agm till next agm i'll see now when i want to reinstate him as a md again should i follow all the approvals anyway the answer is yes but is there a relaxation no no relaxation relaxation is only for 161 plus 160 combination that is exactly what this says check it out such person continues to be md even though there is a technical break at agm in the office of director hence fresh approvals not required this is only for 161 and 160 combo if it's any other thing 161 plus 161 no relaxation in the exam you should write yes fresh approvals are required however are not required as per mca uh, because there is a technical break and for administrative convenience you need to close it if you write no it would be a wrong answer so that is the scene with respect to 161 that completes uh, additional director very simple section 160 is also done 161 is also done let us uh, now go to 1612 we'll come to it in a while one second we'll finish off 1613 which is very very simple 1613 page number 21 1613 very simple guys it applies to both public company and private company nominee director this part you know because of various judicial judicial pronouncements this interpretation is not taken though the law says this only but in the exam what to do i have that's why i have given your these three things have to be taken into account that's all mandatory in the exam you should check this three points one you should see in the question whether there is a loan agreement loan agreement must be there they should clearly give loan agreement specifies appointment of nominee if that is if it is missing appointment of nominee director is invalid all three conditions plus second condition articles has to prescribe the terms and conditions if articles are silent gone that's where you will find a difference between this and this. that's why i'm saying that's why i'm making this video also this is as per law yes you are 100% right if you read the wordings yes but examination stick to these three loan agreement must second articles must prescribe the tnc third one board of directors resolution is 100% compulsory board of directors resolution is 100% all the three conditions if it is satisfied nominee director appointment is valid even if one is not satisfied it is invalid next question is board of directors resolution should it be board meeting resolution or circular resolution anything because guys if you see 1793 you know d talks about borrowing money borrowing money from banks or financial institutions to borrow money i have to take what an approval that is board meeting resolution only this also nevertheless can be delegated to a managing director principal officer whereby i can delegate it to him he can only borrow only if the borrowing goes beyond net worth 180 1c will come 
that would require board meeting resolution plus special resolution prior that we have seen 179 3d and 181c speaks about borrowing money 179 3d and 181c do not talk about appointing a nominee director so should not get confused in the course of borrowing money i'll obviously appoint a nominee director so either i can discuss at the same meeting and close it or for borrowing money i'll take a resolution but then the other terms and conditions will generally come later so appointment of board uh, board of directors resolution is what do you say it's just a administrative procedure which i have to do if you see the wordings though if you see the wordings peculiarly it tells a certain different thing which you will probably figure out like why they have given that wordings again this is again interpretation of statutes which we need to understand one second because these are some important areas which we need to spend little bit time so if you see 161 3 year subject to the articles of the company this you can ignore why articles have to prescribe now that's why do not do not get confused stick to those say for the exam here board may appoint any person the act uses the word may but i have written the word compulsory so what do you think is it may or shall yes the when i say board may appoint it means that okay the board may borrow money and then nominee director that is all let discretion but when it is borrowing money and the loan agreement clearly says that you have to appoint a director a board of director then i mean one one person as a on the board of directors yes it is compulsory so in most of the cases for example if you want to see a uh, casual vacancy director under 161 4 casual vacancy director filling up is it man mandatory or discretionary one fellow died director will a good deed died he was simply not doing anything so what should i actually what uh, replace him no so definitely if you see 161 4 it uses the word right may it uses the word may so appointment of casual vacancy replacement of casual vacancy or appointment of casual vacancy director when i use the word may it is 100% discretionary can you tell the same logic for casual vacancy auditor no casual vacancy auditor under 139 a uses the word shall which means it is 100% mandatory you have to appoint a casual vacancy auditor so most of the cases in the companies act when they use the word may it is discretionary when they use when you use the word shall it is mandatory but there are certain areas like this now for example where Uh, one example is 161.3, where you will do so. Then again, again, if you see, uh, there are cer certain areas like, for example, 139, that is appointment of auditors. 139 appointment of auditors. If you check that appointment of especially the first auditor route, the first auditor. Yeah. the first auditor shall be appointed by the board and if the board fails shall inform the members and the members shall appoint so the first auditor under 139 for six first auditor it says shall be appointed by board if the board fails then shareholders shall appoint on what failure of board question is very simple here when i use the word shall it is mandatory you cannot say that if you fail what to do if you fail there will be consequences but under 13096 if you fail also i have given another route since i have given another route without any consequence this shall should be read as may this is the principle of exceptional construction exceptional construction so in some cases in most of the cases may will be read as may only shall will be read as shall very simple but in some peculiar cases this shall will be read as may and if you see shareholders shall appoint the second shall will it be may no this is mandatory shareholders have to appoint auditors company cannot be without an auditor simple this again is a normal route similarly in 1613 right they have used the word board may appoint should it be read as may or shall board may appoint nominee which means 
does it mean that today i took took money from icici bank tomorrow when that fellow is coming i'll tell i'll not appoint you why because his board may appoint no this should be read as what shall it's like telling you may please get out like that if i tell the word may does it have any value no the word please does it have any value no it's an order so here may is called conventional courtesy so this may will be read as shall so this two will come under exceptional construction right so in most of the cases may will be may most of the cases may shall will be shall but in some cases shall will be may in some cases may will be shall we need to understand that otherwise may will be november november will be may july august cancellation sometimes covid yes so that is what it is so if you see all the three conditions must be fulfilled loan agreement is a must articles must prescribe and board resolution is compulsory so may through exceptional construction interpretation of statute has gone to shall this interpretation of statute and all why are you telling because it's part of your syllabus where in ca inter which you are deemed to have studied four marks it used to come we, we quit that chapter and some of us are coming from old syllabus inter old syllabus inter not there new syllabus final not there removed from that and put to new syllabus inter this is the most important chapter in law honestly which only comes of 4 to 5 marks in inter which we leave it as choice in final it will come back and haunt us so this is exceptional construction so loan agreement is a must all three done now nominee director cannot be removed we have seen already in 169 nominee director cannot be removed then nominee director shall not retire by rotation he is either removed from the total number if it is from a special act of parliament or is a non rotational director we have seen everything now you will get the link it connects simply so yes any person will have to go through this this is all you need to remember next casual vacancy alternate director will come because once we finish casual vacancy then we can go to the uh, alternate director concept alternate sorry uh, casual vacancy will finish off first now if the office of any director appointed by the company in general meeting is vacated before his term of office expires now vacancy has not been defined anywhere uh, sorry casual vacancy has not been defined anywhere what is casual vacancy it is vacancy arising in the office of the director after he has been appointed and after he has validly accepted the appointment and if anything happens to him during the tenure that is exactly why once your tenure is over under 1526 you choose not to be reappointed you send a letter saying that i am unwilling to be reappointed is it resignation no is it casual vacancy no that is definitely a vacancy when will it be a casual vacancy when you have been appointed and validly appointed validly accepted given the consent everything done filed the all the dirs that is needed and during the term before the tenure if anything happens anything can happen death disqualification vacation insanity anything can happen removal also that's why if you see in in the vac vacation section removal also is there so casual vacancy is a different concept after appointment and after validly accepting the appointment anything happens that will amount to a casual vacancy so that's why before his term of office expires in the normal course the resulting vacancy may in default of and subject to ha huh, default of and subject to any regulation so this is again power subject to articles so to revise 152 1 is power subject to articles 152 6 power subject to articles 161 4 is power subject to articles actually 161 3 is also power subject to articles what is the only one which is power derived from articles additional director as of now 1611 additional director is a power derived from articles only in 1611 if the articles are silent section does not apply in all other cases if articles are silent section would definitely apply but you should see the terms and conditions of the section and move on so yes uh, here again resulting casual vacancy may it's my discretion will be filled by may be filled by the board of directors at a meeting of the board yes that is what very very clearly it says under 161 if you saw 161 you could do via board meeting resolution or circular 161 3 same 
but if you see 161 4 it says board meeting resolution circular resolution not possible circular resolution not possible it has to be via board meeting resolution combining 161 1 and 161 4 they asked a question once that a director that was Mr. Sachin. Mr. Sachin was appointed as an additional director in a casual vacancy through circular resolution. Comment, 4 marks. Exam question. They are asking like this now. Can you appoint somebody as an additional director in a casual vacancy through circular resolution? No. You can either appoint him as an additional director or as a casual vacancy director. If it's casual vacancy director, circular resolution not possible. Additional director possible. So that question was predominantly more on additional director. So you should write that circular resolution is okay. But you cannot appoint somebody as an additional director in a casual vacancy. So any vacancy that is created in the office of the director, that vacancy need not be filled that we need to know. I don't have to fill the vacancy at all. Why do I need to fill the vacancy? Vacancy need not be filled or I can fill the vacancy through appointment of any director, right? I can fill the vacancy through appointment of any director. I can appoint, fill the vacancy by appointment of a regular director under 152 red with 160. I can appoint an additional director to fill the vacancy, vacant position. I can appoint any other director, no problem. But this section is only when, when you fill the vacancy as a casual vacancy only then 161.4 will come if the previous director dies I can choose not to fill the vacancy if the previous director dies there is a vacant position in the office I can choose to appoint a brand new director who is no link with the old director but if I choose to appoint him as a casual vacancy director under 161.4 only then this section will come whereby the tenure of the previous director will flow to the current director. That's all. The only part of casual vacancy director is what? Tenure flows from the previous director. So this is again an important thing to know. Some We always feel that vacancy should be filled only with casual vacancy. No. That's why they use the word may. You choose not to fill it. Okay. Or I don't want to fill it as casual vacancy, but I'll fill it. But through other sections, okay. Then those sections will come. But if I choose to fill it as casual vacancy by passing a board meeting resolution, so there are two things to it. One is the mode of appointment and the tenure. Tenure is very simple, flows from the previous director, flows from the previous director. Appointment provisions, two things are there. One is board meeting resolution plus it has to be approved by the shareholders in the immediately next general meeting. In the immediately next general meeting. There are only two sections in the entire Companies Act where they have used the word approved instead of appointment. Approved in case of appointment. In regular class, some half hour discussion all we have done. Now just to cut it short. Approval versus appointment, what's the difference? Appointment is obviously all appointments shall happen through 152 red with 160. Here board says they will appoint, it shall be done, but it will be approved by shareholders. One more area, one is this 161.4 where they have used the word approved. One more is your uh, MD provisions under 196.4 where again they have used the word approved. Approval will be done by shareholders. Now, when they have used the word approved, the question is, will the appointment start off as a valid appointment when the board approves or, or when the board appoints or will the appointment begin here or appointment will begin here is the question. Why is this important? Because what happens to all the acts done during this time? So, it is a very peculiar scenario where appointment will be valid from the beginning itself, but it will reach finality only when you take approval of the shareholders. So it's like I've appointed you, but you are like on probation till what time? Till the shareholders approve. So that next GM can be next AGM, EGM, whatever. It can be six months, eight months, whenever it is. For eight months, all that you do will be definitely valid, no doubt about it. Appointment starts off as a valid appointment, no doubt about it, but it will reach finality only when the shareholders 
approve it how will they approve it shareholders what resolution ordinary resolution there is no special resolution ordinary resolution so it's a peculiar case just like 1964 where the appointment starts off as valid but later becomes actually valid upon ordinary resolution by shareholders so this is they have used the word approved it's a very peculiar case just like 1964 anyway tenure it flows from the previous guy tenure flows from the previous guy so if you see no not mandatory to fill the vacancy casual vacancy director holds office till the expiry of the term of the director in whose place in whose place he was appointed in whose place he was appointed in whose place he was appointed then uh, for example uh, one rotational director uh, passed away right rotational director passed away he was in the second year of his tenure the first year of his tenure a b c so a passed away he was a rotational director can i appoint a casual vacancy of course so i have appointed a casual vacancy director in his place mr d assume now now this guy comes to the uh, one agm the other agm whatever it is now at the agm final agm where these directors are retiring at the time when they are retiring b can be reappointed c can be reappointed either directly or through automatic reappointment route but can d ever be reappointed as a casual vacancy director no because the tenure only flows from the previous director previous director's tenure is ending right here so mr d can never be reappointed but i like d i want him to come into the company afresh so again 152 to red with 160 that is the meaning of this dialogue he is not a retiring director within the meaning of 1226 once a cv always a cv if his appointment as a regular director is needed it requires compliance with 160 requires compliance with 160 once a cv always a cv it cannot be done then uh, one more thing there are various types of uh, you know directors that you have there are you know various directors that you what do you say have like you have directors which directors you have uh, you have your first director 1321 who was mentioned in the articles or it could be like those subscribers to memorandum route who are regularized actually fine or you could have a normal 160 director you can have an additional director under 1611 you can have a casual vacancy director under 1612 you can have a nominee director you can have again a cv director casual vacancy the question is if any of these people die or whatever happens before the tenure can i appoint a casual vacancy director under 1614 is the question can i appoint a casual vacancy director under 1614 if any of these people die so the first question is can you appoint a casual vacancy director for a first director so again the answer is of course in the bare act if you see if the office of any director appointed by the company in general meeting is vacated before his term expires the original appointment should have been done by shareholders in general meeting which means here this director was never appointed by shareholders in general meeting he was appointed by articles so if that fellow dies 1614 will not come definitely no subscribers to memorandum who is regularized under 1522 red with 160 since is regularized i can appoint 1614 casual vacancy of a regular director possible of course if a person was appointed under 1522 red with 160 dies definitely 1614 is applicable what if an additional director dies this was the question there he was appointed as an additional director in a casual vacancy casual vacancy in additional director not possible why 
is always appointed by board of directors since is always appointed by board of directors and only those who have been appointed by shareholders in general meeting they can be replaced under 161 4 so here it is not possible at all alternate we haven't seen we'll check that 161 3 161 3 also appointed by board it is not appointed by shareholders hence this also 161 4 will not apply we studied everything but in the exam they asked this mr a was appointed under 152 2 red with 160 he died during the tenure they immediately replaced him with mr b so mr b is he a person who is replacing a person who was appointed by shareholders in general meeting yes so possible they appointed him under 161 4 in that happiness he died in 3 days <laughs> so mr c now new guy this fellow now tell me he is replacing what a person mr b who was actually a casual vacancy director now this fellow casual vacancy director was appointed by board meeting resolution and shareholders approval so can i say mr c is replacing a person who was appointed by shareholders or approved by shareholders so basically this was a new provision this was not there before if the old law was this only that's all so assume now if mr c was appointed in place of mr b was mr b appointed by shareholders no so then the answer would have been easy saying that no it's not possible but now because of this shareholders thing i don't know whether mr b was actually appointed by shareholders or not appointed by shareholders if you conclude that mr b was actually appointed by shareholders then of course mr b also will become a person appointed by shareholders and i can do a casual vacancy of a casual vacancy so whatever may be the legal position there is an mca clarification which says when there is a cv of a cv you ignore that cv go to the main appointment if the first appointment was done by shareholders then cv of a cv is possible cv of a cv is possible all that you leave tell me what to what to write in the exam correct no correct so if you see point number 6 point number 6 very important casual vacancy of the casual vacancy director in the exam main answer should be reverse the gut feeling casual vacancy of casual vacancy director not possible examination icci has still considered that not possible why not possible to explain yes not possible but please also write a note in the exam about mca clarification mca clarification icci have ignored so as a note yes mca expressed the view that if originally an appointment was made in a general meeting the board may fill the vacancy arising in such office as many times as necessary this was the mca clarification but in the exam you should main answer not possible then note and note has to be given this is called cv of a cv doubts later man doubts later please right so done next seventh one if original director is an md if original director is an md should casual vacancy be an md no if original director is a managing director casual vacancy need not be a managing director it's not no hard and fast rule because you are a cap you are just a captain captain can be anybody on the other hand if original director is not an md i'll appoint a casual vacancy director can he end up becoming an md yes casual vacancy director can be a managing director george bailey in australia i was he came in as a substitute player became a captain right if original director is not an md casual vacancy director can be an md doesn't matter no problem yes so this guy uh, casual vacancy director all that we'll have to see then 10 and 11 9 and 10 will come it comes later uh, 11 casual vacancy of an additional director 
an additional director in a casual vacancy all this is not possible they are different concepts and should not be confused with casual vacancy because vacancy can be filled in three things one need not fill or fill it as normal vacancy or fill it as casual vacancy so you cannot mix the two is what they say now we saw this thing in uh, additional director concept where you are uh, managing i mean you are a uh, additional director then you given managing director position then again regularized under 160 all that we saw only for then what is uh, what is the relaxation given only for regularization that is 1611 and 160 combo only for that but there are some additional points we will see that here then coming to casual vacancy direct this point we will see after we finish subsection 2 uh yeah then casual vacancy director versus auditor it's obviously here, here it is may here it is shall this is immediately next general meeting auditor it is 3 months from the board resolution date 3 months from board resolution date tenure original director's tenure will flow from the casual vacancy director whereas auditor it is till the conclusion of the next stage here cv of a cv it is as good as cv of a cv of a normal auditor it is possible here it is not possible but mci has given a clarification that we have seen last part in this series of 1611 would be uh, 1612 that is my alternate director alternate director so again if you see the berak 1612 just quickly read that 1612 is what does it say the board of directors of the company may if so authorized by the articles or resolution first of all alternate director concept earlier in 1956 was used where you went from the state in which the board meetings are ordinarily held in 1956 it was very difficult to travel so if the uh, what do you say registered office was in mumbai and i left to bangalore for 3 months 4 months whatever it was very difficult for me to obviously come back to that meeting there was no concept of video conferencing etc that's why in the absence of the place where the board meetings are held you could have appointed somebody called alternate director now in 2011 there were regulations where video conferencing was allowed and now in 2013 you can sit in from 2013 onwards anywhere in the world and attend board meetings so under section 173 board meetings can be via video conferencing also and under section 174 quorum also can be via even via video conferencing you will be counted as you know in the quorum position so the thing is if it's already allowed what's the point of having an alternate director concept alternate director concept was where earlier when you cannot attend others can come now you can attend sitting everywhere so as of now alternate director concept has been reduced to only two things one is medical impossibility where you are going abroad and now it's not even the state etc it is absence from india if you have gone abroad for more than 3 months where your intention is medical treatment you will come to the company and say i'd rather resign no problem now imagine if for example mukesh ambani has to go on some medical treatment god forbid and 6 months he has to travel abroad he tells i want to resign from reliance what happens to reliance shares that's exactly why they say no problem sir you be on the board you take leave no problem but medical so in your absence if need be only that to need be i will appoint a alternate director so alternate director is appointed when the original director goes abroad for more than 3 months and only generally medical emergency and also second point of of course would be a sabbatical where they need to take a break sabbatical is a break long leave because of the tensions in the you know general world many many directors have opted for this i need a four month break five month break six month break possible so when they want to take a break then of course though there may be some uh, variations in the share prices but you still know that is still sticking around does that he needs a break for personal reasons so that again you can appoint an alternate director very very important to know alternate director is not a proxy not at all a proxy he will not listen to original director he has his own rights own liabilities own thought process if original director would have said yes to a contract this fellow can say no there is no hard and fast rule that i have to follow what the other the, my predecessor told the only two things that flow from him is what tenure tenure and mode of appointment mode of appointment when will it come 
only when the original director goes abroad for more than three months. So technically speaking, tell me, do you can you appoint uh, what do you say uh, alternate director for NRI directors who never are in India? No. Can you appoint for foreign directors who never are in India? No, because the Act says during his absence, absence from India, absence. If there is no person called Rahul in class, can I say Rahul is absent in class? No. Rahul was never present. How can he be absent? It's Nityananda level. You have to understand. Right? So, when you are not even present, how can you be absent? You can't be. Right? So, absence presumes presence. Absence presumes presence. You have to be present first. Only then you can be absent. Right? They come back. So, if you see absence and presence, if you see those two wordings are there, which means what? You should be a person in India. So, you cannot appoint alternate directors for foreign nationals. You cannot appoint alternate director for NRIs. You cannot appoint alternate director for foreign collaborators where foreign collaborators from their money is coming in. To sit in India, you can't appoint. But ICI says reverse the cut. I have given you the logic and I am also telling you what ICI. ICI in many, many questions they have told uh, alternate directors have been appointed for foreign collaborators. What you need to do? Ignore that. Tell okay, you are only right. Fine. So actually it is not possible. They in those questions they'll never ask you validity of appointment. No, they'll only ask you about other provisions. Whether he is going, I mean, whether, whether the provisions of appointment is correct or not is what they'll ask. But they will never ask, is the concept of alternate director only wrong? No. So in the exam, if at all they have only given foreign collaborators have been appointed for uh, and alternate directors have been appointed ignore think of it is right it's correct but these words and all you should ignore but but if they give you <coughs> excuse me a separate question where they say that uh, you know this fellow was never present in india then you can write this answer but if they have only given already that this guy is uh, they have appointed alternate director you cannot say appointment of alternate director is invalid that would be wrong right just keep that in mind because off late I have seen two, three questions where they have blindly given uh, additional, uh, sorry, uh, alternate data has been appointed and in the suggested answers there is no suggestion also saying that it is wrong. So keep that in mind, that is one thing that you need to see. Now you see this uh, line, board of directors may, if so authorized by its articles or by a resolution passed by company, just read this once, I will ask you a question, just read this once, only this much. I will ask you a question immediately after this. Two interpretations are there, you need to tell me which is the correct one. Board of Directors of the company may, if so authorized by articles or by resolution passed by company in general meeting, appoint an alternate director. Interpretation number one, the Board of Directors of the company may appoint an alternate director. The authorization should come from the articles uh, for them to appoint. Full stop. If authorization is not there, shareholders themselves can appoint alternate director. I repeat, interpretation number one, board of directors of the company may appoint alternate director if authorization is there from the articles. If authorization is not there, which means articles are silent, then shareholders themselves can appoint alternate directors. Interpretation number one. Interpretation number two. The board of directors are the only people who can appoint alternate directors. The authorization, however, for the board of directors to appoint can either come from the articles or if the articles are silent, then the shareholders. Which one? Second one. Yes, 100%. Correct. Don't worry. Yeah. Second one is right. So, if you see <laughs> board of directors may. So, if you see what generally it is uh, again between two commas if there is a phrase which you have to ignore. So if there are there is sentence 1, comma 2 and 3. So the second one should be made first. This is a interpretation of such using grammar rules God only knows but this is the grammar rules. right? So first is the second sentence should come between the phrase between two commas have to be have to come here. We all know where uh, how we learnt our English. So yes then 1 plus 3 here. So how do I read this? The board of directors of the company may appoint alternate director. Now this may is obviously may only, it is my choice. Just because one fellow goes abroad, 
I need not appoint. It is my choice. However, the second dialogue that was within these two commas, the authorization to the board of directors should either come from where? Articles. So actually, it's a power derived from articles. It's a power derived from articles, or it should come from shareholders in general meeting. No resolution is given. So what resolution? Ordinary resolution. Now, if this provision was not there. This would be a classic case of power derived from articles. So article should give power to the board. If articles are silent, section does not apply. Let's for a moment assume that articles are silent and this provision was not there. If articles were silent, but I want to appoint, what do you say, this guy, uh, alternate director, how will I appoint? I'll amend the articles. I'll go to section number 14 and amend the articles. How will I amend the articles? All amendment happened to special resolution. Instead of this special resolution, a small relaxation is given. That is ordinary resolution. That's all. Relaxation. So to summarize, first of all, articles will authorize appointment of whom? Alternate director, board of directors may appoint. Board of directors again via board meeting resolution. Okay circular resolution okay in case articles are silent then i have a what do you say ordinary resolution in general meeting shareholders shareholders can never appoint alternate director shareholder can only authorize the board to appoint alternate director that is the reason why can i ever have Casual vacancy of alternate director. No. Previous section. Casual vacancy. Casual vacancy that is 161.4 of 161.2. This one part we did not fill there because we have to do now. 161.4 of 161.2 is it possible? No. Because 161.4 is only possible when the original director was appointed by shareholders. This original director can never be appointed by shareholders. So, you cannot appoint a casual vacancy director of a alternate director. Other things possible? 161.4 of 161.2? Yes, definitely yes. So, the board of directors, again, board meeting resolution or circular resolution, whatever it may be the case, doesn't matter, may appoint. Articles, if they don't authorize, then ordinary resolution can authorize to do so. Then it will go ahead, very simple. So, obviously, original director, managing director, manager cannot appoint an alternate director. Cannot appoint an alternate director. Shareholders cannot appoint an alternate director. Who should appoint only? Board of directors. Board of directors. So, alternate, coming to this, public company and private company, yes. AOA may authorize the board. If it is silent, who will authorize? Shareholders will authorize the board. Alternate director can be appointed for a director during his absence. During his absence for three months or more from India. Absence from India. Yes and the tenure of this guy is not just one. Tenure is three, are three things actually. First, shouldn't hold office longer than that permissible to the original director. Longer than that permissible to the original director. Original director's tenure is just eight months. So, can I go beyond that? No. So, my tenure will be not, what do you say, not three months to eight months. It is just, it's not fixed. Basically, However, his tenure is 8 months left, mine also 8 months left. His tenure is 2 years, mine is also 2 years. Till the original director returns to India. Returns. Again, absence and returns. When you return, obviously it means there is presence. Returns to India, they use the word, which means you have to come back. Or, if the term of the original director is terminated due to death, resignation, etc., he still had two years, but he resigned in four months. So, what happens to my tenure? Gone. He died in six months. Gone. So, either of the three. First, if he comes back to India. Second one, 
If it is terminated due to death, etc., first one not longer than that permissible. He only had some say, eight months left, ten months left. You also have eight to ten months, whatever it is, exactly the same. Now that is what it is. Returns to India. Now there were many bad interpretations using literal legis. Literal legis means literal construction. So one of the directors, a much loved director, had told that I am taking a break now, sabbatical. Two months I'll go stay with my uh, daughter. In two months, I'll stay with my son. They are abroad. I'll go separately. I'll stay two two months, and I'll only come out of four five months. So in their absence, they appointed another director who was a terror, alternate director. Nobody liked, including the company secretary. Now the company secretary is always in touch with the old director. Now it so happened that the old director in the particular case came back to India for a layover. Right. So this company secretary calls him and says, "Sir, where are you?" I'm missing you. Where are you? That I am here only, man. In India only. I am. I'm just uh, in the lounge waiting for my next flight. So this fellow, sir, have you returned to India? I mean, are you in India? Yes. Sir, has your feet touched Indian soil? Yes. Which means it is returned. It actually happened. He went to the alternate director and said, "Get out." Why? Because the original director has returned to India. Janssen Engineering Private Limited case law. Even if, for example, the original director comes. to the company says anyway i'm going tomorrow i just came to see how things are going alternate director sitting in front you are sitting your original director will alternate director vacate no the beauty of returns to india means what returns to work this was held in janssen engineering private limited case law that's why it's given in red year and starts working when i say returns it means with an object with an amount of permanence you should come back to work even if you go and meet the shareholder directors whatever doesn't mean you are working starts work resumes work returns to india means returns to india to resume work so if you are controlling some for singapore company a uh, singapore branch you need not appoint alternate director because you are working you can attend via video conferencing that's why i said it's only medical or other impossibility sabbatical reason nothing else actually so the term of original director is terminated yes then of course uh, there are other things where if you see the act here not being a person holding any alternate directorship for any other director in the company or holding directorship in the same company to act as an alternate director for a director an alternate director for a director So basically, if there are three companies A, B, C, and uh, C, X, Y, two different companies, uh, P Limited and J Limited, let's say they are different directors. These are common directors here. This guy, he has gone abroad. Obviously, in both companies, he would have gone abroad. Now the thing is here, if A is uh, what do you say, also going abroad, let us assume, can I appoint two people? Since he is going abroad, can I appoint? d and e in place of a is the question can i appoint two people in place of one or when two people are going out can i appoint one so if that is why it says here an alternate director for a director it should be one on one correlation an alternate director for a director second problem was generally let us say in this example c is going abroad b is already a director b is a director let's say b is also here b is a director or let's say b is not here just to give a different example b is a director of p limited okay can b can he be an alternate director for c in p limited only this was allowed till 2017 actually problem with this was what only one company p limited i am a director individual capacity plus i am also a director for this c in p limited which means when i am coming into the company company secretary is calling me as two right when i am sitting down they are telling two correct when i vote also when i say yes is counting as two problem practical problem that is one issue then i am asking for sitting fees twice He said, "No, no, you are sitting only once, but there are two. Everything you are counting to actually happened. Second problem was in the number of directorships. 
P is my 20th company, but I am holding two directorships. So should I take it as 20 or 21? If you see section 165, it says including alternate directorships, which means it will be taken as 21. Again observed. So they added this line. If you see, or holding directorship in the same company. No person who is holding that in the same company can be an alternate director. So, if you are a director in the same company, you cannot be an alternate director, it creates problem. However, tell me this now, can I be an alternate director for C in J Limited? Yes, I can, Mr. B can be a director of P Private Limited, okay, P Limited, sorry. He can be an alternate director for C in J Limited. Why? It is not in the same company. You are not holding directorship in the same company. Similarly, you are not a person holding alternate. Okay, again, similarly, can a random person Z hold alternate directorship for C in P Limited? Yes. Assume A is also going. Can he hold alternate directorship in for A? No, that also they gave not being a person holding any alternate directorship for any other director in the company. On the other hand, can Mr. Z hold alternate directorship for C in P Limited, alternate directorship for C in J Limited, same director, different companies. Can he be an alternate director for the same director, but in different companies? 100% possible. Why? Because it says, not being a person holding alternate directorship for any other director in the company. Not in a company, in the company. Right? These are all the permutations and combinations. Everything is given here. Check it out. Two alternate directors for one director in the same company? No. One alternate director for two directors in the same company? No. Director being alternate director for another director in the same company? No. Director being alternate director for another director in a different company. Yes, that is that B example. B was a director and also alternate director for C in another company. Possible. A person Z being alternate director for a director, Mr. C, in two different companies. Yes. So, these two are a yes. All the things no. Right. So, shareholders cannot appoint alternate director, various scenarios, all this we are done. Yes, his intention to be absent for three months from India is a prerequisite because we may come back before also, but when he is going, intention should be to go for minimum three months. During his absence, suggests returns to India, suggests that there has to be presence. Alternate director cannot be appointed in case of a director who resides outside India. Foreign director, NRA director, not possible. However, important, alternate directors can be appointed for foreign collaborators or directors. So, just stick to that. Alternate director is not at all a proxy of original director. Original director cannot influence him in any other manner, not possible. He is in the same position as any other director as regards his duties, liabilities, etc. Now, my question is, if alternate director is appointed for a rotational director or even if you are like a casual vacancy director appointed for rotational director whatever it is who will be counted in 152.6 total number I am not talking about 149 total number of directors in the company no I am talking about rotation in rotation original director will be counted or Casual vacancy director will be counted or original director will be counted or alternate director will be counted. That is one question that we need to answer. Who will like for example ABC is a rotational director. He has gone abroad for more than three months. In his place, you know, D has come as an alternate director. Who will be counted? Yes, the concept of appointment, reappointment, everything will apply to only Yes, original director and not to alternate director. So, if you see that was what the point which was there.
there you go right total number of directors as per 150 to 6 do not take alternate directors take original directors if you have by mistake taken two directors of which one is an alternate director please subtract is what i am saying correct you have to subtract that part alternate director subtract alternate directors appointed in place of rotational directors of course you need to subtract suppose you have taken both then it's an issue original director cannot influence him in the any manner in excess of powers he is in the same position as any other director as regards duties etc now one more question can come both of them are there though he is on a sabbatical it's an important matter now i have called the original director also though he is abroad he is agreed to come to this meeting alternate director sitting in the meeting original director is there whose vote will be counted yes only the alternate directors vote will be counted because first of all he has not returned to india second that not determined it's not determined and not longer than that permissible it's well within the term so my tenure is still there so if you attend the meeting i don't care my vote only will be counted so if you see same meeting via video conferencing by original director will not vacate the office of alternate director alternate directors vote only will be counted similar role if original director was an md should alternate director be an md no way it's not automatic that you are an md similarly alternate director can become an md even if the original director was not so now what if an independent director who is going abroad for more than 3 months can i appoint alternate director for him if yes should he also fulfill the independence criteria so that for this a separate chart is there including sebi combine combination of sebi and uh, companies act which you have to write in the exam if it is a listed company regulation 25 of sebi lodr very much part of the syllabus from october 1st 2018 alternate director for an independent director cannot be appointed will write can be appointed and come wrong this is important this is not as per companies act as per sebi right alternate director for an independent director cannot be appointed for any listed company for an unlisted company however then only the 160 161 to first proviso will apply alternate director should also follow all the independence requirements because as per sebi you need independent director for both listed and unlisted so if you are an unlisted company requiring independent directors then alternate directors should follow 149 6 13 on the other hand listed company not needed or uh, regulation 25 private companies independent director provisions do not apply for private company anyway so that 161 to provise only will not apply that's fine so this is a combined chart of sebi and companies act again has to be remembered in that context uh, then moving on to this uh, couple of other examples if you see you are a casual vacancy director or let's say an alternate director assume right and at the agm the original director was anyway retiring here i have made you an md original director was anyway retiring so you will also retire your captaincy position also goes but in this meeting since you are really good i have regularized you under 152 to red with 160 so if you are a 161 to director or a 161 4 director whatever the case may be alternate or cv whatever the case may be but your tenure is coming to an end before the agm but at the agm i have regularized your appointment under 152 to red with 160 by giving md provisions again to you should i follow those 18 to 20 approvals again that is anyway yes but is the relaxation applicable is mca relaxation applicable for regularization answer is no it is not applicable that is what is given here come i told you after 161 2 will do this right check it out this point number 12 page number 23 mca clarification applicability 
regularization of additional director slash casual vacancy director alternate director normal summary if you simply read for the heck of it you will not pass you have to read it like this i am saying the summary book should be made use to full extent because in summary book these things should be included questions will not come on theory pointers questions will come on interconnections right that's the reason why i took i promised last year took one year to deliver sorry for the delay but it has come finally because it's needed 161 1 plus md and 160 plus md that is uh, relaxation is there only for this 161 1 plus md and 160 plus md only for this it is there guys in any other case i don't care no relaxation so if they mix and match in the exam and give you any of these combinations you should say mci clarification will not apply in all these cases fresh approvals needed fresh approvals under schedule 5 plus 196 needed fresh approvals needed for sure alternate director should be added in the total number of directors as per 1491 yes so guys in 1491 original director also will come alternate director also will come right because he is not a proxy so he is extra director he is only what is connecting between them tenure once this guy comes back this guy will go it's not that he has gone abroad in this place i am there no so he should definitely be added in the total number of directors in overall directors right so if there are let's say company has 14 directors the 14th director goes abroad and i am appointing an alternate director it's not 14 total number will be 15 that's what i am trying to tell is not a proxy and if alternate director is appointed for a rotational director of course the original director would be included in the calculation of 152.6 and not the alternate director. So obviously connecting to that point, alternate director appointed for a rotational director will be excluded from the total number as per 152.6. Total number as per 152.6. That is what we these points are there. Very simple. Right. So these are all the pointers. Then. Uh, small shareholder director will this two three points will finish off quickly and then we can break for lunch small shareholder director 151 small shareholder director is only applicable for a listed company it is only protection of minority interest listed company may discretionary suo motu means voluntary voluntarily or with a 14 day notice given by how many people 1000 small shareholders or 1/10th of the total number of you know small shareholders whichever is lower total number of small shareholders is what we have to write whichever is lower elect one small shareholder director if the company has let's say 1 lakh small shareholders who is a small shareholder holding nominal value less than or equal to 20000 So, what is one tenth? Ten thousand, ten thousand or one thousand, whichever is lower. One thousand, right? One thousand or one tenth, whichever is lower. So, if you see, if the company only has some, let's say, thousand small shareholders, thousand or hundred, whichever is lower, hundred. That's how we should look at it. Shall elect one small shareholder director. now in the earlier rule they said from one among themselves which means which comes to the question should ssd be a ss means should a small shareholder director be a small shareholder no because when i am filing his appointment if he is not holding any shares i should tell all that also so second conclusion proposed ssd need not be a small shareholder just because i send a notice for appointment will it mean is appointed no that 14 day notice is not sufficient to appoint ssd there should be a resolution passed by small shareholders 
one more important question because of the use of the word may here they'll ask you if i give a notice to you is it mandatory for you to appoint small shareholders the wordings of the law says listed company may sue moto so it should be read as sue moto it is may but when i have actually given a notice it should be read as shall this is the correct interpretation point number 4 if notice is given by small shareholders of a listed company it is mandatory to appoint small shareholders that is protection of minority interest you have to do it now ssd will be considered as an independent director if he complies with independence requirements under 1496 else he will vacate the office else he will vacate the office vacation will happen he will also vacate the office if he is disqualified under section 164 or vacates office under 167 obviously can you be an ssd in more than one company yes maximum two companies you can be at a time correct but can you be a small shareholder director in two com competing businesses no the second company should not have a competing business with the first company right maximum two companies so the second company should not be in com competition with the first company cooling period after the tenure so basically the tenure will be fixed so after the tenure when 3 years 3 years he cannot be associated in any other capacity cooling period of 3 years after that yes he can be now removal again is a confusing point remove appointment of small shareholder director is done by whom small shareholders removal of small shareholder is done by dash small shareholders or any shareholder yes removal provision again it can be removed by an ordinary resolution by shareholders under 169 then what is the point if you ask the thing is he, they have it's just it clearly goes on to show that if i have appointed a small shareholder director you have removed them which means you don't want minority interest to be protected then it goes to next step operation mismanagement all those other provisions are there under companies act nothing to worry and there is also for private companies other section called 163 which protects your interest so this is what it is this is regarding small shareholder director now once they had asked is he a small shareholder director or not is he an independent director or not so that is a debatable issue because of the rules which say that if you do not follow independence requirements you will vacate office it appears that he should be an independent director but by logic itself you can never be independent because you have a interest here what interest small shareholders so you have to write dual answer the institute also had written dual answer recently given four marks so you have to write both the answers for that so these are some of the extra shots with respect to this then resident director we have already seen every company at least one director who stayed in india when minimum 182 days when it is during the financial year is what you need to see so your yeah, rotation concept is there then coming to some other differences we'll quickly see concept of 160 appointment of director other than the retiring director i'm reading page 26 under 152 it is reappointment of retiring director applicability public company only private company exempted as per the notification in 152 rotation it is public company itself as per the section meeting as per 160 is what any general meeting whereas in 156 it is what annual general meeting types of directors are not there in 160 in 156 we have seen rotational non rotational and one third of rotational directors will actually retire notice 14 days notice under 160 it is not a special notice under 1526 it is 21 clear days before the meeting notice should be initiated by what by whom any person in case of 160 even an outsider proposing himself whereas in 156 it should always initiate from the company is it mandatory or discretionary 160 is discretionary in nature but rotation is mandatory either the articles will tell everybody will retire or two third one third should happen nature of appointment this is actually an actual appointment under 160 you will go through the main door 156 is musical chair within the room right so it is obviously retirement plus reappointment you will not exit the company and come again it is just there only 
what type of business is it since it is 160 right it is always what type of business it is a special business because you are appointing a new director into the thing whereas in 1526 it is an ordinary business right if you see the businesses generally appointment of director appointment right is what we say you know in a casual manner in 15102 talks about the businesses right we always say appointment of director is ordinary business no see very carefully appointment of directors in place of those who are retiring sorry appointment of directors in place of those who are retiring so what essentially is ordinary business actually only 15026 appointment of directors in place of those who are retiring who are retiring these fellows obviously i'll appoint in place of those who are retiring them so i'll appoint them so that is called ordinary business as far as resolution is concerned both require ordinary resolution periodicity 160 can happen any time anywhere whereas 126 should happen where only at every annual general meeting deposit mandatory 1 lakh rupees deposit it's not applicable to what if recommended by board or nomination committee here in the in the other example section 126 it is there is no deposit right no deposit as far as additional director and casual vacancy director are concerned additional director both private and public casual vacancy same appointing authority of additional director is bod whereas here it is bod and approval by shareholders whether it's board meeting or not additional director either board meeting or resolution by circulation whereas uh, what do you say the 1614 it is both i mean it is only board meeting tenure till uh, mandatory or discretionary both are discretionary this is till the commencement of the next stadium it flows from the previous director what type of business is this this is all appointment of new types of directors whether it happens in agm or not i shouldn't care this is what type of business special, special. and anyway it will never happen in the agm except this part because it is appointed by the board right then general meeting resolution here it's not needed you are definitely ordinary resolution right in which case in 1614 power is it derived from articles or subject to articles 1611 is derived from articles 1614 is subject to articles cool so you want lunch break now or later you tell yeah so guys good that you are sitting in class please sit i can assure you if you watch youtube and all you will not be this effectiveness won't be there i am recording and telling right so it won't be there because here you are constantly you know in this environment and you are studying one after the other so attend all three days and finish it off in youtube you will do it but you will do it aram se you will see i will pause this fellow pause right then you will see something else and you will do so finish it off since you are already there okay cool thank you so much see you how many minutes 20 30 yes good afternoon guys ready to sleep uh, after lunch what will you do that to law all right <clears throat> come back you know the trick now whenever you are sleepy what to do yes right so section can you just close the door please section 162 thank you uh two things are there 162 and 163 and of course we have other areas which are the independent director women director all these provisions we have to do that so let's get on with 162 that is appointment to be voted individually 162 and 163 which speaks about uh, principle of proportional representation first 162 applicable to public or private company public company it won't apply to private company what is this appointment to be voted individually <clears throat> generally when three directors are being appointed a b c they have to be voted individually obviously because it shouldn't be like if i say yes once in the vote all the three will be appointed or if i say no all the three will be rejected that would be absurd so it should be in such a way that each person will come in front of you will give of course the statement of his caliber etc and even the company will feel that okay this person is good and then they'll appoint generally all appointment should be done individually one after the other there cannot be a bulk appointment 
this section actually is protecting the directors from going through this bulk appointment route whereby in such a way that if even if one person is there in between two bad people it will unfortunately be in such a manner that he may lose his you know position in the company so that's why when i say yes to one all three will not be appointed when i say no all three will not be reappointed it's not like that each person should come stand in front of the agm there should be separate resolutions however can you have a single resolution is what the section actually speaks about single resolution is possible but for that first i should have one resolution here where i'll ask the people are you okay with a single resolution mind you this resolution is not to appoint all three reject all three this resolution is asking the people let's say there are 100 people i'll ask them are you okay with passing a single resolution which means the 100 people should have decided either to appoint all the three or to reject all the three there should not be even one person who has two minds who is in who is in two minds so if you see when i say appoint all the three it means what let's assume out of 60 out of 100 60 people want all the three 40 people do not want all the three there can never be even one person who feels that i only want a but i don't want b and c or i only want c but i don't want a and b so basically this section what it tries to tell is very simple that appointment to be voted individually only i will give you permission to vote one shot only and only if all the people who are attending the meeting agree to one thing what to pass single vote so this resolution must be unanimous unanimous resolution is not to vote or uh, is not to appoint all three reject all three unanimous resolution is to tell that i agree to appoint i mean i agree to pass one vote what is the decision we don't know in that i am telling you 60 people want to appoint all three 40 people in my example want to reject all three so by giving such an extreme situation law has beautifully protected the rights of each director now even if one person 99 people are okay one person says no no i only want separate resolutions because i don't want to appoint all three i, I don't want to reject all three i have to appoint one or two and i want to reject the other person i will not tell who i will vote so such an extreme situation should happen where all 100 on 100 want to pass a single resolution what is the decision is immaterial but they are ready to pass a single resolution that that is why we have what we have this particular section protection of interest of whom the other people so first resolution must be what unanimous where they agree to appoint all three or reject all three but they'll agree to pass one resolution second resolution is what ordinary resolution so first of all this entire uh, proposal should be put to vote unanimously without any vote being cast against it that's the dialogue not even one vote should go against the fact that they are ready to do it unanimously and then the next voting will happen in this voting it's again 60 40 60 people would have said yes all three will be appointed 40 people will say no 40 votes will be for a no ultimately who is more 60 is more than 40 so obviously the all the three directors would be voted so basically this actually is an indirect way of protecting the interests of the directors so if there is one good director in between two okay okay directors it shouldn't be that he is lost in the crowd it should he should ensure that he will get you know requisite voting if you watch this uh, coffee with karan episode hardik pandya and uh, kl rahul so kl rahul poor guy okay some here and two three stupid things he may have told but predominantly it was good but the other guy if you see hardik pandya two three good things he told everything else was yeah so in that case both were banned same time same number of matches so this kl rahul say what did i do so it's as simple as that if you are with that company same here also they banned both of them and after that they banned all players from entering you know doing any of these shows actually so if you see that's what happened that's why 162 is needed to protect people like kl rahul so 162 public company it's not applicable to what private company we know then government company and its 100% subsidiary government company and 100% subsidiary not applicable not applicable to ifsc company at special economic zone 
so two or more directors may be appointed by a single resolution firstly pass a resolution authorizing the appointment of such directors and this resolution shall be passed unanimously secondly pass a second resolution ordinary resolution appointing such directors so basically that is what the section talks about two resolutions have to be passed as far as unanimous is concerned unanimous there are three things i mean uh, for shareholders meeting board meeting as far as shareholders meeting is concerned there are three areas in the whole of companies act which require unanimous approval point number 1 is 162 point number 2 is section 96 can an annual general meeting be held outside india that is not possible can it be held in india yes but where in the registered office only or the place where registered office is situated can it be held anywhere other than registered office anywhere in india yes only for unlisted company if there is an unlisted company who have passed unanimous resolution you can obviously hold it anywhere in india so that is one more unanimous resolution that is given under companies act where shareholders have to pass third one is what third one is entrenchment provisions under section 5 so entrenchment provisions are more restrictive provisions than special resolution so basically in articles of association if you want to restrict companies from changing certain provisions of articles you can have a more restrictive uh, you know resolution like 80% 85% 90% whatever it is now you need to insert such a regulation right to insert such a regulation for a private company requires 100% approval these are the only three areas potentially in the whole of companies act which requires unanimous resolution from whom from the shareholders in board there are two uh, we will see in cluster number 3 onwards you will see that there so the in board there is separate cluster 3 and cluster 5 we'll have to see to understand board also has unanimous resolution but for shareholders unanimous resolutions are these 162 96 and all that so in the exam if they ask for example the company wants to appoint four additional directors one shot four additional directors one shot is it possible or not and it's a public company not private company public company they want to appoint four additional directors one shot so what will you write first resolution will be unanimous why everyone should agree second resolution ordinary resolution right neatly write superbly zero they'll give why because what yes four additional directors how will additional directors be appointed board of directors this section my dear friends is applicable only to members in general meeting it is only applicable to those you know appointments you see 162 those appointments which are only where at a general meeting of the company this they asked in the exam i think uh, two or three attempts before four marks question or it was i think 2018 no 2018 may or november 2018 paper new syllabus four marks right so that is how they are asking additional director by the board can be appointed any time one shot four directors are there board of directors are deciding for i need there four different projects i need four people appoint one shot close it only when general meeting which means what this section is for what predominantly reappointment 1526 so in 1526 should i pass separate resolutions or should i pass one resolution that was the question so obviously you have to pass what how many resolutions separate but if you want one then this and i cannot just say any objections raise your hand no it shouldn't be like that it should be a proper vote so if you see here whether or not any objection was taken when it was so moved i don't care whether any objection was taken or not your objection means just by raising your hand let me know no it should be a proper resolution passed is what they are trying to tell so that is regarding 162 then we have our uh, what do you say small shareholder director to protect the interests of listed companies in listed companies i can appoint somebody to look after the minority interest but what do i do with uh, unlisted public companies what do i do with private companies so for private companies and unlisted public companies i have one more section that is called proportional representation under 163 163 starts off with a non obstant clause non obstant clause means not withstanding anything contained not withstanding anything contained that is called as a non obstant clause 
नॉट विथ स्टैंडिंग एनीथिंग कंटेन्ड सो वॉट यू मीन बाय दैट डज इट मीन इट ओवर राइट एवरीथिंग नो इट ओवर राइट ओनली द कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग प्रोविजन इट ओवर राइट ओनली द कॉन्फ्लिक्टिंग प्रोविजन वॉट इज द प्रोविजन दट ओवर राइट एवरीथिंग इफ आई यूज द वर्ड्स नथिंग इन दिस सेक्शन विल अप्लाई नथिंग इन दिस एक्ट विल अप्लाई नथिंग इन दिस सेक्शन विल अप्लाई दैट मीन्स दैट nothing in this section will apply to other provisions or nothing in the act will apply to these provisions but when i use the term notwithstanding anything contained it's a non obstant clause it will override only the conflict here the conflict what is the conflict this is like a permanent director for 3 years this is to protect the interests of the private company as well as the unlisted public company if there is a certain number of directors one portion of those directors will be permanent directors where the entire company uh, can be divided into various groups shareholding groups let's not go into the full concept and the uh, voting etc not needed for the exam so various groups one will be a 40% shareholder group one will be a group holding 10% all put together one will be 5% under proportional representation every person will get a chance to appoint a director so that director will be here representing each and every shareholder or each and every group of shareholder that is called proportional representation now what percentage of your entire total number will be such proportional representation directors the act says 2/3 do not confuse this with 150 to 6 2/3 that is not that is totally different this is different in the total number first of all article should prescribe This is a classic case of power derived, you know, power derived in the articles. <coughs> so we see, one sixty three says the articles of a company may provide for the appointment of not less than two thirds. If the articles are silent, section does not apply. Power derived from articles. That is this point. Notwithstanding anything contained means what? This section will override. All the conflicting provisions only, only conflicting provisions. Not less than two thirds means minimum two thirds. So if you take the total number of directors, minimum two thirds can go by a proportional representation, whereby company having various groups can appoint representatives on the board like this. Can have their own representatives, no problem. And then ultimately, these representatives will obviously look after the interests of these bunch of shareholders. And on the other hand, you have other uh, one third which can go through any route. With one third people can go through any route. That's not a problem. But this two third will go under proportional representation route. Simple. Now, again, if you see, because of the use of the word notwithstanding, these people also have a permanent tenure of three years. Because it says notwithstanding, it obviously overrides anything related to removal. that's why in 169 we saw 163 director cannot be removed then it will also go against what do you say 150 to 6 rotation that's why if you see there also we saw under rotation from the total number who will you subtract proportionate representation directors have to be subtracted 150 to 6 directors have to be subtracted from the total number so if you see that particular page Let's just revisit it. That is after that is one fifty two six page. One fifty two six to understand the concept of rotation. There you go. Here, director appointed under page number sixteen. Director appointed under the proportional representation route under section one sixty three. That fellow has to be. excluded from the total number rightly so because it's a non obstant clause because of the use of the word notwithstanding anything contained in 163 i have to remove but does it mean that he should not give consent no so 163 will not override 1525 giving consent can he be disqualified if he is convicted of moral turpitude can he continue no similarly if he does something which vacates his office no can he be removed no then what's the point it overrides 169 overrides 1526 but it lower right 1522 also which speaks about appointment because this is appointed under 163 so this is called director appointed by proportional representation that is 163
simple provision and it it is predominantly more like a minority uh, you know shareholding provision especially for private company and unlisted public company where initially in the articles only i can specify that i don't want to uh, you know i want to make this fixed directors you cannot touch them and the voting mechanism is single transferable vote or cumulative voting that is irrelevant for us not a problem so it based on that particular thing so that is regarding all these moving on to independent director and woman director again it is very important uh, regularly asked in the examination if you see woman director uh, same page number 27 we need to remember this provision all listed companies all listed companies under 2 clause 52 by the way there has been a change in the listed company definition though it is uh, the change is given to ca inter and especially ca foundation we should know listed company definition has been changed till today what is listed company where securities are listed securities are listed means equity shares preference shares kind of debentures etc bonds they are listed listed companies but they have specifically excluded now certain companies so this is the full chart of listed company as for your information uh, companies act if you see private companies private companies also can list their securities but they can list only their debt securities not equity shares and all this obviously then it will not be called as private company if they are doing it by private placement they are not called listed companies they are not called listed companies though they are actually listing their securities they are not called listed companies public companies if they are listing their equity shares and it is publicly offered to everybody then obviously it is called as listed company public company if they are listing their preference shares but they are listing their preference shares publicly then they are called as listed company public company which are listing their preference shares but on a private placement basis till now were called as listed companies but now it is excluded from the ambit of listed companies so what is not a listed company even though you have listed your preference shares but you have listed your preference shares on a private placement basis then specifically excluded in the new listed company definition second have you listed your debt securities yes is it publicly listed or privately placed publicly listed publicly listed listed company so predominantly what is listed company now whether you have listed equity preference or debt it should be publicly offered on a recognized stock exchange if you have done private placement though it is listed since it's private placement i am not calling it as listed company this is the new definition or rather amendment relevant for ca foundation but then we also should know because tomorrow if they ask any question mind you where they have listed preferences debentures but privately place them it is not called as listed company this company should not have listed uh, what do you say equity shares and preferences publicly but if they have listed privately it is not called listed company though actually it is listed company it is outside the ambit of listed company definition now so taking that into account if you see here now very simple listed means same now listed new listed company definition new definition all listed companies should mandatorily appoint a woman director implication those listed companies which had not listed equity shares but had listed preference shares and debt securities on a private placement basis actually had to appoint women directors till recently till the amendment after amendment not needed got it after amendment not needed so earlier listed company means securities listed how you list privately placed publicly i don't care listed means listed but now even if you list but it's privately placed then you, uh, till now you are supposed to have a women director now not needed so everywhere wherever i use the word listed meaning has changed so keep that in note this is not available in your rtp it's there in foundation rtp right that's why i'm saying next unlisted public company unlisted public company is what paid up capital 100 cr turnover 300 cr when latest audited balance sheet so you have to remember this either of the two not and or right paid up capital 100 cr or turnover 300 cr it's or not and simple then uh, of course this is woman director then coming to independent director here 
independent director for all uh, listed companies uh, one third of tnd total number of directors this is not total number of directors as per 152.6 no this is total number of directors as per 149 right overall number of directors in the company one third will be what uh, uh, will should be independent directors if it is i mean unlisted very simple except joint venture except wholly owned subsidiary except dormant company that uh, independent directors is not needed but other people other companies which companies this also you have to remember paid up capital 10 crore turnover 100 crore or outstanding loan defense deposit exceeding 50 crore mind you this is greater than or equal to greater than or equal to here it is greater than this you have to remember how many people minimum to independent directors this is for unlisted but for listed i also need to check sebi regulations sebi regulations lod are important so the chairman happens to be a non executive director means is not working in the company full time and is not a promoter also it's good the chairman is a person who is not a promoter which means i don't need more than 1/3 so 1/3 of total number of directors is enough where would be a problem when there is no regular non executive directors means everybody is working in the company full time there is nobody who is tcwg those charged with governance so in that case i need to increase the number from 1/3 that is 33% to half 50% or chairman happens to be a non executive director yes chairman is independent i mean he is uh, working elsewhere i mean sorry he is not working elsewhere he is not working in the company also he is more like a professional leader however unfortunately he is related to the promoter or is part of the promoter group then what's the point that's why it is half the only thing where the companies act and sebi will merge is where chairman is a non executive director plus chairman is not at all a promoter at all he is not a promoter not related to the promoter group in any of these cases what one third of the total number of directors will come and here also same one third of the tnd in all other cases it's different so it's half then private company the only place where private company also needed an independent director was csr committee under section 135 private company required a csr committee and the csr committee you need to have at least one independent director there in the csr committee however rule number 8 of csr rules clearly said private company if it's following section 135 it need not appoint independent director and there therefore there they have actually amended the law also which says that private companies which requires csr like any private company which requires csr also has to have a csr uh, committee but it need not have a independent director so private company no problem these two very much possible now merging women director and independent director should one of the independent directors be a woman is also a question correct so one of those independent directors should they should it be a woman so if you see as per lodr from april 1st 2020 the top 1000 listed companies listing by market capitalization top 1000 listed companies should have at least one Uh, now our problem is if i say independent woman director uh, it will be a problem what woman independent director all women directors are independent sir don't go all feminist on me reverse i'm saying all uh, sorry independent directors of the lot of independent directors one should be a woman director that is the rule now so basically regulation 17 here one among them should be a woman director this is from 1st april 2020 for top 1000 listed company this is obviously a combination of companies act and sebi both you have to write in the exam because both are applicable for you in the exam but see the question what they are asking if they clearly ask companies act stick to companies act and write sebi regulations as a note if they ask sebi please write sebi and then uh, 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 write companies act provisions as a note please see the question what they are asking that they'll at least give in the light of they'll you have to throw light right light of companies act or sebi they'll give you that question so please be aware but both are mixed right that's why even in audit committee it's mixed nomination remuneration committee in sebi regulations is different in companies act slightly different so you need to keep that in mind now in women director some extra shots are there what are they an intermittent vacancy of a woman director shall be filled up by the board 
casual vacancy of woman director need not go to 16014 where should i go rules what do the rules say shall be filled up by the board when at the next board meeting or 3 months from the date of such vacancy whichever is later now this is an important provision no need to go to 16014 16014 not needed so intermittent vacancy shall be filled by the board when in the immediately next i mean board meeting or or 3 months whichever is later whenever it is no problem uh should a vacancy of a woman director be filled by one more woman director if the company already has one more woman director is the question nothing like that so if second point casual vacancy of a woman director need not be filled by appointment of woman director if the company already has another woman director but one woman director should be designated as such so that has to be reported everywhere that this person is our uh, you know designated woman director as such that is regarding uh, woman director concept simple and as far as independent director is concerned there are of course certain uh, regulations and of course of course in the act itself there are certain sections where we need to remember at least the overall part plus there have been certain amendments also so let's see so independent director cannot be a managing director cannot be a whole time director cannot be a nominee director that's as per the definition such person should not have been so if you see these charts this chart would uh, definitely help us so what mr p is proposed to be an independent director of a company called y limited now this is y limited so structure we need to understand y limited is here y limited as a holding company x y limited as a subsidiary z and y limited as an associate a correct holding company x subsidiary company z and associate company a so here what does it say if mr p is proposed to be appointed as independent director in which company why he should not be a promoter of x y z a next he cannot be a relative of the promoter of x y z a cannot be a relative defined in 2 clause 77 cannot be a relative third cannot be relative of even the directors of x y z a should not be promoter of xyz should not should not be a relative of promoter of xyz should not be a relative of any of the directors of xyz that is the level only if you want to be appointed in y if you want to be appointed in y you should not be that's the level of independence needed that is point number 1 point number 2 same mr p is proposed to be an independent director of y limited same thing Y Limited is a company in which P is proposed to be appointed as ID. X is holding company, Z is subsidiary company, A is associate company. So, Mr. P, if is proposed to be the independent director of Y Limited, what should what is the senior should not cannot have material pecuniary relationship. Material pecuniary relationship with what X Y Z A. cannot have material pecuniary relationship with xyz a not only that cannot have material pecuniary relationship with promoters or directors of xyz a in individual capacity not with just with the company but also not with any of these promoters or directors now what do you mean by material pecuniary relationship wise remuneration or any transaction any transaction any business transaction also or is remuneration in the company If it is less than or equal to ten percent of his total income, his total income, that is not material pecuniary relationship. So, what is material pecuniary relationship? Anything which is more than ten percent. If his total income is one crore and eleven lakhs is getting from any of these transactions with whom, any business relationship with X Y Z A, or any relationship, any uh, business relationship with promoters or directors of X Y Z A. If I add all that, my total income is one crore, but money from these people eleven lakhs, then not allowed. Then it is deemed to be material pecuniary. So what is not material pecuniary? Less than or equal to ten percent of his total income. And when should I see this? Not just this year, guys. Also immediately to preceding financial years. Current financial year, anyway, I should see plus. last two years also it should not have been year on year i need to see this year is it there this year total income i should take take 
is it less than 10 percent less than that okay no problem last year what is the scene before that what is the scene so three years continuously i have to see last two years plus this year this year is the year of appointment this is the easiest way we can break this down otherwise it will be difficult next mr p if he is a proposed to be an independent director of y limited same structure y x z a his relative generally can hold cannot hold security but he can hold up to some limit what limit he can hold he can hold face value 50 lakh rupees less than or equal to 50 lakh rupees face value it is okay or what either that or it should be less than or equal to 2% of the paid up share capital of the company if a relative of the independent proposed independent director is holding less than or equal to 50 lakh or less than or equal to 2% paid up share capital it is okay allowed the moment it goes beyond that then not possible mind you not independent director but independent director relative holding relative holding when same thing current financial year plus two immediately preceding financial years current financial year plus two immediately preceding financial years next comes the indebtedness which you see in auditors auditors provisions indebtedness same structure y x z a what same which year current year and preceding to financial year same thing mr p proposed independent director is indebted or his relative his relative is indebted or guarantee as indebted to the company which means he has taken a loan from the company or he has given a guarantee or security to any of these companies x y z a that is indirect liability how much is allowed up to 50 lakhs is allowed the moment is more than 50 lakhs not allowed same with if he holds any security guarantee gives any security gives any guarantee or indebted to whom not only to the company guys but also to the promoters of directors of xyz extremely tough limits are there same limit should also be followed by a small shareholder director if he doesn't follow this he will have to vacate his office same provisions plus this generally they ask in the exam this and the next point uh, as a problem as a sum they ask they have asked all this time holding company in which is proposed to be appointed as the independent director subsidiary company associate company now here independent director his relative apart from whatever you have seen above x y z all that you have seen apart from that if he has any other pecuniary relationship apart from whatever is seen there on top again in the current financial year immediately preceding financial year 2 what is the allowed limit less than 2% of the gross turnover or total income of xyz a all these companies if you take the gross turnover or total income less than 2% if you are given it to that relative it's okay but your turnover is 100 crore you have given 2.2 crore worth of business correct it is being derived from this other guy then it's a problem or even the total income total income etc and all has not been defined so you can take the i mean i mean the various conjoining laws wherever the concept of total income is there the only nearest thing is income tax act right that's what we need to see though it is not given anyway that's the accepted interpretation now this is a regularly asked question actually uh, this also they have asked for uh, what do you say mcq etc but this is a sum they give a uh, three four mark question because here the time limit is slightly different everywhere it is current year and two immediately preceding year for this however it is current financial year and three immediately preceding financial years only for kmp concept kmp and employee interesting to know that if mr p is being appointed as a independent director of y the companies in question in all these provisions are the same x y z a that there is no change at all x y z a holding company subsidiary company uh, then why an associate company no change at all in all these things but mr p proposed independent director cannot be a kmp cannot be an employee in the current financial year could not have been a kmp could not have been an employee in the immediately three preceding financial years so they can say that uh, 
manager of the company has quit and next year he wants to join as an independent director possible no what about uh, the proposed independent director's relative he, he was employed in the company okay, that is possible yes so if you see employed in the company no problem but if he is a kmp only there is a bar if you see employee is missing so if you are a proposed independent director if your relative was normally employed in the company this year or employed in the company past 3 years no problem you are eligible but if your relative happened to be a kmp when 3 years immediately preceding or happens to be a kmp when now then you are ineligible to be appointed that is peace relative deadly for you p himself neither employee nor kmp when three immediately preceding financial year and current financial year whereas uh, p is relative employee possible otherwise there is no end to it or you only kmp you should not be that big shot kmp when this year and three immediately preceding financial years this is a regularly asked question next point also is regularly asked that is can you be a consultant can you be a uh, could you have been a part of the legal firm which gave consultancy could you be part of the audit firm that also is a question that they ask regularly now here mr p independent director in y limited or his relative if himself or relative is either a partner proprietor or employee when current financial year three immediately preceding financial years current financial year three immediately preceding financial year what are you partner proprietor employee who all either you or your relative when current financial year or three immediately preceding financial year either a partner proprietor or employee of what either a ca firm cs firm or a cma firm or a cma firm legal consulting we'll see later ca firm cs firm cma firm if you have been consulting either x limited y limited z limited or a limited the firm is giving services to these companies ca firm cs firm cma firm is giving services to these companies and either you or your relative happen to be what partner proprietor or even an employee when current financial year preceding three financial years what is the what do they say band cannot become an independent director cannot become a what independent director right cannot become an independent director that's what they say then they'll also give legal consult legal firm for legal firm there's a threshold again we'll get confused generally we'll put this threshold for everything they'll confuse us also by giving a threshold here here no threshold amount and all not not you know even if it's 10 rupees i'm just saying 1000 rupees 5000 rupees services you gave banned your threshold doesn't matter it is ca cs cma firm threshold doesn't matter threshold matters for legal firm so again that company holding company subsidiary company associate company all that is there fine mr p proposed independent director or is relative is what either a partner or what proprietor or what employee of what legal consulting firm this was a legal consulting firm of x or y or z or a when either current financial year or pre immediately preceding financial year now threshold comes if you have earned less than 10% of gross turnover all turnover of x y z a put together let they all put together turnover is let's say 100 crore if you have earned 11 crore from all these businesses your fee is 11 crore then not possible correct you should not have earned greater than or equal to those are the wordings even if you have earned 10 crore not allowed if you have earned less than 10 crore no problem so this is only threshold generally what they'll do they'll give ca cma firm and then give threshold so ca cma firm threshold even if it's 2% also gone so this is these are all the various provisions of independent director and uh, apart from that also 
this also one or two times in mcq they have given uh, you are a ceo of a non profit organization non profit organization you or your relative basically is a ceo of a non profit organization when current year or three preceding financial years either x either y either z or a whatever the case may be if your collection as a non profit organization is let's say 1 crore you have collected from various sources your section 8 company you are collecting funds but almost around 30 lakhs has come from all these put together from this group 30 lakhs has come so where is the independence they have actually donated you 30 lakhs and now they want you to be independent at of their companies there is a threshold should not have received more than or equal to 25% of the gross receipts its gross receipts section 8 companies gross receipts from xyz day or one more deadly point promoters or directors of xyz day so basically this 1 crore as i told you 25 lakhs all put together should not have come from x plus y plus z plus a plus promoters of x plus y plus z plus a plus directors of x plus y plus z plus a deadly only then you are allowed otherwise no so your promoters are also covered in this or should not have 2% or more of the total voting power of y this section 8 company should not any non profit organization should not have any shareholding where in y limited only that's fine but generally this 25% receipts is what they ask in the exam now what about what do you say independent directors casual vacancy that is point number 12 new independent director should be appointed within 3 months from the date of resignation or removal as the case may be of old independent director mind you this casual vacancy is only for resignation or removal this is only for resignation or removal what about other casual vacancy we will see that later there is a full casual vacancy chart that time we will see what about independent director for other than resignation or removal the moment you see resignation and removal 3 months it is only for what resignation or removal other things like death when should i fill we'll have to see that later so obviously for independent director there is no concept of any stock option but he can get remuneration sitting fee and even profit based commission and as per the amendment will he also get money for loss making company will he get for um, amount till now it was not possible but after the amendment will he get money for loss making company yes so loss making company independent director and uh, you know the non executive director that is the normal director non executive he will get for loss making company also we'll see in the amendment later in class number 5 so that is regarding that apart from that guys we will come to this part apart from that see point number 15 every independent director in a company on 1st september 1st december 2019 shall within a period of 13 months from the date of the notification 29th april 2020 we will have to apply online to something called as institute of corporate affairs iica for inclusion of his name in the database so basically now independent directors will be chosen only from the database and that database will be obviously you can put your name either for one year or for five years or even for a lifetime now what is the amendment you have to pass an exam called the online proficiency exam so every individual whose name is included in the data bank shall pass an online proficiency self assessment exam within a period of 2 years 18 12 2020 amendment 2 years december 21 they asked in the exam right so within a period of 2 years from the date of inclusion of his name in the data bank four marks question had come in december 21 paper passing criteria earlier it was 60% now mcq they can ask what is the passing percentage 50% correct no limit on attempts like ca only keep writing yes no limits right then one more thing you need not pass the online proficiency examination if you have served for a total period of not less than 3 years 
as on the date of his inclusion of his name in the data bank if you have already no need of examination exempt data bank it should be there but examination exempt for what again amended rules this is all amended guys fully amended earlier something else was there these are all very important provisions that's why green as a director or kmp as on the date of inclusion of his name in the data bank in one or more of the following so you have already served 3 years and where as a director or kmp where in any listed public company what is listed company already know that is share i mean uh, equity shares preference shares uh, you know uh, and uh, debt securities not privately placed of course unlisted public company paid up capital 10 crore any body corporate listed on a recognized stock exchange in a uh, country which is a member of the fatf financial action task force pakistan is not there obviously that is against them only we have made yes on money laundering on money laundering this came in 2000 and all one when this uh, 911 thing happened and any regulator of the securities market in such in such member state is a member of the international organization of securities commission so either fatf member plus the securities market regulation you should be part of the member of international organization of securities commissions in all these countries like australia canada usa if you are a director and then you are coming here and in india also you want to be a director examination not needed body if you are a what do you say director or a kmp in bodies corporate incorporate outside india with paid up capital 2 million us dollars these are all brand new provisions mcq right bodies corporate incorporate outside india paid up capital greater than or equal to 2 million dollars then any statutory corporation set up by an act of parliament if you are a member of lic director of lic and all these things that is what they say second one if you have what in the pay scale of director or equivalent to ministry of department anything basically if you are getting a salary equivalent to the director or any equivalent in any ministry in any matter related to what commerce corporate affairs finance industry or public enterprises or you are getting affairs related to government companies or statutory corporation set up under any act of parliament or any state act and carrying on any commercial activities so if your pay scale if you are in a you know position appointed by the government and pay scale is equivalent to what director or above director of what that particular any ministry there will be a pay scale given by the government if you are matching that pay scale you are exempt from not being included in the data bank you are exempt from writing the exam then in the pay scale of chief general manager or above in sebi or rbi or irda in any of these regulatory mechanisms yes in calculating 3 years the individual was acting as director or kmp in two or more companies or bodies corporate at the same time shall be counted only once that is also important because i am doing two years continuously 2 plus 2 4 no it is only counted as two years as only once only one you take apart from that guys following individuals who are or have been for at least 10 years again mcq they'll give dash 3 years we'll write 3 years and come for these people it is 10 years what advocate of a court practice as a practice as a chartered accountant practice as a cost accountant practice as a company secretary right shall not be required to pass the online proficiency self assessment test you should have been a ca in practice for 10 years you should have been an advocate in the court advocate of a court if they say as yes, part pass the law exam it's been 10 years since you have passed the law exam that is different advocate passes the exam by the bar council of india so if they simply say you've just uh, finished llb that is a different thing you should have passed the exam by the bar council of india admitted to practice as a lawyer that's why they say advocate for minimum 10 years practice as chartered accountant practice as cost accountant company secretary will not be a, uh, required to pass the online self assessment exam in 5 years you already died becoming ca so no need of again cpt exam online proficiency self assessment so these are all the important areas apart from that one more in uh, independent director would be this if i want to appoint an independent director i will have to appoint him normally under 152 tony no point same provisions what resolution ordinary resolution in general meeting but the tenure they have given 
for example 2015 to 2020 you can appoint him for up to 5 years mind you act uses the word up to 5 years can i appoint him for one year also yes no problem up to 5 years that also was a question actually they said that uh, this fellow said he has to be appointed for 5 years nothing like that up to 5 years then he can be appointed for two terms up to 5 years each so can i appoint you for one year plus one year yes will it be considered as two terms yes it would definitely be considered as two terms it is up to two terms of up to 5 years each so can i appoint you for 2 plus 3 whatever it is but if you have finished 1 plus 1 assume even if you have finished 1 plus 1 that is two terms what is the cooling period mandatorily 3 years mandatory cooling period of 3 years so in my example assume you have been appointed from 15 to 20 that is 5 years then 20 to 25 5 years no problem then there is a mandatory cooling period from 25 to 28 for 3 years now if i want to throw you out before the expiry of the first tenure then normally section 169 will come ordinary resolution in general meeting it is matched with what your appointment how will i appoint you for one term ordinary resolution how will i remove you before first term ordinary resolution how will i appoint you for the second term section 149 says you require special resolution because you are doing it again so i'll have to pass 75% majority special resolution then they had a doubt if this is special resolution even removal before expiry of second term also should be special so they made an amendment in 169 also so appointment of first term 15 to 20 appointment provisions ordinary removal before expiry of first term ordinary appointment of the what do you say independent director for a second term special resolution appointment as a removal of independent director during the second term under section 169 which is amended amended previously not recent amendment what resolution special resolution in gm so this also they keep asking in the exam it is actually they have matched it that's all so special and special for removal as well before the expiry of the second term but anyway after that there should be mandatory 3 years cooling period if you have managed to finish both the terms is what they say so this is all about it then even if you think about it if the independent director is appointed for the first time ever at an agm i don't care if he is appointed as the agm as an independent director so only the ordinary business is what 1526 appointment of director other than a retiring director so all business will obviously be special what about resolution i am appointing for the first term so ordinary what notice is needed i am appointing you under 1522 red with 160 so 160 notice and anyway no need of any deposit because he is an independent director no deposit so you are obviously no deposit as such right independent director appointed for the second term at the agm special notice resolution also is special notice again they will recommend him again no what do you say uh, deposit as such removal of independent director at agm or egm before completion of the first term before completion of the first term means what what is the business special business resolution is ordinary under section 169 normal removal and if you see here guys this is a removal of director before expiry of his term so what notice is needed special notice 1% voting power or 5 lakh paid up capital will give it to the company not less than not earlier than 3 months not less than 14 days all those provisions will come this is special notice provisions under 115 removal of independent director at agm or egm before completion of second term again business is definitely special resolution is also special under 169 amended and of course the notice also is special because removal of director before the expiry of the term appointment of new directors at agm 
in addition to the ones who are already retiring means they also will be reappointed new fellows are also coming in new fellow is coming in is always special business this is not appointment of director in place of those who are retiring no it's new fellow resolution is ordinary under 1522 and notice we know 160 notice you have to give deposit and all that if need be appointment of new directors in place of those who are retiring then it's an ordinary business a reappointment of the same person again ordinary resolution 160 notice if i am appointing the same guy yes i'll give the notice or it will come in the normal 156 notice itself removal of auditor okay auditors is just for your extra gyan i have given this is paper 3 in paper 4 they'll not give this is auditor so you have again same removal of auditor at egm before expiry removal of auditor you know at agm where rotation apply applies and all that that you leave that just for your knowledge i have given but please note that if i what do you say there is no concept of special notice for what removal of auditor that is before expiry as such is there any special notice no it is only needed for what appointment of an auditor other than the retiring auditor so that is the scene so all this will be uh, cluster number 2 we have finished everything so that is cluster number 2 very very simple so cluster 1 and cluster 2 uh, extremely i mean everything is important but yes cluster 1 and 2 directors basics and types of directors are definitely important tomorrow morning we'll do this now if we do as i told you that's it uh, one day only revision class yeah so this because it requires lot of concentration and now is not the time because it will be like you'll be physically present mentally absent that is not the objective of this also honestly so objective was to ensure that you finish off in 3 days and rather than pushing it across uh yeah because anyway recording i could have done it on my own honestly could take taken time and done it but objective honestly was to ensure that wherever i go and wherever i am whoever comes to class they should finish out that law in those whatever days then you can only revise using the same youtube videos uh, loans to directors we will do tomorrow morning first thing in the morning we'll do with a fresh mind because it takes around 2 to 2 and a half hours to finish this it's quite a lot so now we'll uh, enter into a easy concept what board meetings very important but easy there have been amendments so we need to see that All right, guys. Let's begin. Page number fifty-five. Board meetings. <coughs> board meetings. Correct. You should not remember our article ship days and write board meetings. All right. Please note. Your boss will call you. No, he'll tell. You'll tell. I want to go to class. Then he'll start. No, when I was doing CA, comma. Yeah. All that. That. Those are board meetings. is a normal board meetings yes now tell me one thing this last minute push whatever we are doing just one minute this last minute uh, this last minute only whatever we are doing now do you think it will help you yes. yeah, you have to, i have to tell yes you also have to tell yes that is why are we here but i am just saying if you see this uh, one picture that i always show if you see in this uh, of, of course one of them is uh, michael phelps and the other one is milorad chevik now the thing is who won Michael Phelps and who is Michael Phelps here? That's the thing. Your person on your left, shirtless. Ah, uh, uh, the bear guy. Correct. So yeah, what do you think? Who who is the winner? Of course, uh, Michael Phelps. This was the Beijing Olympics, guys. And if you see, just about he just touched it here. Just about it, there's the fingers have just you know bent a little. And this was shot at one hundredth of a second. Like you divide one second into hundred parts, and one part that is the final thing. This was Michael Phelps, I think, sixth gold medal in the Beijing Olympics, two thousand eight. It is a very, uh, very, very important picture. Why? Because three weeks before the actual the same Olympics in two thousand eight, Michael Phelps broke his same arm, right arm, while walking. He broke his arm. He slipped and fell. He was a uh, very, very you know astute and very brilliant swimmer but while walking he couldn't walk properly so he slipped and fell and right arm gone so basically if you are a olympic gold medal winning uh, you know uh, swimmer people will say you take rest and anyway you practice there's no need to practice this guy said no i'm not going to sit there what he did was what any basic swimmer would do like you and i if you have joined swimming first thing what our trainer would have done throw you in the water 
put that give that board and you just have to hold on to the board and keep beating your legs this guy for 8 hours a day mad guy did it for 8 hours a day for 3 weeks just beating your you know his legs so it had become so strong anyway it was strong but the thing is by that practice what happened was if you see they analyze this video for almost uh, uh, at least 2 months to understand how the hell did he win at 100th of a second how was it possible that just that little bit extra so if you see the uh, you know this picture only if you see you see milorad chevik he got tired at the last millisecond he couldn't beat his legs but this guy if you see the water is displaced here because of that 3 weeks practice that is the reason uh, imagine because of that 3 weeks practice that he was doing and even if you see here everywhere it's all displaced he has made olympic rings also here right <laughs> so if you see crazy guy so if you see because of that what the thing is he won by 100th of a second and he went on to create a you know uh, all um, the world record of some 8 or 9 gold medals in that one olympic season crazy guy so if you see this last minute whatever we are doing would definitely help you know the boiling point of water is what 100 degrees at 99 degrees the water hot or cold it is very hot but at 99 degrees can you what do you say move a engine a, a train no at 100 degrees you, you know you have steam engines at 100 degrees the water will boil into steam and steam can actually move an entire train at 99 degree at best you can have one hot water bath that's it with add some cold water that's it difference between 99 degree and 100 degree 100 degree can move a train 99 degree only bath difference is just 1 degree guys so i believe that that last minute push now you have invested 3 days of your life for me no tension i am chill if not here i'll go for a trip for me no tension but for you guys you have invested 3 days of your life you know on this you have trusted and you have come so this last minute push would definitely help you so i get a lot of comments i'm blessed to get comments on that video only where some random students say that it helped me last one day before the exam and all those things so that youtube video is different but here you guys are actually coming for 3 days so which means that you have dedicated 3 days for law which means that you have completely relied on me okay this fellow will help us revise over now imagine that's a huge risk correct so if you see yeah so we will do it don't worry whatever is possible as much as possible we'll do we are doing it also we will do so that's what i just want to show you come back so board meetings uh, page number 55 board meetings of different companies so everything is combined in one chart only it becomes very easy for us so first board meeting of every so first is normal company then first is section 8 company then third one is what ifsc company scz uh, that is both private as well as unlisted uh, company and of course we have OPC with one director and I told you OPC can also have more than one director more than one director. now uh, coming to this this chart is like a, a combined sort of everything becomes very easy first board meeting of every normal company should happen when 30 days of incorporation 30 days of incorporation 30 days of incorporation should I take incorporation or should I exclude that date Incorporation is let's say uh, 1st February. When I say 30 days of incorporation, should I consider that or should I exclude? Whenever Act uses the word from, did it say 30 days from incorporation? No. Whenever Act uses the word from, then that first day should be excluded. When the Act uses the word of, it should be included. One big mistake is there, typo error here, not should be removed. Anyway, we'll release two, three mistakes are there, guys. Deadly mistakes. So that, yes, date of incorporation, what should be included while counting 30 days? This one and that 20. That's it. That 20 we already discussed. Yes, that's the reason why this video you can change, you can do and make the changes here and there. While obviously final proofreading would have missed out two, three points. But yes, anyway, changes are being made, so no tension. It should be because they use the word of. If it was from, from now remember whenever I say the dividend should be paid 30 days from date of declaration, AGM date is the date of declaration, AGM date must be excluded. When I use the word off, it is included. So 100% you have to include. Actually they have never asked this question, but if they ask, you should not make a mistake because of my summary book, correct? So that's why it is should be included, not should not be included, should be included. Yes, so 30 days of incorporation. 
30 days of incorporation. Then subsequent board meeting, of course, at least four board meetings should be held every calendar year. So when act uses the word year, you should always think of it as calendar year. If the act wants to use financial year, they'll give the word financial. Calendar means December, they are normal British calendar. At least four board meetings every calendar year. Gap between two meetings, maximum gap should be 120 days. Maximum gap between two meetings must be 120 days. Now, when I say maximum gap between the two meetings, you only tell me using common sense, uh, the day of the meeting also you will count. Like today is one meeting, 120th day should be the other meeting or the gap between this meeting and the next meeting, the gap should be 120. Yes, that is common sense, but still it will create confusion in the exam because they will give you those options if they say that's it. So it is the gap should be 120. So please do not count the date of today's meeting or this board meeting and the next board meeting date should be excluded. Excluding that the gap should be 120 days. Then at least four board meetings should be held every calendar years. Now the secretarial standard earlier had told that you should have one board meeting every quarter. Now that has been removed. That is no longer there. No need to have one board meeting every quarter. Right. So those provisions have been removed from basically you have secretarial standards also in the exam. So these are not given in Bayer Act. These are given in secretarial standards. Right. So are accounting standards mandatory? Yes. Under section 133, you have to obviously those are accounting standards. BCom answer, what are accounting standards? Accounting standards are standards on accounting. Really, that's the definition. I'm not joking, that's the definition. Right? Then what I mean are they mandatory or discretionary? <laughs> mandatory under 129. 129 section clearly says that every financial statement has to uh, you have to uh, prepare them using the accounting standards. And then again, the director under director responsibility statement under 134. He will say, yes, we have followed all accounting standards. Then finally, auditor will say, yes, they have followed. That's all. So that for that, you have to study on full subject in CA final. right? So that is the entire scene. Now coming to uh, auditors, uh, standards on auditing. Is it mandatory or discretionary? In the sense, is it guideline in nature or mandatory? Standards on auditing. Standards on auditing 143 subsection 9 has clearly told every auditor shall comply or shall follow standards on auditing. So your paper 3 also, that's why we are dying. So because it is mandatory. It's all because of law, unfortunately. Then third one, now what about secretarial standards? Secretarial standards are mandatory or are they discretionary, which is may or may not be done by the company secretary or it's a guideline for the company secretary and the companies to follow. Guideline or has to be observed. Now full loud, all the inner feelings will come, has to be observed, has to be observed. So basically 118 subsection 10 says every company shall observe, shall observe what? Secretarial standards and two types of secretarial standards they have given there, SS1, SS2. SS3 is also there but is not, that is not present in 118.10. So SS3 dividend is discretionary or guideline. SS1, SS2. SS1 is board meeting, SS2 is shareholders meeting. Both are 100% mandatory. So basically your, uh, this cluster 4 is divided into two mini clusters. First mini cluster is only three sections, 173, 174, 175 and one question guaranteed. Only three sections, no, plus SS is also there, right? That is why it is actually a lot. That is one mini cluster, one question generally will come. Second mini cluster would be all your miscellaneous, 176, 177, 178, 179, 180, all these other small, small areas will come here under this. In that also, especially regarding the 180 part, once we do the cluster 3 only, we will be able to do that properly. There is no point. We will see that later. But apart from that, all these things are there, 181, 182, 183 till here. On this area, all put together, one question generally comes. So, there is no question paper in the whole of company law without a question on board meetings. Why? Paper setters are 99% generally company secretaries. Company secretaries with, you know, uh, where their experience will be our age, right? And the thing is, now they will fix those question papers because they are passionate about these board meetings. So, sometimes they will ask questions which are bouncers here and there, which nobody can answer. Like once they had asked a question, 
the video conferencing meeting that recording was lost what to do <laughs> i am not joking four marks question the recording was lost what to do then bcom or inner bcom feeling should come <laughs> and right so sometimes even institute suggested answers if you see something they have given there also they also don't know what to write so yes that is very important and one more thing is suggested answers can you take it as the ultimate answers by ci no in the first page only they have given disclaimer right suggested answers are not it's done by the ici that is board of studies where there is a one more examination council so in the disclaimer if you read they have clearly mentioned that this views suggested here will not be the views of the council so basically board of studies is one thing and the examination council is the other thing so both are different you will never be privy to the what do you say so actual answers given by the uh paper setters so that's why suggested answers is only suggestive in nature nothing else so sometimes there are errors etc nothing can be done anyway so coming to this now this is what it is 30 days of incorporation at least four board meetings every calendar year maximum gap must be 120 days so technically can i have uh, like four meetings 28 29 30 31 december i didn't have the full year so between like 29 30 31 no problem because there is maximum gap they have not told minimum gap but what about the first meeting that is 28 uh, december that i held and the previous meeting of course there is a gap of more than 120 so that would obviously be a problem you cannot take like that section 8 company same guys 30 days of incorporation 30 days of incorporation at least one board meeting here they say every 6 calendar months at least one board meeting every 6 calendar months because of the wordings the gap between two meetings must be what maximum 6 calendar months calendar months is what january to december everywhere it is january december not financial year correct it is january to december so can i have one meeting in january other meeting in december of that year no because the maximum gap must be six calendar because if you see the wording here then it will change for a ifsc company the meetings can be held 60 days of incorporation first meeting then you see at least one board meeting in each half of the calendar year change in wordings each half of calendar year means first half is what january to june second half july to december can i have one in jan and one in december here yes so in that half i can have whenever i want there is no maximum gap as such so because of these wordings the maximum uh, gap concept will not come then this uh, opc with one director so is going out his mom says where are you going meeting where me <laughs> who are you meeting me so i'll just uh, play a video after that video i'll explain why i am playing that video quick video we will understand why yes this is first watch is only sitting as me me is only sitting as me in you this two only is talking to each other understand i can only talk to me and give my understanding i cannot talk to anybody else and give my understanding anyway so this will be an opc meeting guys <laughs> again watch OPC meeting with one director. This is how it's going to be. Me is only sitting as me in you. This two only is talking to each other. Understand? I can only talk to me and give my understanding. I cannot talk to anybody else and give my understanding. So the me <laughs> resides in this as me is residing in all of that as me. so that me through this me talking to me opc meeting done mm-hmm. right, that's exactly why to understand the concept of opc you have to go to kailasa yes so that's the reason why guys oh this meeting is not this is nithyananda meeting not possible opc with one director not possible first board meeting not there subsequent board meeting not there gap between two board meetings not there not there yes that guy delivers such amazing things we don't understand that's all if you understand it will be great yes so like that and all don't think yes 
OPC with one director, all this done. Next, moving on, one second. Yep. So, OPC more than one director, ah, that is possible, correct? So, 30 days of incorporation, correct? 30 days of incorporation, first board meeting, same thing. Ah, here, again, this is similar to IFSC only. At least one board meeting in each half of the calendar, you are same. But one more thing, guys, here, they have given minimum gap of 90 days. So, in IFSC company, can I hold one in uh, January and the other one in December? Yes. Can I have one in June on June 30th, other one on July 3rd? Yes. But can a OPC with more than one director can have one meeting on 20th June and the other meeting on 3rd July? No. Because the minimum gap must be 90 days. Now, all these things can be gap may extend to 180 days. This 120 can become 120 days till September 30th, 2020 because of COVID. So, in the if any dates are given in the question, and those dates happen to be 2020 dates. So, please note that in 2020 till September 30th, they, they gave an extension of up to 180 days. 120 days could have been 180 days. So, that you can uh, write as a note in the exam. If at all any dates come which were related to 2020. If 2021 comes, it's okay. 2020, if it comes in the exam, we should see. Uh, this is a combined reading of 173.1, one, 173.5, 171.1 proviso and section 462 which gives exemptions to various things. So, this is what we need to see. Now, some uh, extra points obviously, maximum interval of 120 days between any two consecutive meetings of the board such that at least four meetings are held in each calendar year. SS1 also says the same thing. Date of incorporation uh, should be included while counting 30 days because they use the word off. Gap between 120 days should be counted excluding dates of two consecutive meetings. You should exclude those two consecutive meetings obviously. Now, if the original meeting is happening on let us say today I, I do an original meeting and one more meeting I do it on 118th day, no problem. This meeting was adjourned and this now became 128th day. I have adjourned this meeting, let us say because of our want of quorum, quorum was not there or anything that happened, I adjourned this meeting to 128 day. Now, have I broken the, what do you say, uh, board meeting provisions? Have I contravened the board meeting provisions? What do you think? No. Strong gut feeling? No. Answer? Yes. Why? The original meeting, the adjourned meeting is a continuation of the original meeting. Many people, what they used to do, they should, they could, they would hold the meeting before the due date and keep on adjourning, keep on adjourning to like three months, four months, five months. Same thing happened with shareholders meeting also. There are many case laws which have clearly told that adjourned meeting is a continuation of the original meeting. When original meeting you can hold within 120 days, adjourned meeting also should be held within 120 days. Same goes with shareholders meeting also. Adjourned shareholders meeting, adjourned board meeting, everything should happen within the last date on which the original meeting ought to have been held. So, if the 30th September is the meeting and you hold it on 30th September, please finish it that time. The moment you adjourn it to beyond that time, it would obviously mean that you have contravened the provision. So, many case laws are there based on that only. So, 118 day, 28 day. Now, okay, this is fine. Let us say I held it on maximum gap is 120, right? I held it on the 98th day, okay? Then I adjourned it to the 118th day. This is okay, no problem. Now, my question is the next meeting should be 120 days again. The next meeting, this is the okay, first meeting already done. This is the second meeting. This is the adjourned second meeting. The third meeting should happen within 120 days of this or this. Yeah, again 98th day or 118th. Again, since adjourned meeting is a continuation of original meeting, it is as if that was also held on 98th day. So, that 120 days should start from this. Of course, the 98th day I should exclude, 99 day or not will be day number 1 and then continue. So, all those provisions are here, check it out. 
an adjourned meeting being a continuation of the original meeting the interval period in such a case shall be counted from the date of the original meeting this is as per ss1 from means original meeting date exclude from the next day next day obviously last day also i mean the date of the next meeting also exclude this meeting also exclude gap must be 120 a board meeting shall be called like coming to notice provision shall be called by giving not less than 7 days notice in writing 7 days notice in writing to every director because the act uses the word every director it means what original director alternate director interested director everybody interested director is a person who is financially interested in that particular contract you will learn it in uh, cluster 3 no problem then again these things they can ask in uh, mcq notice and agenda has to be given this is given in ss1 only shall be served served me what's the difference between issue and served issue means just to send serve means you should ensure that that fellow re it reaches that guy so served at his ad address registered with the company mind you they can ask a mcq question simple notice and the agenda should be given to dash first one they'll give notified address will will you know tick that and come right second one they'll give address registered with the company in india address in india address outside india now we'll all get confused so guys it is need not be it need not be notified address it is address registered with the company it can be an address outside india also all mcq hidden questions these are right so notice plus agenda to a director who is abroad should also give should be given at a registered address could be foreign address also generally we'll say notified address in come and generally we'll think companies in india so extra thoughts so what the uh, notice also should be given in india so in 173 it is different 175 it's different do not get confused next and okay one fellow will call up and tell uh, you know i am not coming for the meeting it's okay i am informing you before and he's taken uh, leave of absence coming to leave of absence you should connect alternate data we'll do it immediately after this leave of absence i'll tell now tell me he is told he will not come should i still send it to him yes. if you don't send it to him can he come and say you know meeting is invalid yes, yes. mental fellows will be the directors so even if they tell no please send that's all that's what ss1 says i am not telling notice plus agenda should be sent to every director even if a particular director informs that he will not be able to attend the meeting notice can be sent by all of the following except first one for registered post second one rp ad third one courier like that they'll ask so guys one more amendment has come in ss1 notice cannot be sent via courier correct cannot be sent via courier service it should only be through the previous mode that is registered post or registered post acknowledgement due or speed post or delivery by hand it cannot be done via courier lot of issues were happening where the courier person was not delivering actually there are many cases also if you read the various thing that's why they said ss1 revise and remove courier imagine so cannot be sent by these questions they'll ask in the exam right you will simply study 173 4 5 and go ss1 will miss out these are all ss1 provisions right that's what it is now coming to that one uh, thing uh, 12 months you know the absent himself from 12 months that also will connect and finish it off i told you that 12 months with or without leave of absence leave of absence now if a director is going abroad for let's say 13 months because of medical uh, problem he'll say you either accept my resignation or give me 13 months leave i cannot stay in the company i cannot work also don't call me for any meeting for me health is most important the question is if i appoint an alternate director in his place after 12 months basically you have not attended any board meetings you are the original director you have not attended any board meetings the question is will you vacate office under 167 there was a provision which said 12 months with or without leave of absence so my question is very simple you have taken leave of absence so basically you have gone beyond 12 months and 13th month uh, at the end of 12 months will you vacate as a original director 
similarly obviously because of which will alternate diameter also go so is it indirectly what i am asking is is it indirectly can you say alternate directors tenure is from 3 months it starts only 3 months no so it is that 3 months to 12 months because of 167 that point can you say that indirectly the alternate directors tenure would be 3 months because obviously only if you are going beyond 3 months only i will be appointed so you leave 3 months can i say it is maximum 12 months is it like that what do you think what do you mean by with or without leave of absence with or without leave of absence yeah with absence i mean without leave of absence yes you are negligent with absence means what yeah so with absence is what guys it is basically that also is actually negligence like today morning i'll inform i'll not come so basically 167 only talks about negligence the intention is negligence not this director if mukesh ammani says 13 months i am on leave let us you know keep it very hushed up i am on leave i will definitely be present here and there but it should be a very secret arrangement now tell me because of companies act provisions if you do not come for the meeting for 12 months does it mean you have to vacate his office no so this with or without leave of absence is what so basically the director is least bothered about the company so he will tell that he will not come for the next meeting he will also tell i'll not come for the next three meetings i have taken leave of absence without leave of absence means he'll anyway not come he'll say he'll come but he'll never turn up so this leave of absence is a leave of absence with an intention of being extremely negligent so this point cannot be combined with alternate director so alternate director tenure is not 12 months correct there is also scope for legal and medical impossibility with or without leave of absence there is scope for legal and medical impossibility same dialogue you will find it in that particular 167 so that is also done then uh, can i give a shorter notice means less than 7 days can i call a meeting immediately yes in various circumstances for example during this uh, disappearance of uh, shri vijay siddhartha right can the company secretary say next week aram sir will meet no problem one week notice no it was a matter of grave concern immediately you have to meet so regarding that also this is a shorter notice master chart it will really help you so shorter notice uh, let's see this section 101 section 115 101 is what normal notice 115 special notice board meeting notice everything is important shorter notice of ordinary notice normal 21 clear days before the meeting we have already seen if company wants to send anything lesser than 21 days if company wants to send lesser than 21 days then the following you should do if it is an agm what to do if it is an agm what approval i should take if it is an agm 95% of members have to agree mind you guys it is 95% of members not 95% of voting power so if there are 1000 people 950 people should agree even though 950 people only have 4% voting power doesn't matter because agm is all about democracy everybody should come there is a shorter notice concept for whom can i make it less than 21 days yes can i make a 10 day notice yes 11 day notice yes but i would take an approval of how many people 95% of members on the other hand egm extraordinary general meeting majority in number and 95% value majority in number 95% value means 501 people having 95% shares 501 people in the same example 501 people having how many shares 95% shares very simple special notice not earlier than 3 months not less than 14 days for a special notice guys there is no concept of short notice special notice there is no concept whatsoever of short notice now comes the important part which they can ask you in the exam <coughs> even this has been asked that's why i'm showing this even 101 has been asked 173 regularly asked more regularly asked first if there is an independent director in the company already means the company has an independent director which independent director is listed companies and prescribed unlisted paid up capital that on 10 crore all those all those we have seen 
yes listed company plus prescribed unlisted there has to be presence of at least one independent director in that particular meeting when you are doing it there should be presence of at least one short notice that next day you are holding a meeting there should be presence of at least one independent director if there is no independent director means he could not come to the meeting then what should you do you should circulate just change the spelling circulate circulate and ratified means what approved if at all in that meeting one independent director could not be present the resolution will become valid only and only when you circulate it and ratified means what approved by how many people at least one independent director at least one independent director ratified by at least one independent director presence of at least one independent director which should be there and if it is a no then you will circulate it and it will be ratified by at least one independent director now what if the company in the in that independent director is not required only for example private company and unlisted company act is silent guys that's why i have to take talk of ss1 act is silent in this regard what does it say majority of the directors of the company mind you majority of the directors of the company not the directors attending the meeting again very important all these mcq questions majority of directors of the company and not majority of directors present in the meeting if there are 10 directors in the company and six directors come and in that majority four out of six no it should be six out of 10 short notice is possible only six out of 10 majority of the directors of the company but of course in that majority of the directors are only those directors who are entitled to vote means what interested directors are outside the purview interested directors are outside the purview i need not go to interested directors it should only be majority of the directors who are entitled to vote no interested directors lastly like uh, this example of uh you know vijay siddhartha unpublished price sensitive information the disappearance of your managing director 100% is a price sensitive information it brought down the entire company if you remember 120 rupees share became like 20 rupees right so yes and it is unpublished of course nobody knows about it so in such a case what should i do majority of the directors should approve same including one independent director if you do not approve that resolution then that short notice will be invalid if i do not give a notice will it invalidate the proceedings of the meeting what do you think yes again see point number 1 in case of failure to give notice the proceedings and resolutions passed may be declared as invalid by the court of law even an accidental omission to give notice to a director would render the resolutions void whereas in shareholders meeting there is a section called 1014 in that accidental omission to give general meeting notice will it make the uh, resolutions valid or void yes under 1014 if you want to compare it with shareholders meeting accidental omission to give notice under shareholders meeting shareholders are lakhs and lakhs of shareholders in that three people you missed out then it is valid provided it is accidental but you missed out three people three people control 60% of share capital uh, then obviously it is not accidental right so if you see only accidental omission but under board meeting regulations nothing doing whether it is accidental or otherwise everything will be held to be void however many case laws have also told that in the interest of continuation of business where notice is not given but all the directors attend the meeting without any objection basically they sign a noc i have not received notice it's okay i waive off that right now for this particular thing if they sign an noc then the proceedings will be valid right this is also given in ss1 these are never available in the bear act this is not there in the section it is ss1 correct so that is also part of the deal then can i should i give notice if the articles always say every board meeting should be held on the third saturday of january march july 
August, like that some six months they have given and every third Saturday there is board meeting. It's already mentioned there. But I still give notice. Yes, yes SS1 says, notice shall be given even if meetings are held on predetermined dates. Should I give adjourned meeting notice also? Adjourned meeting. Adjourned meeting. So if you see, notice of adjourned meeting shall be given to all the directors including those who did not attend. And unless the date of the adjourned meeting is decided at the meeting, notice shall be given not less than 7 days. Original meeting also 7 days, adjourned meeting also 7 days. Unless you have decided the date and that meeting. <coughs> Any item. So, basically there has to be an agenda, not as per the section but as per SS1. In the agenda, can you add any other item which was not there in the agenda itself? Can you add like four items of discussions are there? I want to add one more item. Earlier, it was possible with the permission of the chairman. Now, they have changed it in the SS1. Check it out. Any item not included in the agenda may be taken up for consideration with the permission of the chairman. Okay, addition and with the consent of majority of the directors of the company no majority of the directors present in the meeting like that they will trick you correct for agenda it is majority of directors present in the meeting for short notice it is majority of directors of the company all mcq tricks to two marks so that is that then uh, resolution by circulation under 175 circular resolution that cannot be treated as a substitute for board meeting. That is obviously a completely different thing. Cannot consider that to be a board meeting. Resolution by circulation cannot be by any stretch of imagination considered as board meeting for the purpose of section 173. Any director may call the meeting. But if the director instructs the company secretary, company secretary shall call the meeting after discussion with the MD and whole time director. Now, when can you, where should you hold the meeting? Should it be in India, outside India? Can you hold it anywhere? Best part is board meetings can be held anywhere in the world. It can be held outside India also, but it should not be malified. Ten directors are there. Four directors create a separate WhatsApp group and say, <laughs> quickly go to US, USA visa, apply for USA visa. So they all apply the visa, the moment visa is applied, 7 days notice they will give and the board meeting is in USA. Other 6 people obviously they will not get the visa. So these people will go there and pass whatever resolutions as they deem fit and they come back. This is malified. This is will be struck down, right? If you see, directors can hold BM at any place in India and even in a foreign country where circumstances justify and no malafide intentions are involved. Malafied means bad. Mala means bad. Not mala, mala. Yes. Yes, next. Board meetings, can it be held on national holiday, board meetings? Yes, any day guys. All this is different in uh, shareholders meeting. You can cannot hold it on national holiday. If you see AGM. AGM cannot be held on national holiday, but board meeting can be held on any day, including national holiday. In fact, SS1 earlier had told that you should not hold it on a national holiday, try to avoid. So that entire line has been deleted in the revised SS1. So basically, you can hold it even on a national holiday, no problem. Mind you, national holiday is not a public holiday. Sundays anyway you can hold. Right, but national holiday, Gandhi Jayanti, Republic Day, Independence, yes. So, you see, SS1 earlier said that meeting should not be held on national holiday. Directors may participate in board meeting either in person or through video conferencing or other audio visual means. So, if again these are some other questions which they can ask you as far as you know the uh, MCQs are concerned. If an attendance register is maintained in a loose leaf format loose leaves, there obviously the attendance register, it shall be bound periodically at least once in every dash three years. MCQs, your memory based MCQs. Minutes to be filed, so obviously minutes of the meeting should be created and you should file it, 30 days of the meeting, 
during these 30 days draft minutes should go to all directors within 15 days and they should approve within 7 days after checking accuracy of the contents now there are this is a very very important point 14 there are certain things which basically you cannot do via video conferencing so initially in nine, 2013 they said everything you can do via video conference except these for example annual finance statements board report prospectors audit committee approval relating to merger amalgamation they told you cannot do via board you cannot do via vc you have to have a proper board meeting then in 2013 to almost 15 16 they said that was okay we are all at different different places in the world only for approving board report you expect us to come it's a waste of money so let's do one thing at least let a physical quorum be there in the registered office physical quorum quorum may be two three people let two three people be there remaining let them do via video conferencing so they changed the law in 2015 ish where they said that if physical quorum is present it's okay if physical quorum is present these things can be done via video conferencing these things can be done via video conferencing now guys from june 2021 this entire rule only has been deleted means what any item of business can be discussed via video conferencing no physical quorum needed no physical quorum needed effect from june 2021 the first time ever this question can come would be now so june 2021 it has been completely deleted the first time ever would be our attempt now coming attempt may right because this was not applicable in the december attempt also december attempt we are told it is going now it went so now it is basically any question that they ask with these things just to confuse you approve board report approve prospectors and all always remember that there is no physical quorum needed now you can approve prospectors approve board report anyway this was actually they said no physical quorum needed due to covid anyway covid provisions were there they said due to covid no uh, physical quorum was needed now what they did they deleted the rule only which means now whether covid or otherwise whatever it is physical quorum is not needed for these items not only for these items any item everything you can do via video conferencing this is a welcome move because from this what do you say con one thing that you have learned from covid is of course you can actually learn effectively and work also effectively may not be as effective as face to face I mean what do you say meeting but still you can definitely work your own comfort and they said no point wasting money and time having these meetings we can do it you know via video conferencing itself so that was regarding this particular uh, points now moving on again guys board meeting again if you see uh, time and place original board meeting and adjourned board meeting these are all combination of various sections made it made very easy into charts becomes easy for you so as i told you india also possible abroad also possible bona fide any time any place including national holiday then adjourn adjourn can be two reasons one is what for want of quorum for want of quorum i called a board meeting today except company secretary everybody mass bunk right <laughs> nobody is there so what for want of quorum so what does the law say go to the articles if the articles are silent the articles are silent then adjourn the meeting stands adjourned same time same day next week very peculiar this must not be on a national holiday original board meeting can be on national holiday adjourned board meeting for want of quorum only cannot be held on national holiday this is given in the section not in ss1 given in the section that's why this are this chart will help you original board meeting can be held on a national holiday adjourned board meeting for want of quorum cannot be held on a national holiday so this is as per act and ss1 this is as per the section not as per ss1 right that's why other reasons what are other reasons the board starts fighting happens no you would have seen parliamentary parliamentary sessions so suddenly there you know, some one director starts throwing on chapel 
this one more director mike chairman gets up chair only is not there right so in that case what happens of course board to decide board to decide or articles basically chairman will say let's just you know adjourn now can be adjourned obviously to a national holiday also when the original bm can be held on national holiday adjourned for other reason also can be held on national holiday only this adjourned for want of quorum cannot be held on a national holiday next comes the quorum provisions quorum is the minimum number of directors required to be present to validly transact any business at the meeting any business at the meeting various uh, examples for quorum tomorrow we will see after we finish the third cluster but this is basically the quorum will be what one third of total strength or two whichever is higher one third of total strength or two whichever is higher any fraction will be rounded off to one because it should be whichever is higher so one third if it is 3.33 i should make it four obviously then any decision taken at a meeting without quorum is void without quorum is void all the directors including the interested director will be counted for calculation of total strength we will see some sums tomorrow after cluster 3 because i need to connect there that's why anyway other points we will see now participation of director through video conferencing and other audio visual means shall also be counted for purpose of quorum when the company has both alternate director and uh, original director both are attending the meeting for calculation purposes only both original and alternate should be counted as one director and whose vote will be counted alternate director obviously for a section 8 company however quorum is 8 members or 25% of total strength whichever is less for a section 8 company it's a different quorum if there are 10 people 25% of total strength right or that is uh, around if there are 12 people let's say 25% is by 4 3 3 or 2 3 or 8 sorry whichever is less now since you do not have any basic number of directors in section 8 company you can have 40 50 60 directors also no problem so more the merrier 25% or 8 whichever is less but what if the company only has 4 25% will be 1 1 or 8 whichever is less 1 no that's why then it will become like nityananda that's why minimum two directors minimum two directors that's why they have given minimum two directors to avoid that scene uh 23 24 we'll see later so this part uh with sums we shall be seeing later tomorrow anyway all these points we'll see tomorrow this chart also will be done tomorrow next part resolution by circulation because for that we need to connect certain things in cluster 3 so one of you please remind me tomorrow after that we should do this i should not miss it i have gajini memory i don't remember so you need to tell me yes resolution by circulation section 175 this is what this is not a replacement of board meetings at all this is in addition to board meeting wherever the law says board resolution wherever the law specifically does not signify board meeting resolution it only says board resolution i'll have to go with i can go with resolution by circulation also applicable for all board meetings and committee meetings what committee audit committee nomination remuneration committee stakeholder relationship committee whistle blower policy that committee all those committee meetings also can happen via 175 resolution will be circulated in draft so draft resolution will be sent and they have used the term called necessary papers necessary papers means what god only knows it's like 21 clear days what is clear don't know that's why using reasonable construction we can say necessary papers means all the papers required which is sufficient for directors to indulge in idmp means informed decision making process informed decision making process now you see guys normal notice of a normal board meeting cannot be sent by courier this stupid thing can be sent by courier <laughs> right so that they will ask in the exam so 175 that should be sent to the uh, again see one more deadly thing address registered with the company in india right there it is address registered with the company 
टू टू मार्क्स एमसीक्यू दे लास्क यूल कम आउट एंड से डेड इजी पेपर राइट रिजल्ट इजी डेट करेक्ट सिंपल सेंड दैट वॉट वी होप दैट विल गेट एटी इन द रिजल्ट डिवाइड बाई टू डिवाइड बाई थ्री समटाइम्स राइट it will be sent at the address registered with the company in india with the company in india by hand delivery or by post or by courier so two changes their courier not their air courier is there and there it is registered with the company it can be abroad also your indian address registered indian address registered this is for 175 173 is different then how will i mean who will approve this particular thing to be approved by a majority of the directors or members who are entitled to vote on the resolution based on this two three questions have come in the recent past for four marks like in the new syllabus papers to be approved by a majority of the directors or members here means not shareholders members mean members of the committee members of the committee so you leave that now directors majority directors are entitled to vote on the resolution and if any resolution i mean uh, circular resolution is uh, sent circulated first day i circulate how many days time i give for them to respond 7 days it is not given in the act it is given in ss1 directors shall have maximum 7 days to respond it can be 3 days 4 days 5 days also depending on how you send it but maximum 7 days now the question is there are 10 directors and uh, when is it passed if majority passes the resolution let's say on the third day 6 out of 10 directors have approved the resolution this was the question 6 out of 10 people have approved the resolution resolution the date of resolution will be the third day or should i wait for all 7 days for the others also to res respond if the four people also say no will it matter no because they have already passed right so generally we write what third day is the day when majority has passed that would be wrong because there is one more proviso which says if minimum one third of the total number of directors want the entire want a board meeting instead of resolution by circulation Little bit English has gone for a toss here. Resolution by circulation. If minimum one third of total number of directors want a board meeting instead of resolution by circulation, correct? Then a board meeting shall be called. What is one third of ten? Three point three three means four. so remaining four people say nothing doing this is a very important matter how can we discuss i mean how can we pass a resolution without discussion please call a board meeting then a board meeting has to be called that is why in this example i have to wait for the full 7 days if i tweak this example in such a way that 7 out of 10 people have already agreed 7 out of 10 people have already agreed means the remaining one third will be 3.33 which means remaining are only three available correct what is one third of 10 3.33 so 3.33 means actually four people should uh, say board meeting resolution i want but then here only three people 3.33 means four but how many people are remaining guys how many people are remaining only three people are remaining even if they say i want board meeting resolution will that be passed no correct it's not gonna it's not happening it's not gonna happen because 1/3 will be 3.33 remaining people are only 3 so even if these three people say i want board meeting resolution it's not possible because minimum 4 should say so so if 7 out of 10 agree another way of telling it is what ss1 says another way is it will be passed when majority pass it okay but which date will it be passed it will be passed when more than 2/3 have agreed what is 2/3 6.67 what is more than 2/3 7 if 7 have already agreed then there is no seen that the remaining 1/3 will be can you know uh, because more than 2/3 have already agreed so exactly 1/3 cannot say no so basically combined reading of both 
minimum one third of total member want a board meeting instead of resolution by circulation a board meeting shall be called hence date of resolution would be the date when more than two third of them approve in such a manner that one third cannot ask for a board meeting directors outside india also can vote on circular resolution if alternate director is appointed for original director was gone abroad obviously alternate director alone should be considered we know that every resolution by circulation shall be noted at a subsequent meeting of the board or committee and will be part of the minutes of that meeting director is entitled to inspect the minutes held before the period of his directorship also is entitled to inspect the minutes of the meeting held during the period of his directorship even after he ceases to become a director he can inspect the minutes no problem where under a scheme of arrangement a company has been merged or amalgamated with another company minutes of all the meeting shall be preserved permanently first option will be 8 years we'll take that and come so that is books of accounts no yes so it should be preserved permanently should be preserved permanently this is for scheme of arrangement right scheme of arrangement so it is permanent preservation of the accounts oh, sorry of the minutes so we still quorum is uh, pending we'll have to do that couple of other points and we'll close for the day so in this especially 180 we cannot do because that requires knowledge of cluster number 3 180 we shall do later tomorrow then uh, donations of course this we can do it's very easy so we'll basically finish 179 quickly which is anyway we have done and uh, this 176 and then close so tomorrow cluster 3 then remaining part of this and then cluster 5 and moving on other things defects in appointment of directors not to invalidate the actions so here if a director all acts done by the director ddt when there is a defect in appointment or disqualification or the termination of his appointment if for example he has not been appointed properly only in the sense when he was appointed quorum was not there but he has acted in good faith for the benefit of the company what happens to the acts of the director valid he's already been disqualified under 164 nobody realized even he didn't realize there was no malefied intention but whatever he did was for the betterment of the company no problem valid his tenure has been terminated now nobody realized he also didn't know genuinely he was supposed to be reappointed but that didn't happen they forgot about it yes it will be valid but this will not give validity to retrospective appointments means what i forgot to appoint uh, that person so to cover up my mistakes i will retrospectively appoint him from 2 years before now those things cannot be done under this 176 so act because that is malefied that is not bona fide acts done by a director shall be valid even though afterwards were discovered that apart, uh, the appointment was invalid due to ddt that is defect disqualification or termination acts of the director shall not be valid where his appointment has been shown to the company as invalid or terminated from the day you come to know from that day it is invalid till that day gone so if you see generally acts of the director binding the company is one thing binding the outsiders is the other thing 176 covers which act act of the director with the outsider or acts of the director being bound to the company bound to the company because this one is your ca inter syllabus doctrine of indoor management i don't need a section for this there is already a doctrine of indoor management so this is royal british bank versus turquoise popularly called as the turquoise rule turquoise rule says all innocent outsiders are always protected by the acts of the directors so i will not be you know you cannot i don't need a different section to protect if you are an innocent outsider definitely you will be protected but the exceptions of that also was what knowledge of the irregularity and if the outsider knew about what was happening that's it so this covers this one acts done by the director will it bind the company or not can company recover money or not so they say 
even though i come to know that it has been there is a defect disqualification or termination but if you have done it in good faith no problem i will allow you to continue very simple but after that day after that day gone after that day not possible so 176 176 validates the bona fide acts of directors done in good faith very clearly given done in good faith and without notice that these are done illegally the company shall be liable for acts of such director the day you come to know it's what do you say your there is a defect from that day it's invalid that's why the company shall be liable for all acts of such director done in good faith and without notice that these are done illegally acts third parties are already already protected by the doctrine of indoor management so no tension acts of a director shall not be valid where his appointment itself is illegal where there is no appointment at all where his acts are ultra vires going against the powers of the companies act itself basically your retrospective appointment for example it was not an irregular exercise of power but exercise of power by a person who had no authority at all you had no right to make an retrospective appointment like that what you did was illegal hence all the acts will be invalid this section does not validate the acts of in the capacity of a chairman only a director that is casting vote of chairman etc not valid if the appointment is invalid in ordinary resolution if there is a 50 50 deadlock chairman will have a casting vote that casting vote will be invalid if the appointment of chairman himself is invalid he cannot tell 176 no 176 is only for director 176 is also not for md it's only for director acts as a director not act as an md right the section validates the action acts done in capacity of a director acts done in the capacity of md or old time director already it was it will be dealt rather in 196 so that 196 is acts as an md this is acts as a director then we have already seen this 179 uh, two tier management who is more powerful all that we have seen so the shareholders powers are quantified where in the act in the moa and the aoa we have seen that that's okay that's what it is however 1793 3 these are the powers which can only happen via board meeting resolution what are they makes calls on shareholders authorized by back issue securities issue securities if i want to issue equity shares preference shares bonds debentures whatever the case may be requires a board meeting resolution borrow money invest funds grant loan def and even your cluster number 6 7 and all those things if you see diversify the business amalgamation merger cluster 6 also has to happen via board meeting resolution only this clause d e f only these three clauses can be delegated to whom managing director principal officer all these things you can delegate d e f can be delegated to committee of the board md principal officer principal officer of the branch d f can be passed by a resolution by circulation also in section 8 company this is again section 8 company d f can happen by a resolution by circulation no need of board meeting this delegation should happen how delegation should happen by a board meeting resolution then this fellow can pass resolutions on his own the board's approval is required only for the sanction limits and not for each transaction so there will be a sanction limit and up to that you can borrow what about opening a bank account is it a loan giving a loan to the company giving a loan to the bank answer is yes right opening of a current account by a company with a bank amounts to making of a loan that is 179 3f this one it is deemed that if i open a bank account it's like giving an interest free loan current account i'll open it is like giving a interest free loan to the bank then of course wherever we pass a special resolution in the act under section 117 i have to file a form mgt 14 this has to be filed within 30 days of the whenever you pass the resolution apart from that all these section 1793 all these provisions whenever i am passing 
whenever I'm making calls on shareholders, whenever I'm authorizing buyback, whenever I'm issuing securities, whenever I'm borrowing money, blah, 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 all these cases. In all these cases, also under 117, all the resolutions of the board passed under 179.3 should be filed with ROC in MGT 14. MGT 14 is not just for special resolutions, MGT 14 is also for board resolution under 179. 180 series we will see tomorrow, now last part of the day, donations 181, 182, 183. This chart will help us understand everything. 181 for charitable and other bona fide funds charitable funds and other bona fide funds those bona fide funds can be related to employees also in the old law they said charitable funds and other funds which do not relate to employment now they have changed it to other bona fide funds so the company is donating if Reliance is donating to Reliance Employee Welfare Scheme, Employee Welfare Fund, should they follow 181? Yes. So 181 is what for both charitable and other bona fide funds. How much? Up to 5% of the net profit. What resolution? Not board meeting, just board resolution. If I am going beyond 5% of net profit, then ordinary resolution in general meeting plus board resolution. Both has, have to be passed. Section 182 political contribution. Earlier it was 7.5% of net profits, but due to changes in the Finance Act, right, which we have explained in depth in the regular classes, now it is any amount, any amount, but through only through check and bank. And of course, there is one more scheme, sorry, scam, it's called electoral bond. Electoral bond uh, scheme, sorry, yes. Electoral bond scheme whereby you can give it, you can buy any number of bonds and then distribute to anybody anonymous donation. Electoral bond uh, scheme, yes. 183, 183 is uh, to the richly deserved people of our country, National Defense Fund. Here also any amount I can do so. Mind you, even if I am a loss making company, I can do it. However, if you see charitable and other bona fide funds, loss making company cannot do. Reliance Employee Welfare Fund, not possible if Reliance only is a loss making company, right? So political contribution also, that 7.5 net profit is over now, they have said any amount. So even a loss making company can go for what? Political contribution, 183 National Defense Fund, any amount, 135 is CSR, CSR 2% of the average net profits of the last 3 years. Now this predominantly you will get probably in paper 3 and other things but not here because this is uh, shifted to CA inter new syllabus. The entire 135 is shifted but just so you know 2% of the average net profit of the last 3 years. If I spend more can I carry forward? Yes. As per the new rules you can carry forward. If it is you know more than 2% if you have spent. On the other hand if uh, I have not spent it there are 2 rules. One, you have to transfer to an unspent account, unspent uh, CSR account, assuming that you know there is uh, no ongoing project going on. If an ongoing project is going on, again you have to spend there and you have to spend it within the next, you know, three years. All those rules are there. That is not relevant for us anyway. That's in CA Inter. Yes. So some extra shots with respect to uh, political contribution. Government companies and other companies that are in existence for less than three financial years are prohibited to make any political contribution. Government companies and other companies less than three financial years, political contribution not possible. CSR they can do. CSR again rule has changed. Last three years is there. Now what if uh, the company came last year? They, they have changed the, uh, you know, section amended and they have told no problem. If it is less than three years, then such number of years. So yes, you can do, but political contribution can be made only if it is minimum three years. And uh, one more thing, under charitable uh, funds, sometimes this and this will match. Because in 135, it will also include uh, poverty alleviation, etc. Here also have made a uh, donation to a charitable fund, which is into poverty alleviation. Now the question is, 
let's say you have donated 3% of your profits now that 3% will be taken here also here also or only in one place it will be taken in both places it will be taken in both places for example you have already spent 3% under csr for poverty alleviation under uh, 181 you want to spend 3% on some employee welfare fund in while well, computing you should take this 3% plus this 3% 6% it's going beyond 5 so what you should do ordinary resolution and board resolution on the other hand i have already spent 4% uh, of net profits in 181 i have already spent 3% of net profit in 135 does it mean in 185 anyway earlier 7.5% was there now any amount that any amount is over and above 181 135 or it is uh, separate this 182 is it over and above 181 135 or it is completely is, is it you have to calculate that amount also or is it any amount it is any amount and it starts with a non upstand clause notwithstanding so 182 donation under this uh, 182 etc it specifies what notwithstanding stay in the section here 182 donations in this section okay it's fine sorry sorry my bad it is in addition to limit specified in 181 is in addition to the limit specified in 181 it is in addition to the limit specified in 181 because of the use of the word notwithstanding so should not combine anything combination is only 181 and 135 182 is outside the picture you can donate whatever you want no tension any donation to any person carrying on uh, activity to affect public support for a political party shall also be deemed to be political contribution any souvenir brochure pamphlet etc also shall be deemed to be political contribution so even if you give it to any uh, political rally yes what if you give it to a newspaper or a news channel which is owned by political parties then then it is a no because if it is within norms then price you have just put your advertisement in a newspaper owned by a political party your company ad does it mean that is political contribution no but the uh, uh, rate is uh, 20,000 rupees you have spent 2 crore on it then yes obviously yes so it depends on the facts of the case contribution will be through an account pay check or electronic clearing system and P&L account should clearly do so show so and uh, liability is 5 times the amount so contributed that is ok then uh, apart from that these two are the same only we have already discussed the other areas then miscellaneous provisions yes all investment should be held in the company's own name any property etc should be held in the own name company however may hold any shares in its subsidiary in the name of any nominee or nominees of the company this is what guys if i am a holding company if i am having 100 percent subsidiary in the subsidiary company's books who is the member only holding company is there but subsidiary company is a public company how many people should be there seven but unfortunately all 100 percent is held by only the holding company so how do we do it that's why they say Anyway, one member is already there. Six people can be nominees. Six people can be nominees. So, as to ensure the number of members is not reduced below the statutory limit. Every company shall keep at the registered office, obviously, a contract of service with the MD and uh, mem written memorandum setting out the terms and conditions with the MD, etc. This will be open for inspection. Such copy shall be open to inspection by any member of the company. This also can be MCQ by anyone no any member only without payment of any fee who is a member member is a person whose name is entered in the register of members if you are a share i mean if you are trading in the stock market your name will be entered in let's say you have some shares of infosys will your name be entered or somebody else's name be entered your name will not be entered at all obviously the depository participant the banks and the depository cdsl nsdl name will be there but you are the beneficial owner so we see the member definition even if you are a beneficial owner but the name will be in the records of the depository you will be deemed to be a member so any of us who are, have shares in the company can go without the payment of fee and do so that's about it guys so tomorrow what we'll do is cluster number three that is loan study with a fresh mind and uh, of course the other areas will try to finish as much as possible if we try to finish companies act somehow tomorrow 
by you know of course to the same speed and then the next day we can have some time for ibc fema pmla all those fcra many changes have come that's about it yes two minute silence for the ones who thought i'll teach slow <laughs> generally i am very slow no you will you will see my videos at 1.5x speed now i only made myself 1.75x okay thank you all right guys good morning it's 8:30 am how are you all let's begin had breakfast properly Ah, super come on let's begin so cluster number 3 today uh, we'll start off with loans to director so today's agenda is let's try to wind up with companies act provisions as much as possible uh, some areas like cluster 6 i mean uh, we'll see we can do a mix of uh, this uh, summary book and also my chart book because it's faster that way since it's a revision session so let's see So today's agenda, of course, would be to finish cluster number three, five, and six. Seven, anyway, will be done part of that, uh, part of the six itself. Only the main areas cannot go everywhere into uh, in depth into winding up and all those things. And of course, the miscellaneous things like uh, NCLT, NCLT, and all that quickly we can finish off. Uh, PPIRP and Nidhi Company have anyway released the what do you say? a uh, quick fire revision so you can check that out i can i'll add it in the youtube video don't worry apart from that we will do other things because uh, especially in fcra there have been quite a few amendments which we are which are important and in fema also residential status there's a different interpretation taken by icai so that also we need to understand all that so anyway but uh, loans to directors are something which has to be delved into in slightly in depth because uh, i mean if we simply do a cursory glance it's of no use So let's uh, see loan to directors, and of course, cluster five also. There have been uh, significant amendments, those small amendments, but they are significant. They have significant consequences. So we will do that. Cool. So let's begin with cluster number three, guys. Uh, loans to directors. So page thirty-five in the summary book. Anyway, those charts which are there, which anyway I will show it in the form of a PowerPoint presentation because it becomes easy for me to maneuver. but same charts are there don't worry first of all uh, yes section 166 speaks about the duties of directors uh, in that duty especially uh, there are two duties will come to that but before that there is one concept called assignment of office that is point number 6 so it says a director of the company shall not assign his office now what do you mean by assignment assignment is transfer of rights can a director transfer his rights to somebody else and i have appointed mr a can you say no no the all the rights will go to mr b no that won't happen so a director of the company shall not assign his rights assign his office and any assignment so made shall be void assignment of office of a director usually takes place when the director is alive right obviously so only when he is alive assignment of office takes place so basically after he dies you cannot say through a will i am transferring everything to somebody else that cannot happen so director of the company shall not assign his office and any assignment so made shall be void so it will usually takes place when the director is alive is what it says this is on case law oriental metal pressing private limited versus bv thakur that again we need to remember that name because it is important now moving on to the various other duties of uh, directors we have 1664 which speaks about a director should not have any conflict of interest with anybody else in the sense if he is entering into a contract with one more uh, i mean the, the company in which you are a director entering into contract with one more company then what happens is of course if there is any conflict of interest you have common directorship etc ideally we should avoid is what 1664 says but then you cannot always avoid it obviously uh, but nevertheless 1665 also says that even if you enter into a contract like that no problem you should not enter into any contract in such a way there is should not be any undue gain if even if you make some money out of it you need to disclose is what they are ideally trying to tell so to curb that there are four sections we have one is section 184 that is uh, disclosure of directors interest then we have 185 that is loans to directors 186 that is inter corporate loans and advances and 188 188 is what related party transactions so these are the four uh, areas which are covered uh, to ensure that this what do you say uh, provisions of 
and 5 are complied with. And of course, we have you have to disclose in the board report under 134.3G and 3H. It is mandatory to disclose in the board report uh, and disclosure in the financial statements as well uh, periodically. And auditor's report, CARO. So in CARO clause 3, 4 and 13 specifically speak about uh, disclosure about all these things 184, 185, 186, 188. So if you do not disclose, you will be liable again under 147. So all these provisions will come. So it's essential for us to understand in depth these four sections 184, 5, 6 uh, and 8. So moving on to this, the same thing is given here also anyway. Now the thing is uh, if I am checking section 185. 185 says loans to directors are completely prohibited. So that is one part of the story. Then there is 186 also. There, then there is 179 3F also. Three different sections are there. 185 gives a complete prohibition of loans to directors. But let us essentially try to understand what used to happen that public money rather than being uh, pumped into business, what was happening was they were giving loans to directors any random directors. Earlier it was allowed, but later it was plugged uh, in, you know, 2013. And apart from this, they also used to give it to their relatives also. If not directly, they used to give it to their relatives. So that relatives also was plugged by inserting the word directly or indirectly in 1960. And then what people tried to do from 1956 to 2013 was they used to sell goods on credit. They used to sell goods on credit. Can you just close the door? is to sell goods on credit and then the goods on credit who is to sell company to whom to the directors and director used to sell those goods and then eventually whatever money he got used to use that money and then pay back to the company this was like an indirect loan this also was curbed this also was curbed because in 2013 they have inserted the word book debt so we have loan guarantee security and book debt now so in 2013, what is the essential breakup of 185 would be? 185 applies to both private company and public company. What are the things that are covered? Loan, guarantee, security and book debt. Loan, guarantee, security and book debt. Four things are covered. L, G, S and B, D. Loan, guarantee, security, book debt. To whom? Who all it is covered? Directors and interested party. Directors and interested party. So essentially we need to understand who exactly is a interested party. Right. So, to whom? Directors. Now, this is completely banned. But again, in 2017, the section was changed. And as it stands today, it is broken down further into this 185.1. So, there was an entire list actually in 2013. To that entire list, they said everything is prohibited. Then in 2017, 18, that is 2017 Amendment Act, they said, no, let's split this into three parts. This became 185 subsection 1, this became 185 subsection 2 and the third one became 185 subsection 3. Now, as it stands today, 185 1 is prohibited, 185 2 is restricted and 185 3 is where 185 is not applicable itself, which means you can definitely give a loan to such parties. This is loan given by the company. Mind you, loan given by the company, not loan given to the company. That to the company becomes borrowing. It is loan given by the company, right? So, loan, guarantee, security and book debt, uh, directors, interested party. So, 185.1 is a complete prohibition. 185.2 is restriction. What is the restriction here? Restriction is you have to pass a special resolution and whatever money you are giving to the people covered under 185.2, they should only be using it for the principal business activity and full detailed explanatory statement should be given as to why the loan is being granted. So basically 185.1 completely prohibited, 185.2 is restricted, 185.3 is where the entire section is not applicable. So now comes the interpretation in the exam, what to do, how to do. Before that, we'll just see what do you mean by a loan? Loan has not been defined anywhere, but nevertheless, many Supreme Court judgments have told that loan is where there obviously what, whatever you give can be in cash or kind. Whatever you give can be in cash or kind. Second, there obviously will be a borrower lender relationship with or without interest. 
interest is separate with or without interest and fourth most important thing the return the return should only be in cash the return should only be in cash right so when you give it can be both cash or kind then with or without interest there should be an agreement of course and when you return it it should only be purely in cash so i can give my uh, i can give money i can give my two wheeler also as a loan but when i am taking it back it should only be in cash on the other hand if i give you cash and take back your two wheeler that is not a loan that is recovery of a loan so these are the four elements guarantee is something which is uh, you know uh, not supported by any mortgage it is purely based on your uh, what do you say financial ability financial strength so if i go uh, to a bank and tell narayan murthy is my uncle just saying and then they'll say give me a letter from narayan murthy saying that he is your relative and he will stand guarantee so narayan murthy gives a letter on my behalf saying that i stand guarantee for this guy if this fellow doesn't pay then i'll pay now is it needed for me to take some uh, building or anything owned by narayan murthy as a security not needed because his uh, what do you say reputation precedes everything so that is the called as guarantee so basically the company is now giving guarantee that is one part of it second is security security is always supported by mortgage uh, mortgage is generally for immovable property right that's all it is then whereas there are other terms also uh, that can be pledge of goods that can be hypothecation etc so those are the other areas also pledge of course is a bailment uh, bailment is where you transfer the possession of the goods so that's what it is so ownership problems will come uh, recently if you see uh, three days ago dish tv problem has happened so i just released a video yesterday i was found it very interesting so yes in that also the entire area was what say because of sale of shares only we did not know who is the owner whether yes bank is the owner or dish tv is the owner so that issues will come unfortunately so in that case the dish tv had given had pledged the shares for a 5000 crore loan now ultimately after the loan obviously is defaulted who owns the shares was a problem in the agreement it was a problem that's the reason why here they have given the word not pledged they have given the word security so security is obviously by mortgage so then of course we have <coughs> concept of book debt now book debt is a loan represented by book debt not a genuine book debt so even the law clearly says it is loan represented by book debt so all these things should be taken into consideration anyway now in the exam if they ask a question as to what will apply uh, we need to be very smart that's why if you see this particular chart 185 is complete prohibition of uh, loans to directors 186 also says you can give loan guarantee security to a person earlier 186 only spoke about inter corporate loans and advances but now not only inter corporate they have also inserted the word person person can be anybody so 186 will also cover loan guarantee security to person and uh, board meeting resolution plus special resolution is needed now the question will arise whether whatever i cannot do under 185 can i do it under 186 so i will try to interpret that then there's one more residuary section which we saw yesterday 179 3f that is giving loans via board meeting resolution but in this case i can also delegate it to managing director so can i say that loans to directors can be delegated to managing director so which means can managing director give the loan to himself all these questions will arise so if we want to interpret these two it is very clear that this is a more restrictive section so of the two this is more restrictive so i'll have to follow 186 on the other hand if i am uh, interpreting these two that is uh, 185 and 186 again there will be an issue as to what will apply so we cannot harmonize generally so best way in the examination to check is you need to check this first you see the question and you have to understand whether uh, whatever they have given comes under 1851 so basically we need to do the list list you have to remember obviously 1851 whether it applies or not we need to see first so if any of those provisions come under 1851 then what is it it is called prohibited it is of course prohibited if 1851 will not apply then obviously i have to check the next list that is 1852 1852 is actually uh, only body corporate and private company this talks about individuals and firms we will see the list 1852 is body corporate and Uh, private company so next i have to go to 1852 if anything they ask with respect to body corporate or private company we can directly go to 1852 if they ask anything about individuals and firms we can go to 
Then if 185 1 is also not there, 185 2 is also not there, then I have to go to 185 3. There are two three pointers in 185 3. We have to see whether it applies or not. If it applies, good. Otherwise, wherever 185 it 185 3, it says 185 3, 185 is not applicable, which means obviously it goes to 186. Under 186, you have to pass a board meeting resolution and in some cases special resolution. Now, if nothing comes under 186, only then it goes to the residuary section 179.3. For instance, in 186, there is a section called 186.11. That subsection says for this entire area, whatever I am going to discuss now in 186.11, 186 will not apply. Which means what will apply for those areas? 179.3. 179.3. For example, investment made by investment company. The obviously, 186, I cannot take, keep taking board meeting resolution every time. So, I can go to 179.3. So, this has to be taken only as a residuary section. Mind you, in the exam, they will never give you section number. They will say in the light of Companies Act. So, we need to figure out which section will come. So, this is the test in the exam that we need to follow. 185.1, then go to 185.2, then 185.3, 186, then 179.3. Very, very simple. So, this uh, section 185, I have broken it down. Yes, section covers loan guarantee security given by the company not received because received will be under borrowings 179.3D and 181C it will come. Mind you, that is why we have not done 180 yesterday because we have to do it today after we finish all these things. And remember, even quorum is pending. Loan to have the following four elements, amount as I told you in money or kind, borrower, agreement to repay. Return in cash with or without interest. We have already discussed guarantee is not supported by mortgage, security supported by mortgage. Subsection 1 prohibits loan, guarantee, security, other things. Now, who are the people covered in 185.1? This is the list. Director of the lending company or its holding company, point number 1. Relative of any such director, point number 2. Partner of any such director, point number 3. To any firm in which such director or relative is a partner, point number 4. These are the four things that we have to keep in mind. So, let us see that. When I say director of the lending company or the holding company, if I take the structure of X, Y, Z, X has around 10 directors, Y has 5 directors, Z has 2 directors. Now, I am checking 185 for which company? Y limited only. You are the legal uh, head of Y limited or you are the auditor of Y limited. Now, loan given by Y limited to how many directors are covered? Is it uh, 10 only? 10 plus 5, 15. 10 plus 5 plus 2, 17. Or 5 plus 2, 7. So, basically, if you see the wordings, director of the lending company or its holding company. Lending company will be this. Holding company will be this. So, loans given to, loans guarantee security given to 10 plus 5. 15 directors are prohibited. Loan guarantee security given to 15 directors are prohibited. Which means, can I give loan guarantee security to two directors? Yes, because subsidiary company directors can never control the holding company. Correct? They cannot force the holding company. The, the you know, uh, this Y limited can give it to the directors of the subsidiary company. Whereas, on the other hand, Y limited can be controlled by these 10 directors, right? Y limited can be controlled by these 10 directors. Anytime they can control. So, that is the reason why they have clearly told that Y limited giving loan to 10 directors and 15 directors only gets covered under the prohibition of 185. On the other hand, Y limited can definitely give loan to 2 directors of Z limited provided they are not common directors. When I say cross, it means 185 will not apply. Then which will apply? Obviously, 186 will apply. It is not that you can give uh, without any restrictions. The restrictive clauses under 186 will definitely apply. We need to take board meeting resolution. It must be unanimous and if it increases the limit, you have to pass, what do you say, prior special resolution, all those things. Anyway, so this is the ultimate thing. 10 plus 5 directors, overall 15 directors, loan, guarantee, security. Clear? Done. So, this is first one, director of lending company or its holding company. We have to remember this list. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, if I call up and ask you, you should tell. Even one month later, you should tell. Even after your exams, you should be able to tell. That is how important this is. Because this list, honestly, will lead us to 188 list. 188 list will lead us to uh, related party list of in IBC also. So, this list is the base, honestly speaking. So, it is very, very important. 
डायरेक्टर ऑफ द लेंडिंग कंपनी और इट्स होल्डिंग कंपनी नेक्स्ट वर्ड इज रिलेटिव ऑफ सच डायरेक्टर सो वाई लिमिटेड सेम इफ आई टेक वाई लिमिटेड इन एज एन एग्जाम्पल इफ दे गिव लोन गारंटी सिक्योरिटी टू अ रिलेटिव ऑफ एक्स हु इन टर्न गिवस लोन टू द डायरेक्टर एक्स सो बेसिकली इन सर्ट ऑफ गिविंग इट टू डायरेक्टर आई एम राउटिंग इट थ्रू रिलेटिव नॉट अ लोड इट इज नॉट अ लोड सो इफ यू सी अगेन रिलेटिव लिस्ट इज गिवन हियर ओनली सो दिस हियर रिलेटिव सो पर्सन प्लस पर्सन स्पाउस फादर मदर brother sister son and son's wife daughter and daughter's husband that's all this is as per 2 clause 77 of companies act apart from that there is also one more thing that is uh, you have your you know members of the hindu undivided family members of hf are also relative and then you have parents then siblings then your uh, children and children's spouses that's it so if you see brother in law not covered sister in law not covered correct brother in law sister in law not covered grandparents not covered grandchildren not covered right it is just this list nothing else none of the spouses side covered spouse covering only is a big thing as per mca none of the other people are covered father in law mother in law not covered so person plus spouse that's it and uh, yes that's it parents and uh, this thing the reverse relationships are also not covered for example in auditing Uh, if your relative is a director, can you become an auditor? No, right. For example, if your father-in-law is a director of a company, can you become an auditor? You should see from father-in-law's point of view or your point of view. You are the auditor because father from father for father-in-law, you are the son-in-law. Son-in-law is covered. Son-in-law or daughter-in-law that is covered here. But from your point of view, none of this spouse's side is covered, right? So your father-in-law or mother-in-law would not be a relative as per Companies Act. so though i mean uh, uh, ca act tells something else that that you leave let's say wherever independence get getting affected you should not go at that's what they say but i'm telling here of course you cannot enter into i mean uh, here as per companies act strictly you can actually become a auditor of a company in which your father in law happens to be the director because in relate in the relative definition none of the spouses side are covered so re reverse relationships are not covered only you have to see from the point of view of this person only not the reverse relationships so that is regarding that so basically you have a uh, uh, direct of the lending company holding company point number 1 second one is relative of the director point number 2 third one is partner of the director partner of the director so if y limited with xyz as directors in which director x is there let's say i give loan guarantee security to x p j for in which the you know, there is a firm called firm xpj of which xpj are partners obviously giving loan to x is prohibited what about giving loan to p and j also partners of the director that is also banned that is also prohibited the next question is why limited can it give it to the firm that is anyway covered in the next point so point number 1 is what director of the lending company or holding company point number 2 relative of such director Point number three, partner of such director. Okay, partner I'll give. That is point number one. What about the firm? Firm is covered in the next point. So all four people anyway are prohibited. You cannot give loan to all these people. So if you understand, one eighty five one only covers individuals and partnership firms. Individuals and partnership firm. One eighty five two covers bodies corporate. One eighty five two covers bodies corporate. Right. So it only covers individual and partnership firm. So one. two and partner of such director three yes now the question here is partner or director here we saw this uh, entire list no 10 and 5 but i am only talking about the lending company relative of the director partner of the director i should see relative or partner of these five directors or 15 directors is the question should i see five directors or 15 directors 15 directors because law uses the word such of which company partner or relative or director of which company such so it says relative of partner of such director relative of such director so there are many supreme court judgments one of which is uh, ambalika das hulsia shaw which says when the word such precedes a noun right an adjective precedes a noun then obviously what you have to see is the uh, 
it will cover the preceding part of the sentence so when i say partner of such director when i say relative of such director it will cover the preceding part of the sentence preceding part of the sentence is this director of the lending company or holding company relative of such director which director director of lending or holding partner of such director which director director of lending or holding that's how we need to look at it so not only should i see uh, what do you say now if you see here there are nine relationships if you just count this it can be plus or minus obviously 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 uh suppose we forgot nine totally nine so there are nine relationships so nine relationships means what not just 5 into 9 it is 10 plus 5 15 into 9 obviously it can be plus or minus 135 relationships we have to see in auditing which we already saw right yes well we do a, we, do, we do the audit we have to see all these things and all these reporting requirements will come where in caro you also know we also know how we finish audit report especially caro you will go for signing that boss will say bro caro is not there so two minutes i'll come Maggie noodles. Two minutes. So we'll go to the. We'll find some old car report. Control F. Find that company. Replace it with this company name. Print. That's the problem. That's why there are penal provisions and an entire guidance note on caro, which was released by Institute again recently. And <coughs> in the last uh, like two three years, I've given at least fifteen to twenty talks only on on loans to directors because that's a highly ig ignored area even in practice. So that is why uh, it's important for us to study this even from the examination point of view as well. So 10 plus 5, uh, 135 relationships we have to give guys. We have to see, and then apart from that, relative done. Then uh, partner, partner also same thing. Partner of such director. So basically, such director means what? All the 15 directors. Now my next question was, can I give it to this firm? So for firm, there's an interesting thing. For firm, we have to remember the first subject of our CA final, FR. for a firm relative is also covered fr for a firm relative is covered so any firm in which such director such director which director 15 directors or relative of such director means what 135 fellows crazy a firm in which such director or relative is a partner is a partner so for instance for instance why limited is there which has director x it has a firm xpj with xp and j as partners and director x also has a relative mr a mr a also has a firm abc with a b and c as partners with a b and c as partners so the issue is very simple can i give loan guarantee security to firm xpj no prohibited can i give loan to x no prohibited can i give loan guarantee security to p and j no prohibited can i give loan guarantee security to firm abc no prohibited because it's a firm in which such director or relative is a partner on the other hand can i give uh, what do you say loan to mr a no why because is relative of director can i give loan guarantee security to b and c answer is yes law cannot provide for extreme circumstances you cannot say sir it's cheating all that should be added first i'll tell first this much we'll do in the in auditing well at least let's cover this much then we'll go to other things so friends then this uh, what do you say uh, best friend giving loan to best friend all this you what is a best friend what's the definition right we don't know so that's why all these are not covered and even this this is what partner of the relative of the director all these things are not prohibited but nevertheless i cannot say these are freely allowed they are restricted how under 186 that's how see 1851 first we check is it there in 1851 no is it there in 1852 no because i'm giving it to individuals 1852 doesn't cover individuals only then will it come under 1853 even if it comes under 1853 all 1853 provisions will anyway go to 186 so next one is 186 only so this will have to go to 186 so loan given by company to loan given by company to the partner of the relative of the director partner of the relative of the director right will not be covered under the prohibitory clause of 185 it will now go to 186 very simple so this was the entire thing with respect to 1851 again revision first one answer director of the lending company holding company second relative of such director third partner of such director fourth one fr a firm in which direct the, the director or relative 
is a partner. That's it. So that is with respect to 185.1. Now moving on to 185.2. Again in 185.1, there is also uh, they speak about what loan guarantee security. Loan guarantee security. Loan guarantee security. So here the interesting part is there can be four scenarios. If you see, uh, company gives a guarantee or security to a specified person. Specified person means that person covered under 185.1 or 185.2 for that matter. who in turn gives a loan to a specified person who in turn gives a loan to a specified person so basically specified person means anybody covered so basically company gives guarantee or security to a director who in turn gives loan to one more director so obviously it is prohibited company cannot give guarantee or security to any specified person second one company gives guarantee or security to a person for example this person is not covered under 185 list for example bank i am a director i go to a bank i say i want 1 crore loan bank says okay i'll give you why don't you take in your personal capacity i don't have any security so then they'll say okay do one thing get the security from the uh, your company your company is doing well get the security from the company so guarantee or security is given by whom by my company and the loan is given by bank to me now this is obviously prohibited definitely prohibited because the very simple logic if you want a loan offer your personal security take a loan when you cannot get a loan directly how dare you get the loan indirectly through other people that is through especially your company not a lot so this is also prohibited interesting thing to note guys is the crux of the story is there has to be a loan so if a director let's say selling some goods in his individual capacity and he will go to a uh, what do you say uh, person and buyer and say look i'm going to supply the goods to you and the buyer says i trust you but i still don't trust you you also you have been given permission to do it in your individual capacity selling of goods but you also have a company they also sell goods similar goods do one thing please get a guarantee from them for and what is that called performance guarantee so the company will give a performance guarantee to the prospective buyer and company has given you permission as a director to do it in your individual capacity many thing happen many things happen where this load you cannot take small small orders will be handled by director himself so in his individual capacity he also has the same business so no problem so in that case performance guarantee is given by whom company performance guarantee is given by whom company and uh, who is i mean entering into a contract director now is this allowed i mean is this prohibited under 185 no because the section does not talk anything about performance guarantee guarantee against sub advance supply of goods nothing it only talks about what loan so the crux should be the loan and then also the last one is important the last column loan must be taken by whom loan must be taken by whom should the loan be taken by any person or who is the question so to understand that this is the thing that you need to understand in the examination if they give any question on guarantee or security you need to break it down into five parts part number 1 company should actually give a guarantee or security what they should give guarantee or security who is the giver company it's not that low guarantee security is given to the company no guarantee security is given by the company so point number 1 guarantee security is given by the company Point number two, what they have given guarantee or security. Point number three, it doesn't matter to who the guarantee or security is given to. I don't care. The third part is really immaterial. It can give to a bank, it can give to some random person, it can give to a specified person. Doesn't matter. Fourth one, it should be a loan only. Performance guarantee, advance uh, for supply of goods, etc. No, it should only be a loan. last important thing is it should be given to a person covered in 185 to a person covered in 185 so strangely if the company gives guarantee or security to a director and director has in turn given loan to his best friend it is outside the purview of section 185 why friend is not covered in 185 his company covered okay guarantee security yes director i don't care third one is i don't care it can be anybody it can be anybody i don't care about this fourth one is it a loan yes lastly it should actually be a person covered and in 185 so though you may feel this is cheating how is it possible and all that it is not covered 
law cannot provide for extreme circumstances otherwise there is no end to it so that's the reason why this is outside the purview of 185 so if these transactions where will it go i'll again have to see 186 because 186 speaks about loan guarantee security given to any person any person in connection with loan given to any person so it will anyway get covered there so i am not saying it's a free flow you can do whatever you want but of course there are certain uh, you know plugging of the loopholes to some extent so this is the uh, security test so basically there are four again i repeat loan guarantee security to any of these people are prohibited director of the lending company or the holding company relative of such director partner of such director firm in which such director or relative is a partner very simple and lgs uh, and bd that is bd is loan represented by book debt and this test is also very important company should give guarantee or security third one any uh, to a bank also anybody in connection with the loan given to any other person now for example company gives guarantee or security to the employees of the company or uh, to the bank rather to the bank bank in turn gives loan to employees of the company is it covered under 185 no because employees are not covered under 185 unless the director is an employee unless the director is an employee that is a different thing altogether so like that we need to see in each and every concept what is there so if employee is covered then i automatically will go to 186 and there i need to see whether employment is there or not there if employee is not covered there also then obviously it's a duty section 17913 now 1852 on the other hand talks about private company and body corporate first to a private company in which director is a director or member so here pnr is the thing that you whenever you go on a train or a flight pnr pnr is what private company relative is not covered thankfully no relative private company no relative private company in which such director is a director or member such director is a director or member now there is one concept here such director if you see as i told you earlier the entire thing was there full list was prohibited and the starting of the sentence was director of the lending company or the holding company which means those 15 directors then everywhere when you use the word such 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 it all boiled down to what this 15 15 directors now what has happened is this, they have split this they have split this into three parts as i told you first part okay they have given the dialogue director of the lending company or the holding company then they use the word relative of such partner of such then everywhere such so then you can easily go to 15 but when they have already broken the section and they have made it into subsection 2 here 1852 1852 says what private company in which the director such director is a director or member now this such director will be only lending company or the 15 companies ideally speaking i mean the thing is in the olden the, this thing the old law then it would have been 15 now here it's open to interpretation technically speaking it should only be lending company but then institute also has taken like a conservative interpretation so you should take it as all 15 though it is obviously well interpretation it's wrong because it's split into two subsections right but nevertheless the institute has always taken it the same way institute has not considered that they have actually split it so you also i mean they'll not give that in depth question but if at all they ask just remember that such director should be seen from the entire section per se though technically you cannot use that but yeah if at all they ask in the exam take that into account that not only the lending company but also the holding company just to be on the safer side institute always takes the most conservative interpretation we saw that in dormant company yesterday dormant public company they have excluded in 20 but included in 10 so that like that so a private company in which such director is a director or member means what so if you see this particular thing why limited who has director x they have two private limited in which mr x is a member and in which mr x is a director so loan guarantee security given to p private limited in which director is a director loan guarantee security given to j private limited in which director is a member this is not prohibited what this is restricted so which means three things one explanatory statement so then it is principal business activity third one special resolution special resolution these are the three things that we have to do so i can give no problem in which such director is a director or member relative is not covered 
So let's suppose there is this relative of X, Mr. A, who, what do you say, is a member of R Private Limited or a director of Q Private Limited. And the company gives loan guarantee security to such a company in which the director is a, I mean, in, in which the relative of the director is a director, in which the relative of a director is a member. Q private limited or private limited. In this particular thing, 185.2 will not apply. 185.2 will not apply. What will apply? 186, that's all very simple. 186. 185.2 will not apply. 186 will apply. 185.2 will not apply, 185.6 will apply, very very simple. Any private company in which such director is a director or member. So this is a restrictive clause. Second one, to any body corporate in which 25% or more, 25% or more of the total voting power, total voting power. is what? Equity capital. Is exercised or controlled by one or more such directors. One or more such directors again they have given. So if you see here, the lending company Y and the holding company, all directors put together. In my example, there are 15 directors. Those 15 directors, so first of all, Y limited lending company has given loan guarantee security to a body corporate. What is a body corporate? Body corporate includes a foreign company. Body corporate is anything which has a separate legal entity. Right? So, body corporate means what examples? Private company, public company, statutory corporations, uh, foreign companies, limited liability partnerships, nationalized banks, financial institutions, all these things are called examples of bodies corporate. Right? So, why limited is giving loan guarantee security to a body corporate in which those 15 directors, the, not the company mind you, directors are controlling how much? 25% of the voting power. 25% of the voting power. So control shall include the right to appoint majority of the directors and all those things. So basically, if I control the show here, and mind you, not the company guys, but the directors. Directors should control 25% of the body corporate. So then obviously, this also for this, now this particular loan guaranteed security transaction, three conditions again, explanatory statement, special resolution, principal business activity. Since they have used principal business activity, it cannot be an individual, 185.2 only covers body corporate and private company, whereas the firm etc. is covered in the previous point. So the 185.1 is 4 points, 185.2 is 3 points. Third one, any body corporate in which the board of directors is accustomed to act, correct? So, Y Limited gives loan guarantee security to the body corporate and this body corporate, the board of directors, managing director, etc. of this body corporate, body corporate again is the same thing, this body corporate is accustomed to act according to the directions or instructions of the directors of the lending companies clearly they have mentioned there no such director here they have clearly mentioned directors of the lending company in the act itself they have mentioned directors of the lending company so here x limited directors are not concerned at all so in my example those five directors of y limited if they control the show which means if these five directors are shadow directors shadow directors of this body corporate and basically the board of directors and managing directors are accustomed to act, accustomed to act. The most uh, important practical example is recently if you've seen NSC CEO, right, was actually, the, what do you say, accustomed to act according to the instructions of a Himalayan yogi, Mr. Subramaniam, in the end they came to know, right. So basically there were email exchanges. All are important decisions she took based on the Himalayan Yogi. Think about it. So in my previous classes, I always used to tell that in India, there is a lot of control about of this, you know, held by these Babas and Yogis. It's true. Classic example, we saw the practical example, NSC CEO, guys. So think about it, right? They are controlled by a imaginary, you know, Himalayan Yogi used to obviously send emails as to what exactly to do. So confidential information was being shared. 
So if you think about it, the board of directors and or MD of that particular body corporate was accustomed to act by whom? By the instructions of some other person. And now that some other person is a shadow director. So even in such cases, now it's difficult to prove all these things, though there it was proven. But yes, nevertheless, so in this case also what happens, principal business activity, explanatory statement and then special resolution. That is what we need to look at it. So this uh, completes 185.1 and 185.2. 185.1 list again, director of the lending or the holding, partner of such director, relative of such director, then FR, a firm in which such director or relative is a partner. So in those cases, complete prohibition. 185.2, it's a restriction. So we have private company in which director is a director or member. Second, body corporate in which 25 percent is exercised or controlled by such directors. Lastly, body corporate in which the BOD of that uh, particular, you know, uh, uh, board or the uh, managing director of the body corporate is accustomed to act according to the directions or instructions of the directors of not such of the lending company. Very simple. That's all. That is regarding that. Then moving on to 185.3, uh, but before that, some other things. What if I give loan to a Hindu undivided family? Is Hindu undivided family covered under, what do you say, uh, relative? No, members of HUF are covered, not HUF itself, right? So loans or advances given to a trust in which the directors are trustees or HUF in which the directors are karta or member are not covered. It cannot be called as indirect loans. Members of HUF are relatives, not HUF itself. So lo loan given to a HUF is not covered. So in this area, what covers then? In that case, it will go to 186. Because 186 uses the word person. That person will include any person. Right? So if you do not, it's not covered under 185, it goes to 186. Next, what about, uh, again, important area is traveling, traveling advances, conveyance advance, loan advance, etc. So for example, if... Uh, Husband and wife are working in the company. Wife is the director. Husband is the accountant. Loan given by the company to the accountant who happens to be the husband of the director, who happens to be the relative of the director. Is it just because you're a relative? Should I ban the loans is the question. So a landmark judgment, MR Electronic Components Limited case. So they said you have to see the facts of the case to decide whether it is true or not. What is the facts of the case? They said that whether the beneficiary, that is husband in my example, is he a bona fide employee? Means is he an employee on paper or is he actually an employee? Whether the advance falls in the general scheme of advances given by the company to other employees. Will all other employees in the same uh, pay scale, will they get the same amount or only for this guy special they have given? Whether the amount paid is proportionate or disproportionate to the salary? Amount whatever is paid to him, whether it's proportionate or is it disproportionate, basically salary some 30,000, he's got a loan of 3 crore, disproportionate, right? So I need to check all that. And what about repayment? I have, have they been paying interest on time? Was there any laxity in the recovery of advance? Means the company is not bothered about recovery. They have given the loan, they have not taken any steps towards recovery. And also in auditing, you can write 143.1 enquiry points. Remember 143.1 inquiry, an auditor has to inquire whether the loans and advances given are prejudicial to the interest and then report accordingly. So you can link paper 3 there. And what is the capacity of the person receiving the advance? What is the capacity of the person receiving the advance? Is he an actual employee and all those things I need to check. So that is that part of it. Travelling advance, conveyance advance, etc. So just because you are a relative of the director doesn't mean that you should not get a loan unless you prove all these things is what they say. Uh, what about loan and uh, debt? So if I am, for example, a director of a very big construction company, real estate company, uh, which obviously uh, constructs houses and sells, and because I am a director, I've, uh, they have given me a huge apartment, 10 crore. I have already paid 5 crore. Remaining, that they are deducting from my salary. Now, is this loan represented by book debt is the question. Because for the real estate company, the house obviously would be a stock. So, is it a loan represented by book debt? So, again, we have to see one more important case law which we have to remember. Freddie Adirshar Mehta versus Union of India. Right? Very important case law we have to remember. So, here they say, here the company sells a flat to one of its directors and receives half the price in cash and balance in installments. Transaction amounts to a credit sale. It does not amount to indirect loan. The word indirect cannot be read as converting what is not a loan into a loan. But mind you, this case law was in 1991 when book debt concept was not there. 
that's why we need to modify the answer slightly and write the fourth point if it is found that it is a loan represented by a book debt means he actually doesn't deserve to get a loan of 10 crore he doesn't have that credibility then obviously it will become a loan represented by book debt so then it will attract 185 so this is a modified answer only the fourth point is what we need to see now the company gives loan to some random person and that random person becomes the relative of the director tomorrow that has happened many times so that will it cover or not so the company gives a loan to some random person and the director marries that person tomorrow basically the company gives loan to director's fiance what do you think so will it cover or you the company gives loan to some random person that random person becomes a director tomorrow so yes you have to see it only at the point of giving the loan so that is point number 4 the manager secretary employee are subsequently appointed as directors the section will not apply since the applicability of the section has to be seen only on the transaction date alone only on the transaction date alone only on the transaction date so 185 obviously will not apply to all these say these are some hidden points in section 185 moving on 185 will not apply to now this again is 185 3 This is one eighty five three basically. Point number five is one eighty five three. Managing director, whole time director. If you see, if the company gives, if the company gives loan. So, for instance, let us just check that one example. so let us say the y limited with which uh, xyz are directors gives guarantee or security to a bank and bank is giving loan to mr x who is an md under 18533 loan given to md is what do you say 185 will not apply means what for such people 186 would apply right so in this example where y limited gives guarantee or security to a bank and bank is now giving loan to the managing director so that fellow has gone to the bank in individual capacity and same thing bank has told okay get a guarantee security from your company so in this part of the thing they say that generally as per 1853 it says loan to managing director is not covered under uh, 185 provided it is part of the conditions of service conditions of service means at the point of employment itself i am giving this benefit to him or let us assume that it is not there in the conditions of service they say you have to create a scheme a special scheme for this loan to md and then pass a special resolution approving that scheme so 185 says either of the two should be there either it should be part of the conditions of service or there should be a scheme with a special resolution if both of the things are there if either of the things are there then you can go ahead and give a loan to managing director now in this example Y Limited gives guarantee or security to a bank. Bank in turn gives loan to Mr. X, who is an MD. Special resol. Uh, let's say conditions of service are silent. Special resolution is passed by the company. Would that be valid or this is also prohibited? Would that be valid or prohibited? So this question has not been asked in the exam. Uh, Any time they can ask you. It is hundred percent invalid because what is exempt or what is not applicable in one eighty five is only loan. in my example it was guarantee or security company directly giving loan to md that is the thing which is exempt company directly giving loan to md is the thing which is exempt nothing else correct so if you see loan given to md slash whole time director is what it is what is what is exempt guarantee or security mind you is not exempt guarantee or security is not exempt so that is one thing as part of the conditions of service so basically loan given to md as part of conditions of service which means an agreement or a scheme created by passing a special resolution 
or a scheme created by passing special resolution these are the things which are uh, where 185 will not apply loan guarantee security provided by finance companies in the ordinary course of its business then also no problem though it does not say finance companies but that's how you need to interpret it in the ordinary course of its business loan guarantee security provided by finance companies in the ordinary course of business nbfcs basically they can give no problem provided government security rate to be followed government security rate whatever closes to the tenure one year three year that has to be used loan given by nidhi company to its director in the capacity of a member so nidhi company director can take loan from the nidhi company in the capacity of a member that is allowed loan by government company if the concerned ministry approval is obtained all these are certain uh, things where 185 will not apply so for these things obviously have to go to 186 and also this is very very important Uh, recently asked many times and before that also they used to ask will it apply to loan given by a private company what do you think loan given by private company so can a private company give loans to directors so there was a notification on 5th june many many notifications came on 5th june so 185 applies to both private and public we have already seen so loan given even by private company to its directors are prohibited but there is a small relaxation in 2015 which they gave an exemption they said 185 shall not apply to a private company if all the three conditions are satisfied all the three conditions are satisfied first in whose share capital no body corporate has invested any money means what a private company can definitely give loan to directors if no other body corporate should have invested in that private company which means it should not be used as a tool of investment it should be a pure private company nobody else should have invested in that particular company self generated funds second of course that is one part of it no other body corporate should have invested point number 2 of course this private company can uh, borrow money from banks etc no problem if the borrowings of such a company from banks financial institutions and other bodies corporate is less than two times the puc or less than 50 crore whichever is less right if the borrowings of such a company from banks or financial institutions or other bodies corporate is less than two times the paid up capital of the company or less than 50 crores whichever is less so let us say if the borrowing they have taken is around or let's say the paid up capital is uh, 20 crore so two times paid up capital is 40 crore 40 crore or 50 crore whichever is less 40 crore now this 40 crore i have to compare with the borrowing the borrowing that i have taken let's say is just around 10 crore so obviously the borrowing is very much less than two times paid up capital then no problem i can go ahead and give a loan so first in order for me to give a loan i need to see how much i have borrowed first of all i should not have given my shares no in whose share capital no body corporate should have invested but without giving away my ownership i can definitely borrow money from others borrowing is allowed borrowing can be from banks financial institutions or other bodies corporate no problem but that borrowing also should be what less than two times paid up share capital or less than 50 crore so first i have to compute this take the paid up capital double it and 50 crore whichever is less 40 crore then compare this with the borrowing if borrowing in my example is 10 crore no problem 10 crore is less than 40 crore no no problem if the second condition is uh, what do you say followed or adhered to then only the third condition comes third condition is linked to the second condition in the second condition itself the loan that i have taken is 50 crore So 50 crore is more than 40 crore. That's that's all prohibited. That private company cannot give loan. Only if the second condition is adhered to, means what? The borrowing must be less than two times PUC, or the borrowing must be less than 50 crore, whichever is less. Only then the third condition will come. Third condition is what? Let us assume the borrowing is 10 crore. Two times paid up capital is forty crore. Yes, the borrowing is very much lesser than what two times paid up capital. So no problem. But third condition again, such a company has no default in 
repayment of such borrowings the 10 crore borrowing also i am repaying on time the 10 crore which i have borrowed from banks financial institutions etc i am repaying it on time as on the date of giving the loan as on the date of giving the loan to director i should also see whether i have been repaying everybody on time it makes sense because i will not repay the banking company i will not repay the body corporate but that using that money i am giving a loan to somebody else how is that allowed so the third condition will only apply if the second condition is fulfilled what is the third condition the second condition is borrowing should be less than two times puc or 50 crore whichever is less third condition such a company has no default in repayment the third condition will apply only if the second condition is adhered to very simple so if the second condition only the borrowing is breaching the limit then there is no point going to the third condition right that's how it is that's all there is to it and apart from that one more thing this is also very very important is it exempt what holding company giving to subsidiary loan guarantee security is it exempt yes so if you see holding company giving loan to a wholly owned subsidiary wholly owned subsidiary 185 will not come so i'll have to go to 186 185 will not come i need to check 186 we'll see that later when we see 186 second holding company giving guarantee or security to anybody this is not given it can be anybody bank financial institution normal money lender uh, a venture capitalist an investor anybody who in turn gives a loan to a wholly owned subsidiary 185 is not applicable 186 i need to see third one holding company giving guarantee or security to a bank or financial institution here they have clearly given bank or financial institution which in turn has given a loan to not wholly owned guys here subsidiary word is used to a subsidiary so two extra things here bank or financial institution then subsidiary bank or financial institution then subsidiary is covered so your holding wholly owned loan holding company guarantee security to anyone who in turn gives loan to wholly owned subsidiary your guarantee or security to a bank or financial institution which in turn gives a loan to a subsidiary so these two things are extra done so this is what it is so of course this procedure you can uh, go through it's very simple there done so that is regarding 185 very simple provision but everything we have covered whatever is important uh, again split it into 185 1 185 2 185 3 185 3 has peculiar things like what this uh, md then finance companies holding subsidiary relationships and all are covered 185 1 has only four items that is direct of the lending or the holding relative of such director partner of such director lastly fr a firm in which the director or relative is a partner 185 2 has only three items one a private company pnr private company in which the director is a director or member then body corporate 25 percent then body corporate accustomed to act that's all then 185 3 has all these people so if you visualize the section it will of course you know be very easy for you to understand and mind you those small small points are what a 185 only covers what loan given to md or old time director not guarantee or security and of course it should be passed uh, the conditions of service or special resolution all that we have seen now uh, moving on 186 186 is of two types 186 one that is layers of investment companies then 186 two intercorporate loans and advances so layers of investment companies and intercorporate loans and advances so obviously as far as layers of investment companies are there this can be uh, of course read with uh, your section 89 and 90 and can also be read with what do you say 2 clause 87 2 clause 87 a holding company can have maximum how many subsidiary companies two layers of subsidiary companies and these layers are what vertical layers vertical integration only two layers can be there however if the holding company has wholly owned subsidiary one subsidiary two wholly owned subsidiary three then subsidiary four you cannot call it as of as four layers it is only two layers because the rules actually exempt wholly owned subsidiary so basically a holding company can have these many layers on the other hand as far as investment companies are concerned investment companies a holding company can invest through they use the word through 
not more than two layers of investment companies so again investment layer 1 investment layer 2 and the target company so any investment because of lot of uh, what do you say uh, money laundering etc that was happening through various sham companies they have decided that layers of investment companies investment company is a company obviously which invests your money into in the shares of some other company so you cannot use it as a route or a conduit to what do you say invest in various other companies if you can only do it through again two layers there is no bar on uh, you know horizontal integration though right so one holding company can have many subsidiaries like this that doesn't matter and similarly this all came in 2019 so the all the provisions before that are said to have been grandfathered which means like reliance it has some 140 subsidiaries group companies so that's okay no problem only after that whatever happens should be taken into account is what they say that is the simple part about 186.1 but the real crux of the matter would be 186.2 intercorporate loans and advances earlier it was only intercorporate loans and advances now they have also inserted the word person so what is all covered let's see company which company is covered private public private public what are the other things covered here l g s and i loan guarantee security investment loan guarantee security investment loan guarantee security and investment right loan guarantee security investment is covered then what uh, what is the other part loan okay we have discussed guarantee we have discussed security will we have discussed okay now to whom body corporate is covered and this person has been added this person can be anybody other than the body corporate can be an individual you can also take anything huf trust anything can be taken into consideration person has not been defined so anybody other than body corporate can be taken as person so basically if 185 you will not uh, get covered it will obviously get covered under 186 so then investment in the securities of a body corporate okay now what is a senior up to 60 percent of paid up share capital free reserve security premium account up to 60 percent of paid up share capital free reserve security premium this is nothing but the net worth net worth or 100 percent of what free reserves or security premium 100 percent of free reserves or security premium account what will come board meeting resolution board meeting resolution and mind you this board meeting resolution must be unanimous this board meeting resolution must be unanimous means all the people should agree all the people should agree if you see yesterday also we saw one section which one 162 which said that shareholder that's a shareholders meeting there they say what did they say that everyone should vote everybody should vote now for example here also in 186 it says unanimous resolution unanimous resolution so for instance if uh, there are 10 directors and let us say uh, eight directors come to the meeting of which six say yes and uh, two abstain from the meeting abstain from voting two abstain from voting what do you think now has the resolution been passed has the resolution been passed is the question unanimous resolution means there should not be any negative vote or unanimous resolution means everybody should agree everyone present and voting must agree yes in 186 they have used the word with the consent of all the directors who are present and voting which means in 186 even if you abstain it is actually as it is actually treated as no that you have voted against the resolution because of the wordings of the section 186 clearly says that all the directors I mean all the people who are present and voting should say yes without doubt they have to say yes so in that sense of the term what comes is here it appears that abst abstinence should be what considered as a no peculiarly in 162 on the other hand such wordings is not given though both I called it unanimous that strictly unanimous is actually 186 everyone should say yes 162 is actually not unanimous because of the wordings what are the wordings say there in 162 without any vote being cast against it without any vote being cast against it so which means in 162 scenario out of 100 people 80 people say yes 
20 people abstain from voting so i should only take the 80 people into consideration is there any vote against it no so in this case abstinence is treated as abstinence whereas in 186 abstinence is treated as a no so there is a slight difference between 162 and 186 the true what do you say uh the the true sense of the term of this what do you say the uh, uh unanimous is definitely given in 186 so that's what it you know clearly mentions now if i just check the notes once yeah so one interesting thing we need to see uh, investment in the securities of body corporate so in the same we are sticking to the same thing here we have seen all this board meeting resolution fine now if i go beyond this if i go beyond this i have to pass what prior special resolution plus board meeting resolution prior special resolution plus board meeting resolution is what i need to see now this investment in the securities of a body corporate it says investment in the securities of a body corporate so for example if infosys invests in let's say equity shares of you know wipro so what do you think basically i need to see all the three if infosys invests in the equity shares of wipro what does the section say investment in the securities of a body corporate so we'll discuss this second one is if uh, wipro let's say invests in the indian depository receipts of tesla indian depository receipts of tesla third one if tesla invests in the american depository receipts of infosys various examples of infosys then if uh, x limited invests in the capital of p and company which is a partnership firm p and company which is a partnership firm what to do that is what we have to see then if uh, a basic partnership firm through its what do you say uh, partners invests in the equity share capital of x limited then what will come then if x limited invests in the mutual fund units given by r mutual fund which is registered as a trust will the section come same x limited invests in the mutual fund units uh, issued by r private limited which is registered as a company what will come then if z private limited invests in the debentures debentures issued by mn limited what will come then if uh, a limited invests in let us say the government securities government securities issued by the central government some bonds etc then what to do then if x limited invests in the equity shares of hindustan aeronautics limited what to do then if any company j limited under surfacey invests in the security receipt so j limited is a qib qualified institutional buyer so uh, those of you who have taken my 6d have already released the surfacey uh, classes you have already received guys check it out so j limited security receipt uh, they have invested and uh, in in whom in a uh, asset reconstruction company what to do all these things so basically guys examples investment in the securities of a body corporate so first of all the first thing should be a company second should be what security securities as defined in securities contract regulation act third one in what body corporate in body corporate so first of all infosys is a company yes equity shares of course it's a security body corporate wipro yes so obviously 186 will come 186 will come next wipro is a company indian deposit receipts definitely is a security tesla is a body corporate foreign company definitely 186 will apply for tesla is it a company no i'm not talking about tesla bangalore i'm talking about tesla the U tesla incorporated usa so yes is it a body is it a company no that's it when they, even if these two are a yes one is a no means companies act will not apply only for this obviously right Th next company uh, exclaimed yes capital is it a security no 
partnership uh, a firm is definitely not a body corporate because it's not a separate legal entity so here also it is a no so but company companies act will apply to all companies since it is neither a security nor is it it is a body corporate any investments made by the company will now be governed not under 186 but under 1793e 1793 that's why yesterday we didn't do that 179 180 and all that because it's all linked to this so 1793 the ex limited investing in the capital of a partnership uh, uh, firm would not be governed under 186 but will go to which section 1793 next partnership firm anyway is not a company equity share capital through its partners of course ex limited again companies act will not apply ex limited okay mutual fund units yes definitely it's a security in our mutual fund which is run as a trust trust is definitely what do you say is it a body corporate no the, it says investment in the securities of a body corporate it doesn't say investment in a person person includes a trust yes i'll give a break very soon thank you yeah now then start throwing everything now slowly yes i have to have uh, have this back to protect Yes. So if you see uh, our mutual fund trust, now trust is not a body corporate, but trust is a person. But if you see your guys, it doesn't say investment in a person and all, right? Person trust is included in person, mind you, but that is for loan guarantee security. Don't get confused. Investment in person is not covered. Correct? Investment in the securities of a body corporate. So body trust is definitely not a body corporate, right? So. This one, since it is not a body corporate, this will go under which section? One seventy nine three e. One seventy nine three. Next, X Limited invests in the mutual fund units of uh, our private limited. Yes, there it's a body corporate. Definitely one eighty six. Z Private Limited invests in the debentures. Definitely security. M N Limited one eighty six. Easy. A Limited invests in some bonds. Government security definitely is a security. but is central government body corporate no so this will definitely not come here it will come where under 17930 very simple then ex limited invests in equity shares of hindustan aeronautics limited is a government company very much body corporate so 186 lastly j limited which is a qib invest in the security receipts issued by any asset reconstruction company very much part of the deal 186 that's all very simple so with all these examples we are now understood that investment in not a person investment in the securities of a body corporate if all the three conditions should come company security body corporate if all the three conditions tick then 186 even if one is not a tick uh, not ticked off then of course it goes to other sections sometimes companies act will not apply only that is up to this so up to 60% of net worth or 100% of fr plus sp whichever is higher board meeting resolution then beyond sr plus bmr beyond sr plus bmr is what we have already seen then uh yeah that is what it says so what all resolutions are needed unanimous approval also is needed bmr plus unanimous so if the uh, company exceeds the aforesaid limits prior special resolution should be needed now here loan loan does not include obviously debentures and deposits loan does not include debentures and deposits why i am writing this is in the old law that specifically given an explanation saying that loans will include debentures and deposits so that explanation has been removed that's exactly why i have given here loan does not include debentures and deposits but guys debentures fall under securities so it will come under securities so only deposits are not covered is what i am trying to tell then the company giving a guarantee or security obviously will attract this section again to enable them to give a loan guarantee or security should be in connection with the loan again so same thing uh, company gives guarantee or security to any person i don't care who in turn gives a loan to any of these people that is body corporate or a person is what we need to see so it 186 will not attract for performance guarantees and advance or supply of goods etc 186 will not apply to investment in mutual fund run by trust we have seen already investment in made in government securities though covered in securities are not issued by a body corporate we have seen loans and investments in securities of a foreign company will definitely attract we saw that tesla example now 
uh, loan that is PUC FRSP. Now, when should I see this PUC FRSP? That I am giving the loan or LABS? LABS because free reserves definition is LABS. So, I need to see as per latest audited balance sheet. And of course, free reserves do not include what? Capital redemption. If they ask a numerical, a sum for you to solve, you should ensure that these things are not counted in free reserves. It will not include what? Capital redemption reserve, sinking fund, provision for taxation, capital reserve, fixed asset revaluation reserve, all this will not be included. Everything else will come into the picture. Right. So, uh, basically all these things, right, we have to uh, understand that in the exam, if they ask, you always it says the loan guarantee security investment already made plus to be made already made plus to be made so in that sense of the term we have to calculate based on a one two three four principle all examination questions have to be written in this structure only to get full marks to maximize your marks right point number one if they ask anything in the exam and ask you to compute point number one what should you do step number one is you should consider 60 to 100 percent of that limit so Compute everything. 60 or 100 percent of what? First, you have to compute paid up capital, free reserve, security premium. Free reserves and all, they'll give some random things. Kindly exclude these things there. Do not include these uh, items for free reserves. So, paid up capital you take, free reserves you take. Paid up capital means what? Equity share capital plus preference share capital. Free reserves, you know. Security premium account, yes, it's a quasi capital. They would have given directly security premium account. You need to take all that. Then, what will you do? you should do 60% of this. Then what will you do? 100% of only these two. Then compare the two and then you will say, okay, that is a higher of the two. Let's say, for example, it comes up to some 3 crore, assume. Next, LGSI already made. So, in the example, they would have, in the question, sorry, they would have given, what are the loans, guarantee, security, investment that the company has already made? So, of course, you need to take all that into consideration. This will be assumed, let's say, around 2 crore. Step number 3 will be step number 1 and step minus step number 2. That is LGSI that can be made, you know, now. So, that is 3 minus 2. Still now, 1 crore still I can do. Further loan, further guarantee, further security, further investment that I can make, 1 crore. Step number 4, of course, is the proposal. They would have given a proposal in the exam, uh, in the question that the company now intends to make 60 lakhs further investment, 60 lakhs further loan, whatever, like that. So, if 60, I have to see, if the proposal 60 lakhs is less than step number 3, what to do? Or let's say the proposal is 1.5 crore, 1.5 crore is more than 1 crore, what to do? If the proposal 60 lakhs is less than 1 crore, then simple board meeting resolution plus unanimous. If the proposal 1.5 crore is exceeding that limit, then what? Board meeting resolution, prior special resolution and all those things. Mind you, whenever you pass special resolution, you have to pass which one? MGT 14 within 30 days. So, this you have to keep in mind. And one more interesting thing they have told that prior PFI approval also has to, has to be taken. If you have taken a loan from a public financial institution, public financial institution, Exim, SIDB, LIC, UTI, all these companies, if you have taken, then what, what they say is, you, if you have taken a loan from a public financial institution, you need to take their approval. You need to take their approval before you disperse a loan. You are actually, you have borrowed money. Now you want to give loan, not allowed, unless you take their permission. All these public financial institutions, since public money is involved, to some extent, they are extremely conservative. So, the moment you have taken a loan from them, they will never give you permission, obviously. That is why to appease uh, the companies, because and you cannot do a business without borrowing money. You have to borrow money. Without borrowing money, you cannot do business. So, the thing is, uh, they have to uh, have a balancing act now. So, there is one exemption which says that if the LGSI already borrowed and to be borrowed is less than 60 or 100 percent, and you have never made any default in repayment to PFI, then PFI approval not needed. Even though you have taken loan from PFI, it is not needed. To summarize whatever I told, this again chart which is extremely important for the examination, which will seal the deal. What is that? LGSI limits less than 60 or 100. Have you made a default in the loan that you have taken from PFI? If it is a yes, what to do? 
though you have taken the limits lgsi already made plus to be made is less than 60 or 100 but you have committed a default in repayment right prior pfi approval has to be taken plus bmr plus unanimous plus bmr plus unanimous second the lgsi limit is less than 60 or 100% and they have not committed any default no problem only in this case relaxation no pfi approval board meeting resolution unanimous bmr plus unanimous next the lgsi already made plus to be made is more than 60 or 100 in both the cases irrespective of whether there is default or not i don't care same provisions prior pfi approval prior special resolution board meeting resolution unanimous approval and since i am passing special resolution mgt 14 within 30 days so this can also help you in the exam immensely this is the procedure because i'll either ask you the numerical here or they'll ask you this or a combination of both apart from other provisions regularly asked in the examination so this will help you understand what are the approvals that are needed and uh, interest free loan under 186 can never be made that's also a very important point because one of the questions that asked recently that the company gave a loan interest free to its uh, to whoever it is can you give no interest free loan not possible government security rate of interest to be followed so interest free loan not to be taken into account and register to be maintained in mbp2 this will mug up and go then they'll ask in the mcq register to be maintained dash first option eight years answer permanently correct it should be preserved permanently mbp2 must be preserved permanently that is again a hidden point mcq question then if any default is made in the repayment of deposits these are all hidden points if you have made any default in repayment you have taken deposits from public you have not repaid them now you have the audacity to give loans to others so that you will get a higher rate of interest because deposits anyway is useless no it says no no lgsi can be made until default is made good until default is made good so imagine if you default on a deposit from the date of default only what will happen guys 186 will not come 186 not applicable you cannot give any loan guarantee security investment and if the default continues for one year or more what will happen of course 164 2b will come you will be what uh, disqualified for five years five years from one year or five years from this this point five years. five years from this one or four years from effective date of default we have already seen that yesterday that's a combination of those two so no, now this one 17 non-applicability of the section uh, apart from that here one more non-applicability is this there was a lot of problems with respect to employees the employee wanted a loan the company said i cannot give you a loan go to a bank no problem so the employee wanted a housing loan company said don't worry i am a company i will give guarantee or security to the housing finance company no problem housing finance company can disperse all loans to employees employees of this uh, particular company this arrangement was there but unfortunately what used to happen was for every loan i have to take what board meeting resolution special resolution it used to be a very tedious process so based on many many representations made to the ministry they said an amendment has to be made whereby i cannot keep on taking all this bmr sr for all these loans why don't you exempt this particular employment loans only so if you see they have inserted a proviso whereby person does not include employee person does not include employee so now tell me if i give a guarantee or security to a housing finance company which in turn gives a loan to an employee which section will come 179 3f 179 3f 179 3f talks about loans guarantee security given you know in connection with a loan to anybody so that's what i am trying to tell it's a residuary section so if at all they ask this in the exam if you write 186 100 percent zero you will get correct so you have to ensure that this employee is obviously not there and then it comes under 179 3f again i repeat they'll never give you section number they'll only say in the light of companies act explain so you need to figure out which section number so that's why that chart that entire sequence will help you 185 1 185 2 185 3 nothing works 186 
179.3 simple so in that you need to figure out in the exam where did it come so all this should be like mind maps to you constantly read this it's enough more than sufficient yes then moving on yeah apart from that one more point here non applicability of section 186 uh, of, of section 186 is going in 186 11 all points of 186 11 will now go under 179 3 Either it will come under 179.3e or 3f, simple. Because this entire thing is not applicable only. What is not applicable? For these particular points that we are going to discuss now, 186 is not applicable. Right? So, obviously, this section will not apply to loan guarantee security uh, provided by LGSI by banking company. It is the business of banking company obviously to give loans etc. For everything if I have to take BMR unanimous, no, there is no end to it. And if you see in 179.3e, then also board meeting resolution is given guys. But unanimous is not there, thankfully. Board meeting resolution. And moreover, one board me uh, meeting resolution I can pass and I can just delegate it to MD. So if for example this uh, employee thing, the one board they can meet and they can delegate the entire thing to managing director. Managing director only can now start granting guarantee or security to housing finance company. So next insurance company, third one housing finance company guys this is LGSI made by a housing finance company not to a housing finance company. Some extra thinking will do and here we will write if this examination he will also write note what uh, this uh, 186 will not apply to housing finance company. I am talking about this company. This is the guarantee given to housing finance company. 186 11 speaks about if housing finance company is here. Correct. So it is loan guarantee security made by given by by housing finance company not given to should not get confused right next then a company again when you are writing the law should i write exactly the words given in the bear act no way it is not possible at all it is humanly impossible even for the person who created the bear act who created the law cannot write so you should always write law right in your own words it's okay even if it's simple language it's absolutely fine but the keywords you should maintain so write law in the own words like that i keep telling people say yes we'll write the own law uh, problem so creating your own law like this housing finance company it will not apply all that don't write housing finance company in the ordinary course of its business so the business of the company is giving loans that's why it says its business it doesn't say in its ordinary course of business that is different in its ordinary course of business means any company in its ordinary course i can do it's in the ordinary course of its business so the business of the company itself is to give loan right Next, company engaged in the business of financing industrial enterprises like NBFC registered with RBI that also providing infrastructure facilities yes then any acquisition the moment I say acquisition that is investment any investment made by investment company obviously the job only is to invest so there it will not come under this it will come under 179 3E. 1793 talks about investing the funds of the company to any acquisition made by a NBFC company registered with RBI whose principal business is acquisition of securities in respect of its investment and lending activity. So again acquisition made by NBFC whose main business itself is buying securities investment. Then any company for example if they invest in right shares allotted under section 62 right shares allotted under section 62 means what if i have invested in reliance i am x limited i have invested in reliance shares let's say i have invested around 20 lakhs okay this will it come in the calculation yes lgsi already made it will come now reliance in if you remember in 2020 they issued right shares right so right shares they should let's say around uh, 5 lakh worth of right shares i am I, I can buy now the company decides to buy this 5 lakh rupees right shares of reliance issued by reliance 5 lakh rupees worth to invest this again it's a new investment whatever it is should i take all the approvals under 186 not needed that is what they are trying to tell any investment in right shares 
of a company which anyway already you know the shares are already owned by you for that particular investment not needed to go for 186 you can go under 179 3e and close it why because this is a benefit obviously there will be a, a rate which is much less lesser than the market rate second your the window will be some 15 days 20 days in 20 days how will you call bmr unanimous special resolution and there also a prior special resolution it is not possible that is why this exemption is given now moving on in the next year when i am doing lgsi already made will i take as 20 lakhs or 25 lakhs what do you think lgsi already made the rule is once exempt always exempt once exempt always exempt so investment in right shares i need not because 186 full 186 will not apply very very clear wordings of 186 11 the provisions of 186 will not apply to whom to any investment made in right shares so in the next year when i am doing lgsi already made i should not take 25 lakhs that 5 lakhs is completely exempt from the calculation Definitely, it will be in my balance sheet as investment, no doubt. But in the calculation purposes, it is excluded. That is an important point. You should keep that in mind. 186 does not apply to government company engaged in defense production and unlisted government company which obtains ministry approval. So, it will not apply to any, like for example, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, etc. 186 will not apply. And also, unlisted government company, if they take ministry approval, will not apply to specified IFSC private or IFSC public. If company passes board resolution, even circulation is okay. With respect to IFSC private and public, BMR is not needed, CR is okay, circular resolution possible. So, in case of right issue, a rule shall be once exempted, always exempted. The exempted investments are to be excluded from the calculation in considering the limit, excluded from step 2 itself, completely excluded, no need to check. Yes, then postal ballot is mandatory. Postal ballot is a method of, uh, what do you say, conducting the meeting itself. It is a replacement of a meeting. Instead of a meeting, I, there are two things. One is postal ballot, one is e-voting. What is the difference? E-voting is meeting is happening, but voting mechanism can happen via e-voting mechanism, where before the meeting itself, they will give you the option. Postal ballot is a replacement of the meeting. If you have any voting mechanism via postal ballot, which is mandatory for listed companies for certain sections, then the provisions of meeting are deemed to have been followed already. That's the difference between postal ballot and e-voting, right? So, postal ballot is mandatory for every special resolution. Means what? No need to meet. No need to meet. Send all the documents to their respective email IDs. In the comfort of their home, they can respond. And the moment they vote, that resolution is deemed to be the meeting. That's the beauty of postal ballot. So don't get confused between postal ballot and e-voting. Both are different. In case of a listed company for transacting any business in excess of the ceiling limits of 60 or 100 percent as the case may be. 60 or 100 percent as the case may be. Now here if you see 186 SR limit, page number 45, Y limited has given a loan to X limited. Y limited has given a loan to X limited and uh, the capital and reserves are 200 lakhs. So, what is the calculation step number 1? 60 percent of 200 or 100 percent of 100. So, basically 60 percent of 200 is 120 lakhs, whichever is higher 120 lakhs. 120 lakhs. Beyond 120 lakhs, I have to pass what resolution? Special resolution. Now, the proposal here now is 210 lakhs. Is it beyond 120 lakhs? Yes. The 210 lakhs can I pass is the question. The answer is no, because the net worth of the company itself is 200. How can I allow shareholders who are actually pumped in 200 to allow the company to actually create an outflow of more than 200? Not allowed. Though it is not explicitly given in the section, it is given via MCA guideline and MCA direction where they say that special resolution for loans or investment beyond the net worth should not be passed by companies. I have only pumped in 200, I am allowing you to uh, pump out 210, which means I am allowing you to use other money, unsecured creditors money. I am approving, not allowed. 
so this is also very important borrowed funds cannot be used for inter corporate loans and advances borrowed funds cannot be used for inter corporate loans and advances then if you remember here we had discussed the uh, what do you say uh, holding subsidiary relationship just to revise where in page number 41 holding company giving loan to wholly owned subsidiary 185 not covered 186 we need to check holding company giving guarantee or security to anybody who in turn gives loan to wholly owned subsidiary 185 not covered 186 i need to see holding company giving guarantee or security to bank or financial institution which in turn gives a loan to a subsidiary we have seen we have to check that right we have to see that that's okay but here let's see so here again obviously 185 was not covered 186 we need to see so similar provisions here little extra is covered in 186 So let's check out holding company giving loan to a joint venture they say and wholly a uh, ho holding company giving a loan to wholly owned subsidiary both these things holding company giving guarantee or security to anyone who in turn gives a loan to wholly owned subsidiary or a joint venture here one extra thing is there joint venture holding company giving investing in the securities of a wholly owned subsidiary how can i invest in securities of a wholly owned subsidiary guys i am already held 100 percent equity shares that's why they use the word securities so other things yeah, debentures preferences etc so investing in the securities of wholly owned subsidiary mind you holding company investing in securities to make it wholly owned subsidiary is not covered I repeat, holding company investing in the equity shares of a 97% subsidiary to make it a wholly owned subsidiary is not covered here. Do not get confused. It is only investment in the securities of already a wholly owned subsidiary. Right? So, and then lastly, which was previously given in 186 also, 185 also, holding company giving guarantee or security to a bank or financial institution which in turn gives a loan to a normal subsidiary interesting part is 186 will apply to all the three cases all these cases five cases which are there 186 will apply no exemption only one part is exempt what special resolution for these things guys only special resolution is exempt means what if i go beyond that limit of 60 and 100 percent prior special resolution need not be taken prior special resolution need not be taken Holding company giving loan to JV beyond the limit, SR is exempt. Holding company giving loan to WS, SR is exempt. Holding company, these two, this thing you saw, this any one thing you saw in 185. 185 was exempt. 186, not exempt. Special resolution exempt. Special resolution exempt. So, here in this calculation, LGSI already made. LGSI already made is going beyond whatever that limit, whatever. Next year when I am computing LGSI already made, should I take all transactions or what? For this companies, uh, wholly owned subsidiary should take all transactions or only the ones which are uh, not exempt. Unlike the right issue, in right issue the whole of 186 was exempt. Here 186 is very much applicable. What is exempt? Special resolution. So this loan given by holding company to a wholly owned subsidiary will very much be part of the holding company's calculation in LGSI already made. That is an interesting and important point to note. Only special resolution is exempt, not the full section. Only for right issue, full section is exempt, right? Next, last part. Holding company giving guarantee or security to a bank or financial institution, which in turn gives a loan to whom? To a subsidiary company. In turn gives a loan to a subsidiary company. This, in this case, 186 will very much apply 186 will very much apply to this case no exemption no exemption 185 exempt 185 is exempt 186 no exemption full section will apply the full section will apply no exemption as such 
simple same thing given here thing to worry then a uh, chart to make you understand the lending limits up to 60% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus security premium account or 100% of free reserves whichever is higher board meeting resolution plus unanimous plus prior pfi if there is a default right then more than 60% of puc frsp or 100% of frsp whichever is higher and up to what net worth of the company we have seen this because of this up to net worth of the company right so what is it prior pfi approval yeah, whether it default or no default i don't care prior pfi approval because it's exceeding the limits plus prior special resolution plus bmr plus unanimous plus mgt 14 last but not the least anything beyond the net worth is ultra wires ultra wires ultra wires the companies act so the explanatory statement should indicate the specific securities in which it proposed to invest and mind you this is also interesting company wise investment wise separate resolutions must be passed so though it is the same transaction i am investing let's say some 2 uh, crore uh, which is exceeding the limit 2 crore but in which companies are you doing so i should give a list of companies so for that separate companies i need to pass special resolution similarly investment wise what is the type of investment equity shares preference shares what are you investing in those also separately special resolution has to be passed though it is not given in the act this is an accepted practice and also given in the secretarial guidelines so definitely this also has to be written in the examination in company wise investment wise separate resolutions in the same meeting because i will be okay with you spending 2 crore but i am not okay with you spending 2 crore in reliance shares i'm just saying i am not okay with you spending 2 crores in the debentures of some company i am not okay with it so i am okay with the 2 crores so just because you passed 2 crores that's not the special resolution investment wise company wise separate special resolutions have to be passed is what they say 186 matter to be considered as the board level so this is a basic procedure just to revise second resolution should happen only at the meeting of the board unanimous approval should be taken of all the directors concerned we should convene an extraordinary general meeting notice has to specify the necessary details clearly they should give what all they are talking about of course for listed companies you should go through a postal ballot mechanism approval should be taken by what special resolution filing of special resolution with roc in which form mgt 14 inform all the stock exchange as per the listing agreement so as per sebi lodr you have to list you know give all these things rate of interest should be not less than government security rate always and approval of finance so interest free loan cannot be given approval of the pfi wherever needed there should not be any default in repayment of deposits maintenance of register permanently protecting the preserving the same and lastly financial statements must specify all the details apart from that also i have caro clause 3 4 and 13 where i have to see all these things and report that's an additional point in paper number 3 so these are all the various concepts with respect to what 186 you need a break or can we continue break okay this you 10 minutes 15 minutes take a break all right guys shall we begin all right come back so section 184 page number 46 so we are done with two sections 185 and 186 moving on to the other two 184 and 188 let's begin so 184 talks about disclosure of the director's interest now the word interest has not been defined anywhere the word interest has not been defined anywhere so we need to understand what do you mean by that interest but yeah of course you'll have the uh, basics or the what do you say some hints as to what could possibly interest mean so let's see 184 so 184 is of two types 1841 and 1842 1841 is a general disclosure and 1842 is a specific disclosure so 1841 is a general disclosure that you do at the beginning of every financial year 
whereas 184.2 is a specific disclosure which is done at the board meeting where the particular point is discussed. So, uh, understanding this 184.1 general disclosure, when do I see it? So, 184.1 general disclosure should be seen in form number MBP1 and what should I uh, of course see the concern or interest and concern or interest where in the companies in the bodies corporate in the firms or AOP since the word interest was not defined some of the examples can be directors direct financial interest right directors direct financial interest means what I am a company uh, and there is a director here and there is one more company in which the same director is there or I am a company in which the director is there and the director has invested in one more company. So, my company enters into a contract with that company. So, obviously the directors uh, of this company has a financial interest in the other company or the director of this company has a managerial interest in the other company. So, all these things are covered. So, to explain more 184.1 only says that 184.1 what does it say form number MBP1 is what I need to file and in what all companies what all uh, concern or interest in which all entities I should see first in companies then in bodies corporate in firms or AOP association of person the word firm if I have to see companies act and see the word firm so what if I use the word firm in Indian partnership act that would mean partnership firm if I use the word uh, exchange in foreign exchange management act it means foreign exchange so similarly let's close the door no please so if I use the word firm in companies act this firm will be anything guys it can be sole proprietorship firm it can be partnership firm it can be anything so should not get confused even if I have a sole proprietorship and of course OPC is a body corporate even if I have an OPC if the company enters into a contract with an OPC in which I am a director or an OPC in which I am a member yes it will definitely be a cause of interest so to speak and AOP sole proprietorship business I have yes and AOP include shareholding since they have used the word include shareholding other things are also covered like normal membership I am a member of a AOP I am a partner in a firm I do not have a share but I am a partner in a firm so yes all these things are covered here when should I disclose first board meeting of every financial year first board meeting of every financial year or first board meeting whenever there is any change in the disclosures already done then I have to do so when first board meeting of every financial year I will disclose or first board meeting of whenever there is a change I will anyway disclose then what is the need to have 184.2 is the question because 184.2 talks not just about this but these are specifically if any contract is coming up to the board meeting level so 184.2 will speak about this is a general disclosure at the beginning of the year I will disclose and tell look if at all during the year if your company that is my company here enters into a contract with any of these companies any of these bodies corporate any of these firms any of these AOPs etc and just know that I am actually interested in that just know that I am already interested in that no need for me to disclose I have already done a general disclosure that is the idea behind what 184.1 I am already interested so you have to deem it that I am interested however if anything let us say you miss out in 184.1 on the other hand if you not miss out also let us say you uh, there is a new contract that is coming up to the board meeting level that comes under 184.2 under 184.2 what will you see we will see a contract arrangement proposed contract and proposed arrangement and here very interesting uh, extra words given is here you have to disclose the nature of concern or interest that is the exact amount of profit that you are making from this deal also has to be disclosed so here if you see there is no word called uh, nature of concern here they use the word nature of concern nature of concern or interest means what exact amount of profit that you are making to be taken into account in what this is different now what about your directors relatives interest so first is directors direct financial interest second is directors direct uh, what do you say managerial interest what about the third one directors relatives financial interest directors relatives managerial interest what about these things my relatives financial interest my relatives managerial interest what about these things so that is not covered under 184.1 directors relatives interest is covered under 184.2 it is not covered under 184.1 why because here they have 
use the word interest in the form of a noun in 184.1. I came for law revision, English is happening, yeah. Uh, 184.1 and 184.2, they have used the word interested director. Correct? Interested director. Whenever I use the word interested director, obviously, if you see the old definition of interested director in the 2 clause 49, which has been removed now, rightly so, because everything is covered here, they have used the word directly or indirectly. Since they have used the word directly or indirectly, directors, relatives, financial interest, directors, relatives, managerial interest is governed now under 184.2 and not 184.1. Right? That's what we have to see. Contract, arrangement, proposed contract, proposed arrangement, nature of concern or interest, exact amount of profit. These are all the keywords. What all should I see? Bodies corporate in which the director holds more than 2%. All bodies corporate in which the director directly or indirectly again holds more than 2%. And bodies corporate in which the director is a promoter or CEO. He either can be a promoter or a CEO of that company firm or other entity including sole proprietorship in which the director is a partner owner member all these things so these three things put together when should i disclose all this at the board meeting where it is actually discussed so if first of all if i am already a director second if i am already interested Third one, it is a proposed contract coming up to the board meeting level. All the four items, if it is there, then I should discuss at the board meeting where it is discussed. But if I become interested later, means what? I become a director later. If I told you, asked you a question, if a company gives loan to a person and that person becomes a director later, 185 will not come. Similarly, it gives loan to a random person and 186 approvals are taken, but later that person becomes relative of director. 185 is not covered. But... 184 will be covered everywhere. Aren't you interested in this contract? Yes, very much so because my relative is, uh, you know, there. So, directors, disclosure of directors' interest strictly need not be restricted only to these two. Any sort of, this section is actually speaking about honesty. They are trying to tell, be transparent and honest. If you feel that your independence is getting affected, kindly disclose is what they are trying to tell. Even later when the interest comes into four, later also you need to disclose is what they are trying to tell. But nevertheless for the exam you need to just stick to whatever is given here. Bodies corporate in which dieter holds more than 2%. Now again if you see the word interest it is not defined anywhere. So generally uh, because of my interest in law I read a lot of commentaries. So I started reading one book which is which had 523 pages of only the word interest. After 10 pages, I only lost interest, right? So that's what it is. There I was, but I just flipped through all these things. There they have given, like I figured out three items which are not under the purview of what? This uh, section. What is that? First one, directors, for example, uh, director is there of a company X Limited. His best friend is there in Y Limited. So generally, sometimes your friends are of more I mean, closer to you than your siblings also, right? So the thing is here, in this case, both of them are directors. Now, if X Limited enters into a contract with Y Limited, now, can you say, and for whatever rate, they'll give a lesser rate, higher rate, just because you have a very good friend on board there. Can you take this as interest? No, because there's no definition of friend, etc. So if you see on various cases, they have held that director's sentimental interest, right? Director's sentimental interest should not be considered. I am a one, there is a director of the company, the director's crush is the director of one more company. So obviously, sentimental interest, all this you cannot, there is no end to it guys. So the, there are decided case laws, I am not telling this. No crush and all, I made it up, but I am saying there are other cases where sentimental interest was covered, honestly. So they said, no, there is no end to it. Second, uh, one person is, uh, you know, staunch, uh, you know, what do you say, follower of a political party or a particular religion, caste, creed, whatever. Same, there are other directors, various other people, his friends are there. But he will only give the deal to one more person because he is also staunch believer of that political ideology, for example. Now, what do you think about this? Now, again, there is no end to it. So, second one, directors, ideological interest. Ideological interest should be ignored is what they say. Right? So, these are all some hidden points which you need to remember in the exam. Sentimental interest, I cannot, there is no definition of sentimental interest. Similarly, ideological interest, no definition. Religion, caste, creed, political ideology, I don't care. So, it should be outside the purview. Third one, 
though this is you know difficult to subscribe to this view though but nevertheless it's given there so director is there of a company and the director's daughter happens to be some uh, random sales manager of some other company so the di sales director is forcing her to bring more business so that she'll get a promotion so she i mean the direct sales director tells the uh, daughter saying that go get a deal from your father's company because you have that uh, you know of course you know uh, that your father is the main person there get a deal somehow so basically the daughter of course gets a deal from this company purely and purely because of the relationship that she shares with the uh, father of course so here now the question is this is the director's relatives employment interest in some other company correct so 100% they have entered into a contract purely because of the uh, relationship that they share but unfortunately mca also uh, has uh, told in many cases and of course there are decided case laws where they say directors relatives employment interest should not be taken into account correct directors relatives employment interest so barring these three these are all mca uh, clarifications over years and years of you know asking questions and of course decided case laws so the gist of the story is barring these three other things you need to follow so one is what director sentimental interest ideological interest directors relatives employment interest barring these three other things obviously will be coming under all these things only and 184 to an extra point is directly or indirectly one more extra point is nature of concern or interest and uh, this has to come at that board meeting level itself and only then you need to disclose otherwise there is no need uh, and next board meeting when it, if he becomes interested later so as i told you if you become interested later also you need to disclose under 184 because there it's always about honesty more than anything else is what they are trying to tell and of course this you need to remember more than 2% mind you if it is less than 2% not needed as per 1842 if it is less than 2% not needed only if it is more than 2% is what you need to see and uh, disclosure under 1841 will be in form number mbp1 it shall be the duty of director giving notice to cause it to be disclosed at the meeting immediately all notices will be kept at registered office shall be preserved first option will be permanently we'll take that and come here it is eight years correct so if you see these things only they keep you know uh, annoying you with those mcqs 186 register permanently 184 mbp1 and all eight years so we have to please you know ensure that you write the correct answer then we saw notices under 173 no courier 175 courier 173 that is you can do registered office whether in india or abroad whereas 175 only in india so all those are some hidden points from the end of the financial year to which it relates and shall be kept in the custody of the company secretary or any other authorized person so body corporate includes everything firm includes not only partnerships but also sole proprietary concern hf aop and all those things 1841 and 1842 are two separate subsections obviously with specific duties for directors that is what we have seen because one is a general disclosure one more is a specific disclosure in both the subsections nature of concern also to be disclosed in predominantly 1842 because they have used the word directly or indirectly in 1841 the mbp1 also talks about nature of concern that's why i have given it here the form speaks about nature of concern though the act does not say so 1841 directors relatives interest need not be disclosed already discussed because 1842 has the wordings directly or indirectly then um, yeah 1841 so basically 1841 will come in all cases guys 185 cases 185 3 cases where 185 is not applicable where you become interested later all 188 cases related party transactions all related party transactions which are exempt from 188 will also come under 184 it's a general disclosure section uh, they are asking you to be honest about it 1842 again we have seen all these things uh, 184 does not override any other section it is always in addition to all the other things that we have already seen if some other section okay then one more thing what they say in 184 is if some other section restricts a director from having any concern or interest in any contract or arrangement that section will stand what they are trying to tell is for example yesterday we saw independent director you cannot have beyond that uh, threshold limit let us say an independent director has more than two percent shares in some company and you want to become an independent director so 
can you have let's say 10% share then can you disclose under 184 and then tell i have disclosed so i can be appointed no so that's what it says if some other section restricts a director from having any concern or interest for example independent director that section will stand you cannot breach that section disclose under 184 and then tell everything is okay no 184 shall not apply Again, then there is one exemption here under 180, uh, this uh, eighth point. If 184 shall not apply to any contract or arrangement between two companies or two bodies corporate, where any of the directors holds less than or equal to 2% of the paid up share capital in the other company. So, there can be either a company or a body corporate, company or a body corporate, directors xyz of this company let us say have together with hold shares how much less than or equal to two percent of paid up share capital in this company they are telling no need to disclose but guys in 184 2 if you see anyway less than two percent no need to disclose right so this exemption is actually applicable for the general disclosure that is 184 1 because if you remember in 184 2 Anyway, no need to disclose if you have less than 2%. It's very clearly given here. Only if it is more than 2%. So, no need to disclose anyway. But here, they have said singly or in combination. Now, this particular point is irrelevant because let us say X has 1%, Y has 1%, Z has 1%. When he is filing MBP1, he will only look at his share holding or he will ask everybody else. Will there be a WhatsApp group? And I'll, as of today, tell me your shareholding. No, it's a very confidential thing. You cannot disclose. So basically, it's a very stupid uh, provision, which is still existing. It is immaterial. It is illogical because you cannot sit and see any of the directors. Each and every director, I cannot see how much he's holding. And the holding can change every single day. So it's an absurd provision. So uh, the company uh, ICSI told one thing. I don't care whether it is less than 2%, I cannot sit and count. They say, even if you have one share, kindly disclose. So basically, this is immaterial, this particular provision, but it's there in the law, so we need to follow. So whether singly or jointly, less than or equal to 2%, then you need to do so. One interesting point, this particular, uh, I mean, let us say I had less than 2% only, I had 0.8%, all put together. Z's relative also happen to be the director of this other company directors relatives managerial interest should i disclose or not ideally i should why because though my shareholding is less than two percent but my relatives interest is there i need to disclose but people never used to disclose because you know again one bad framing of the law this particular section said nothing in this section shall apply if your shareholding is less than two percent I repeat, nothing in this section shall apply if your shareholder is two, if shareholding is two percent. So what people interpret it to be, if my shareholding is two percent, entire 184 will not apply. So even if my relative happens to the happens to be the managing director of that company, I'll not disclose. This again was struck down by MCA, where they said it is a wrong interpretation. This exemption is only for directors' direct financial interest. That's all directors direct financial interest less than or equal to 2 percent now that less than or equal to 2 percent is anyway covered under 184.2 so they said predominantly look at 184.1 but then again one more absurdity is what i cannot sit and count each and every person so icsi said uh, you leave this you just uh, disclose even if you have one share and uh, Yes, if the director is otherwise interested other than shareholding, as I told you now, that is director's relatives interest and all, his holding of less than 2% is not relevant, means director's managerial interest, director's relatives financial interest, all these things have to be disclosed, no exemption, right? And uh, when should I see the 2% limit? The date on which, which the contract is entered into. The date on which the contract is entered into is the time, relevant time to see this 2%. Even if the shares are held by a director in a non-beneficial manner, say on behalf of a trust, I am holding it as a trustee, then also I need to disclose because it says holding shares, nowhere it says owning shares, nowhere it says beneficially holding shares, it only says holding. If you are holding shares and benefit is not coming to you, still you need to disclose. 184 will not apply to a section 8 company. There is nothing to disclose there because it's anyway for a philanthropic purpose. 
184 again will not apply yes to a specified IFSC public company and this is an again a very important point 184 will not apply to a private companies because what used to happen was if there were uh, like three four directors in a private company you have all worked for private companies in the sense in during the audit so when you enter the private company there will be two people they are only the directors they are only the shareholders they are only the accountants oh no you are the accountant and auditors right so yes in you go you will tell what to do so you will say we have to we did a meeting so when you want the minutes you tell me you will create that and then of course the thing is problem is what same people will be everybody so now if you say 184 and generally these private companies outsiders money is not involved their own money is involved so why the hell will they actually care about you know related parties they will obviously enter into uh, contracts which would benefit them and they would say I'd rather pay slightly more and give it to my relative rather than somebody else because I know that person it's all based on trust so as simple as that so they went to MCA and said who are you to tell that I cannot vote because here under 184 they said 184 basically what does it say an interested director now before that what's the difference between disinterested director and uninterested director disinterested director and uninterested which one should you write in the exam right disinterested or uninterested what's the difference what is interested director interested means of course he has a financial interest managerial interest or anything where there is a conflict of interest we have all seen that that is basically again 166 4 and 5 which we saw the duties now the thing is uh, disinterested means what obviously disinterested means unbiased unbiased no prejudice unprejudiced that is called disinterested uninterested on the other hand is lack of zeal lack of zeal lack of interest all ca final student at the final stages <laughs> uninterested in anything including studies correct right so dear board of studies i am board of studies will write no yes so if you see Un disinterested director uninterested director uninterested of course has a lack of zeal so if you remember yesterday in vacation point 12 months uh, who have uh, the, that fellow has not attended any board meeting for 12 months with or without leave of absence that fellow is a uninterested director or disinterested uninterested so i have taken leave still i will not come for the meeting in the morning that day the board meeting day morning i called up and took leave so that shows your lack of interest in the uh, affairs of the company so this is ruled out if you write uninterested if any by your bad luck if some english fellow comes say shashi Tharoor is evaluating your paper <laughs> right then gone so please ensure that disinterested you will write and when you are talking also do not use the word disinterested if you do not have interest you should use the word uninterested disinterested is good unbiased unprejudiced so basically they say if you are an interested director if you are an interested director then you should obviously you basically this 184 was taken from uh, 299 and 300 of the old companies act 1956 so in that law what they told was see britishers are generally very subtle they came to our country also as merchants and they took over the entire country so they are very subtle in their behavior subtle in their thing so i have uh, my you know second cousin there living in the uk she is married uh, to of course a person of uk origin of course a person citizen of uk so they have uh, three cute kids so when we had gone after a long time they are very subtle so there the 6 30 they go to sleep by the way so 6 30 7 pm so she just told her children uh, don't you have an early morning class tomorrow that's all she told not kidding so they all shut shop they bid goodbye and they went and slept in india does it work no right your mom will keep shouting you got slapped so many times slapped by my parents right so in india subtlety is not our forte at all we do not understand subtle language right so in uh, 299 300 you know what they had told earlier they said an interested director they said cannot vote at the meeting his presence will not be counted only even if he comes it will not be counted he will not be counted for quorum also he cannot speak at the meeting also all indirect means what means he should obviously not attend the meeting it is very subtle language of law very very indirect this is british companies act 
Our fellows will be understand. No. Like when we go to somebody's house for dinner, when is the right time to leave? Let's say you call me for dinner. When is the right time to leave? Leave your place. Immediately after uh, food, you'll leave. No, you'll wait for dessert. Right? So you'll sit there for a while. And maybe after dessert, 10 15 minutes maximum. You should not wait for the other person to give you a cue. That cue will be very dangerous. That host only will tell what plans after going home. <laughs> or the host will start yawning. Right? Or the host will say, Oh, I mean, so it's been a long day, I guess, for you. Actually, he's telling, you have eaten like a buffalo, get out, enough. <laughs> but he'll not tell that directly, right? He'll be saying, okay, what plans after going home? We cannot say, anyway, I want to watch a football match, give me the remote, let's watch now, right? So, in India, we do not understand subtlety. So, actually, it was happening here, unfortunately, the directors were sitting in the meeting. And the company secretary said, sir, please, I mean, you need to leave. He said, where is it written in the Bear Act? I, I will not vote, I will not open my mouth also. There are very nice pastries here. I'll eat it without opening my mouth or without making any sound. I will not speak. Assume I am not here. And no problem. I don't want to be involved in this quorum and all that. But I'll sit in the meeting. This was the unfortunate thing which was happening before. But 2013 is hardcore Indian legislation. So here they said that you should not participate in the meeting. Should not. They removed all this nonsense. And in 184 they said should not participate in the meeting. This also we didn't understand. So directors are still sitting and saying, I will not participate. I will sit. <laughs> participate means what? Actively take part. I will not take part at all. So MCA in 2015 had to release a guideline. They said, if you are interested, they said, get out in a nice way. They said, the director has to step out of that business. He is not allowed when that item of business is being discussed. So that is the scene. Now they say, if you are an interested director, you cannot attend that particular item of business. For that item of business, get out. And now once the item of business is done, they'll call you back again, then you're going. That's fair enough. So that's what. But for this private company, it is useless, right? Because I am only the directors, I am only the shareholder. Who are you to tell? So that's why if you see here, that's why this point is there. 184 does not apply to a private company or a specified IFSC public company means what? Interested director should disclose interest at the meeting. Definitely you have to disclose, but can vote. An interested director of a private company should disclose. Yes, I'll disclose everything, but I can vote. I will definitely vote at the meeting. This was a very good exemption given in 2015. Again, 5th June notification, they gave an exemption under 184 that you can vote absolutely no problem. Then of course it applies to uh, directors nominated by the government and it will apply to other nominee directors also. An alternate director as well as original director should send the disclosure in writing because each of them may be interested in different businesses as such. So now you tell me quorum, uh, linking to quorum which we did not do yesterday because of this only. Quorum, you should see this uh, quorum at every item of business or beginning of the meeting. Every item of business because I will be interested in, I may be interested in one item of business, may not be interested in the other. So I should see every single time. So the quorum should always be checked before every item of business. But in practical life, quorum is presumed. And even in the exam, you can write the same thing. Quorum is actually presumed unless somebody raises a, uh, you know, query. If some director says, I don't think so, quorum is there, only then you will check. Otherwise, quorum is presumed. But as per secretarial guidelines, they say the company secretary should ensure quorum is there every single time. So before the item of business starts, you should mentally calculate. Anyway, some five, six directors will be there, 10 directors will be there. It's not hard. So you should ensure that quorum is present. We'll link the other quorum provisions later. Now, this particular section talks about uh, disclosure in the board meeting. If you are a director of a public company and also you happen to be a shareholder, should you disclose your interest again in the shareholders meeting? No. So that is not needed. It is only disclosure, disclosure in the board meeting. And can you vote in the shareholders meeting in the capacity of a shareholder? Yes. So if you see here again, disclosure of interest in general meeting, not needed. They do not apply for general meeting resolutions. A director may exercise his voting right at a GM provided of course, the interest disclosure will anyway go in the explanatory statement under 102. But again in the meeting, no need to disclose. Now, this is an important provision regularly asked in the exam. What if there is an absence of disinterested quorum? Means what? 
all the directors are interested now quorum required is let's say two or three but unfortunately the directors are only the interest disinterested directors are only one or none of them are disinterested all of them are interested what to do so if all of them are interested they say that if the quorum is not available the board strength may be increased by appointing new disinterested directors so if for a particular important item of business there is no quorum then they say kindly appoint new disinterested directors but don't you think so it's a stupid su suggestion only for one item of business new directors right this was mca only has given this clarification after reading first point they only laughed at themselves then they say okay let me change it then they say if it is not found practicable they knew it was not practicable if this is not found practicable one more deadly what do you say interpretation they gave which was again at least first one was better they said the matter shall be placed before the general meeting for the consent unfortunately we saw yesterday in 179 the two tier management system shareholders powers are limited to what act aoa moa that's it here mca is giving power taking away the power from board of directors and giving the power to shareholders by saying what the entire matter which was supposed to be discussed via board meeting resolution is now to be dis uh, discussed where general meeting so it is very absurd actually uh, but actually there is no other solution that's why this is as this has been accepted regularly asked in the exam you have to write this in in the board meeting if the quorum is not available and the board strength may be increased by appointing new disinterested directors if this is not found practicable then the matter shall be placed before the general meeting so those shareholders powers are limited by the act aoa moa mca is neither the act neither the uh, nor the moa or aoa for that matter mca has given power randomly to shareholders but then there is no other choice if you actually think about it so that's the reason why it is given it will still continue the same way you can write an examination exam note the latter course as the second point suggested by mca does not find support under the act why it goes again section 179 these extra points i mean of course the source is the company law commentary if you understand that you will come to know so these extra notes if you are writing if at all there is a discerning uh, evaluator who knows the law who can evaluate your papers ca only no even bcom fellow can evaluate bcom faculty can evaluate if you see the what do you say go to icai website and check the invigilation or uh, sorry examiners uh, what do you say eligibility there you will see even a bcom lecturer with some 10 years experience 20 years experience can do so unfortunately so the thing is if at all let's say you are lucky enough to get a chartered accountant company secretary evaluating your paper who is knowledgeable if you if that person sees this note other people may ignore but if that person sees this note he will know that you have understood the law and definitely there will be weightage may not be for that answer but overall there would be weightage it's all about you know playing the of course man as simple as that playing the man so whoever is evaluating man includes woman for everyone yes so it is about playing the person who is evaluating simple so it's all about he is also human being first 40 marks of the question paper if you write perfect answers that's it remaining all that bcom answers you can write here and there no problem 40 to 50 marks you should impress the evaluator with your answers and they will eventually give you know marks and definitely that's why you know some of my students have scored 87 and all in paper 60 i was telling that student at my two subjects total right 87 and all you have scored in paper 60 right that's how it is so it is possible paper 4 paper 4 also 82 last time crazy marks so it's possible only if you write the perfect answers as simple as that and anyway it's good for us you finish it off quickly because in the next uh, they are planning to do open book exam for all laws good law dt idt very soon so all these uh, what do you say this summary book at least is more in depth but if you simply uh, rely on some nonsense charts and all that it's useless but if not for you guys for your juniors because gone are those days when there will only be if you see december 21 paper you will know what i am trying to tell right so that's all i don't have to tell anything so yes good good for us because we have already studied everything in depth that's what matters the word interest should be read as interest conflicting with duty 
interest conflicting with duty so therefore if the board allot shares to themselves along with other shareholders then there is no conflict of duty i am allotting shares i am allotting to others i had also applied as a director i am allotting to me no problem here interest should be what interest conflicting with duty as there is no conflict of interest and section 184 does not apply to such transactions but allotment of shares to themselves to further their personal interest as different from general interest then 184 will apply so if i do a preferential allotment fraudulent preference instead of allotting to others i have allotted to me that would be called as fraudulent preference so that is point number 19 that would be what section 184 so all these things have to be kept in mind this is section 184 very interesting section yes that's about it moving on to next one related party transactions again a very important section rpt related party transactions people used to ignore this section that's why 88 marks 66 marks in the compulsory thing they are asking because they know that we ignore this section 188 related party transactions yes company who all are there company first of all then okay if you all the penalty charts are given uh, you know later penal provision charts are given later but uh, only the overall penalty is given but let me just uh, at least show you just one which i feel is important so let's see so that was you know if uh, violation of 184 what will happen So guys, 1841. Now again, you have to understand if 1841, if what do you say? I do not disclose MBP one. What is the penal provision? I have to disclose. If I do not disclose, what happens? A gamut of provisions will come into the four. One is 1667. There it is. One lakh to five lakh fine, fine, not penalty, fine. Then 1844. One eighty four four also will come penalty of one lakh rupees. Earlier it was fine, imprisonment and all that removed from twenty first December. It is penalty. This anyway is in the overall chart later. I'll show you. But I mean this uh, this is the regular batch, you know, provisions. That's okay. If you don't pay this one eighty four four, if you don't pay this, then if you remember yesterday we saw one sixty seven one C. What is that? Vacation. vacation in the defaulting company here they say the wordings of 1671c is what acted in contravention of 184 you have acted in contravention of what you have not paid the penalty if you do not do the general disclosure immediately it's not vacation first you have to pay penalty penalty if you don't pay then it amounts to contravention of 184 so what happens vacation in where where vacation defaulting company this is one part of it on the other hand if it is 1842 1842 contract or arrangement where you do not do so then again deadly 1843 the contract will be voidable where at the option of the company contract will be voidable at the option of the company then of course again 1844 penal provisions will apply penalty 1 lakh rupees And 167 1D vacation. This is 167 1C vacation. This is 167 1D. 167 1D clearly says if you do not disclose any contract or arrangement, it's very clear. So 167 1D doesn't talk about 184 1 at all. It is 184 2 directly contract or arrangement. Then of course 166 7 fine fine of 1 lakh to 5 lakh. So you have 184 3 184 4 167 1D and 166 7. That is if you what. do not disclose contract or arrangement and mind you penalty is not up to 1 lakh and all it is flat 1 lakh rupees flat 1 lakh rupees not up to 1 lakh this is regarding the penal provisions of 184 again there is a combined penal provision of all the four sections after this uh, after this 188 is over we'll see yes now section 188 the break up of this section 188 what does it say first company which company private public what all is covered contract arrangement and basically it all boils down to one thing specified transaction with whom with a related party fourth one it should be beyond arms length price so four important items 
to be discussed. 3 plus 1, related party, specified transaction beyond arm's length price and related party definition under 2 clause 76. So, who is a related party? So, first of all, you should be a related party. That is anyway given here. If you are related party only, all the provisions will come. It should be a specified transaction and it must be beyond arm's length price, ALP. So, again this, uh, what do you say, definition is very, very important. Because if you see 185, we have to just, what do you say, uh, revise 185. 185 spoke about what the director of the lending company and the holding company, right? So here, what does it say? You see, compare and read. Dire and then second one obviously spoke about relative of director. Rather, I would say director of the lending and holding company along with the relative. So director or relative of the director of what lending and holding company in my example those 15 directors 15 into 9 also 135 people so 15 people and 135 people we discussed here what does it say director or his relative and also if you see in the end also they say that director or relative of director of the holding company is also covered holding company so similar only actually it's the same here also it says director plus relative of not of that company which I am checking 188 that company you can't call it as a lending company so this is the company which I am in which I am checking 188 and also the holding company same first one is the same second one we said partner right partner of such director that partner has been removed instead of partner they have used the word KMP key managerial personnel or his relative KMP or is relative. So, basically here it will be KMP and KMP is relative. Very simple. Third one, what did we see? FR, a firm in which the director or the relative happens to be a partner. Director or relative happens to be a partner. This we saw in 185. Here also if you see similar, firm is retained, no doubt. It is the same. Here what they have told, wherever there is director, no, they have added one thing, manager. Director or manager or both their relative of either, of course. So here only director or relative. Here they have said director or manager or relative of director, relative of manager, everybody. Happens to be a partner. Happens to be a partner. So third point you see, a firm in which director comma manager or his relative his means what director slash manager relative of either happens to be a partner happens to be a partner so then uh, next private company point if you remember here private company point in a private company point what was this thing private company in which pnr in which the director is a director or member in which director is a director or member. Here one step extra, private company in which director or what is the addition here, manager or what is the addition, a relative of either, relative of either is what, director or member. This remains the same. Everything remains the same guys. That's why I said that is very important chart. Private company in which director is a director or member. Private company in which director or manager or relative of either happens to be director or member. Director or member. So two extra things here. Private company in which director or manager or his relative is a member or director. So, this chart here, check it out. Y limited enters into a specified, ST means specified transaction. Specified transaction with what? P private limited. In which the director or manager Mr. X happens to be the director of P private limited. Director or manager X happens to be the member of J private limited member of J private limited if the company Y limited enters into a specified transaction 
with J Private Limited in which the director or manager is a member. Right then, uh, Y Limited enters into a specified transaction with P Private Limited in which the director or manager is a director. So this will be governed and assume it goes beyond ALP. Only then what comes? 188. Only if it is beyond ALP, only 188 comes. Y Limited on the, not just that relative of this director or manager, let's say Mr. A. He also is a member of our private limited. He also is a director of Q private limited. If they enter into any specified transaction, specified transaction in which relative of X, Mr. A, our private limited member, Q private limited director, then what happens? If it is goes beyond ALP, then yes. If you remember, this part was not there in, you know, 185. If I give loan guarantee security to the relative, that was not covered. This was governed under 186, if you remember. But here, everything is governed under 188. Then, next point was what, guys? That 20, body corporate, right? Private company done. What is the next point? Body corporate. Body corporate, 25% voting power point. This point is deleted. New point is added. This point is deleted, new point. What is a new point? Very simple. Your company can be a private company, public company, does not matter. Correct? The company which you are checking, 188 for, that can be a private or public, doesn't matter. You here will be either a director or manager. No problem. This company is entering into a specified transaction beyond arm's length price with a public company, mind you, public. Right? Your company can be private or public, doesn't matter. Your company is entering into a specified transaction beyond arm's length price with a public company, not private. What is this public company in which either the director or manager happens to be a director? the director or manager happens to be a director plus the director and along with his relatives is holding more than 2% of the paid up share capital. He is holding 0, relatives holding 3, same to be taken as more than 2. Uh, relatives are holding 0, he is only holding 3, yes, it to be taken as more than 2%. So, how do we read this? A public company in which director or manager is a director and along with his relatives is holding more than 2% of the paid up share capital. Same thing is given. Public company in which director or manager is a director and holds along with his relatives more than 2% of the paid up share capital more than 2% of the paid up share capital. Same. This structure, you, you can be private or public, doesn't matter. Public company, director manager is a director and along with the relatives holds more than 2% of the paid up share capital. Accustomed to act point is the same. So the next point here was accustomed to act. That accustomed to act is the same, no change. Any body corporate whose board of directors, managing director or manager is accustomed to act in accordance with the advice, directions or instructions of a director or manager. That is the same. Apart from that, so basically there is some body corporate, there is a body corporate whose board of directors listen to this director or manager. The board of directors listen to director or manager. Right? The board of director listen to the director or manager. Now, in this, uh, you know, NSC case, the director or manager, she was controlling many such companies apparently. But the best part was she, is, she was also being controlled by Himalayan Yogi. So that Himalayan Yogi also, is he a related party? Yes. That is what this next point says. That's an extra point. Any person, Himalayan Yogi, on whose advice, directions or instructions, a director, NSC CEO or manager is accustomed to act. So law has recognized this way before. I used to tell this in class also. 
with many examples but classic example is this now now next class onwards i can use that example so any person on whose advice directions or instructions a director or manager is accustomed to act that is an extra point which is not there in 185 last point which is not there in 185 is of course this structure here if you are a company y limited everybody associated with you will also be called as related party who holding company subsidiary company associate company subsidiary company of a company to which you are also a subsidiary subsidiary company of a company to which you are also a subsidiary right so entire group x b a z apart from that what is an associate company in which you have significant influence means at least 20% of the total voting power what if okay from from y's point of view a is an associate from a's point of view what is y so yes from a's point of view y is called as a investing company or venturer company so taking the same logic in y limited if some other investment company or any other company investing company has invested greater than or equal to 20% of the total voting power thereby making y i's associate or from y's point of view i is called as a venturer company or a investing company that is also a related party so i is what investing company or a venturer company of the company that is i should be a body corporate so basically full group x z a b i everybody will be called as related party only this clause last clause will not apply to a private company that's all everything else will apply to a private company will 188 apply to private company only the last clause will not apply everything else will very much apply so even a private company should see related party transaction all this i need to see only this clause alone not apply to private company so if private company can have all contracts with their related parties these are not called related party mind you this should be a specified transaction beyond arms length price specified transaction beyond arms length price now after having understood what is again what is the uh, again quick revision what is the related party definition first director and relative of that company and holding company partner is removed kmp is added kmp plus relative who is a kmp key managerial personnel md cfo ceo cs uh, then you know level one level below the kmp who is also designated as such then that's about it then uh, firm in which the director or manager or relative of either happens to be a partner then pnr becomes pr a private company in which the director or manager or relative of either happens to be a director or member and then fifth one uh, a public company in which the director or manager happens to be a director and along with the relatives hold more than 2% of the paid up share capital and then of course the accustomed to act remains the same then one extra himalayan yogi point also will come then lastly is this the entire structure that's it very simple so after having understood what is related party now we need to understand what is what are specified transactions so to make it easy i have given in a tabular format page number 50 so in 188 there are things which are direct also and there are things which are through agents also but the threshold limit for both are the same so that's why i have made these clauses a plus e clauses should be read together because e is through agent b plus e should be read together c clause is separate then d plus e should be read together f and g are separate and what are these clauses a plus e speak about sale purchase or supply of any goods or materials either directly or through agents <coughs> goods or materials so if i am either selling or buying or any supplying any goods or materials either directly means through a <coughs> agents means through e clause e everything should be clubbed together while analyzing the related party transaction now what are goods goods are as per goods are movable or immovable 
गुड्स आर मूवेबल एज पर सेल ऑफ गुड्स एक्ट गुड्स मीन ऑल काइंड ऑफ वॉट मूवेबल प्रॉपर्टी एक्सक्लूडिंग टू थिंग्स एक्शनेबल क्लेम एंड मनी सो मनी इज नॉट गुड इवन एक्शनेबल क्लेम एक्शनेबल क्लेम इज एनी डेटा बैलेंस विच इज रिसीवेबल विच यू कैन डिस्काउंट इन दी बैंक बिल्स रिसीवेबल फॉर एक्साम्पल दट इज नॉट गुड सो दैट्स अ नेगोशियबल इंस्ट्रूमेंट राइट विच कैन ऑब्वियसली बी ट्रांसफर्ड uh elsewhere alienated that is not called as a good however if i now based on a uh, 20 years later if i sell the notes pre pre 2016 notes 500 rupee notes even now people are actually selling if i sell that 500 rupee note to i mean as for a person who collects notes that is called what i asked this question in a school recently i mean i have been asking this regularly when i gone to a school to talk about ca i asked who is the person who collects notes they are telling politicians right no it is what numismatic in a way is that right but anyway numismatics so numismatic is a person who has the hobby of collecting notes coins etc so now numismatic value i want that old 500 rupee note i buy it for 1000 bucks now is it goods yes so old notes old coins antique coins etc are called goods so what about intellectual property royalty that uh, you know publishing rights copyright all those are also goods very much part of goods so if you see goods or materials either directly or through agents all have a movable property what about uh, you know stock shares everything is good what about land which which has around 100 teak trees along with it is that also a good no because land is an immovable property but those trees on the other hand are still immovable unless you agree to cut them at the time of contract of sale so all these things you already have studied in foundation and all that all cases <coughs> all cases board meeting resolution no circular resolution no 175 board meeting resolutions which are the other cases which we have seen till now which requires board meeting resolution 1793 all that a b c d e f d everything will require board meeting resolution 186 we just saw requires board meeting resolution yesterday we saw political contribution requires board meeting resolution and all these things so and uh, casual vacancy director requires board meeting resolution board meeting resolution and then if the transaction value during the year amounting to amounting means what greater than or equal to 10% of the turnover of the company since i am selling goods materials etc they have linked it to turnover rightly so 10% of turnover of the company what happens what resolution is needed ordinary resolution is needed ordinary resolution is needed includes capital goods revenue goods and all that obviously there is no uh, separate you know thing for that second selling or disposing or buying of any property of any kind either directly or through agents property also will include intellectual property as such so all cases board meeting resolution since i am buying and selling property here it includes immovable property more than my turnover the better comparative analysis would be on the net worth so here they have said amounting to 10% of the net worth of the company and what resolution ordinary resolution it's interesting to note that if let's say that uh, turnover of the company is 100 crore 10% will be 10 crore correct 10% would be 10 cr now what they are trying to tell here is it is not what do you say what they are uh, trying to explain here is uh, all cases means what during the financial year transaction value during the year they are saying transaction value now let us say i make a transaction value of let's say uh, uh, you know 5 crore i do goods material service whatever 5 crore now i have to see whether it is with related party okay then i have to see whether it is within alp or beyond alp i need to see whether it is within alp or beyond alp if it is beyond alp only then obviously this will come into the calculation for this what resolution is needed board meeting resolution let's say two months later i'll again enter into a contract of 3 crore with a related party beyond alp will it be taken into consideration yes so what is it board meeting resolution again it is beyond alp third case i am entering into a contract so basically what is the threshold limit 10 cr third case i am entering into a contract for 6 crore again with a related party during the year but this is well within alp 
This is what well within ALP. If it goes well within ALP, then what is the scene? If it is well within ALP, then what? It is not required. Why, guys? Because it is within ALP. Though if you see 5 plus 3, 8, 8 plus 6 is 14, it is exceeding this limit. The entire section only will not apply if it is within ALP. Section will not apply if it is within ALP. So I need not consider this at all. Somewhere later next year around 1 crore again, I am no, not next year, during the year, next month, 1 crore I am doing related party transaction beyond ALP. Then again I have to count 5 plus 3, 8 plus 1, 9. So here board meeting resolution. Then the fifth one if I am now going 2 crore related party transaction beyond ALP. Now again I have to count 5 plus 3 plus 1, 9 plus 2, 11. So yes, this is beyond ALP. Now for this transaction alone, ordinary resolution plus board meeting resolution. That's how I need to read. Ordinary resolution plus board meeting resolution. So basically if everything you do within arm's length price, 188 will never come into the picture. Includes immobile property, intellectual property rights, trademarks, patents, all that. Yes. Next. Leasing of property of any kind. Leasing. Leasing of property of any kind. What resolution is needed? Board meeting resolution. Here, leasing through agents is not there. Just leasing of property of any kind. What resolution is needed? Board meeting resolution. 10% of turnover. 10% of Turnover again, what resolution? Ordinary resolution. It includes a you know, franchisee model as well. Includes a franchisee model. Obviously, uh, you can uh, give more franchises, take up franchises, leasing, leasing the property is what they say. Next, they speak about uh, services. Availing, availing service or rendering, both. Availing service, rendering service, either directly or even through agents. If you do, all cases board meeting resolution but if the transaction value is 10 percent of turnover again then ordinary resolution has to be taken into account now this services etc through agents etc what do you mean by these services they're all business and all commercial services so to speak but what about uh, if the company takes service of the uh, managing director of the company or director of the company is it like availing service? I mean, of, of course, it's a contract of service or contract for service. Is it service? They said no. Directors, etc., if they I mean provide services to the company, then it will not be taken into consideration. But what if the director happens to be also a chartered accountant and you need some, uh, uh, what do you say, opinion from that guy? So, in the capacity of a professional, you take an opinion and you give him some 1 lakh rupees. Is it service? I mean, is it, what do you say? taken I mean part of 188 1D is the question again so if you see professional services like CS, CMA, CA, doctor, engineer, lawyer are actually excluded in 1956 act same may continue under this law also if any beneficial provision is there retrospective so there in the old law the same will continue in the new law that is the interpretation of statute unless there is any penalty which is more penalty now then that will not continue and any law cannot be made applicable retrospectively if there is outflow of more penal provisions. So this based on that, uh, you know, beneficial construction because any benefit should be constructed in a way that even the future uh, laws, unless it's specifically prohibited, it's not prohibited. So you can take that into account. Availing or rendering of service. Now this section is practically not feasible because it's very difficult for you to fix a arm's length price for service arm's length price for service so all these ipl players actually are giving their services now what is the rate somebody gets 10 crore 14 crore 16 crore etc it is what is arm's length price it is absurd so you will say this fellow got 10 crore is not worth it that is according to you but according to the management it is worth it right so if you see again services are something which anybody can say that it is well within the arm's length price, especially when you give consultancy services, nothing is beyond arm's length actually, everything is within arm's length price. Such related parties appointment to any office or place of profit in the company, subsidiary company or associate company. 
in the company subsidiary company associate company so you need to see first of all uh, either the director or the related party of the director is entering into office or place of profit where in that company then what subsidiary company and associate company subsidiary company and associate company first of all the director then related party director can if he is earning anything which is over and above remuneration is what they say anything over and above remuneration related party they say if he is earning anything any remuneration office or place of profit should not be misguided by the words it's of no use whether you are an office or place of profit is of no use because here what do you mean by an office or a place of profit it only boils down to remuneration that you are earning so if the director's related party is appointed as a uh, floor manager appointed as a sales manager appointed as an attender appointed as a watchman doesn't matter what matters is the money so if the money if he is earning up to 250000 monthly remuneration 250000 monthly remuneration then board meeting resolution if it's exceeding 250000 monthly then only ordinary resolution plus board meeting resolution right and mind you again it doesn't matter about the designation it is the money so anything for this guy this guy anyway remuneration is fixed under 197 over and ab above that remuneration if he is getting something extra for example director is also acting as a debenture trustee he is getting 1 lakh rupees extra as a debenture trustee that is over and above remuneration recently 2 like 3 years ago they have banned any director should not be a debenture trustee but earlier it was allowed so if you are getting in some other capacity money that you are getting then that will be called as any remuneration over and above so the keywords for director is what over and above remuneration keyword for uh, what do you say related party is what anything and what is that anything and over and above the the mc has fixed the amount 250000 monthly remuneration up to 250000 monthly remuneration uh, what resolution bmr beyond 250000 or plus bmr again i told you office or place doesn't matter designation doesn't matter in the exam they keep asking this and guys that should be appointed in the company in the associate company or subsidiary if you actually are appointed in the holding company it is not applicable if a person who is a director of this company is being appointed in the holding company right a related party a director of this company is being appointed as a sales manager of the holding company for 5 lakh rupees no related party transaction right but institute in some of the questions have have ignored this so even if you have what do you say a uh, director of the if you are a related party and if you have been appointed in the holding company also they have actually taken the answer to be related party transaction so in my q and a book i have given that uh, author's note which clearly says what is the provision and what has the institute given in the suggested answers right yeah so company associate company and other things so some of you are asking me should i buy that q and a book if i have already bought before simply don't waste money i am honest always it's again split into two but i would suggest you to go with part number b because in part number b there are many changes especially i have given 13 mock exams which i have only framed with a group of rank holders so a lot of work went into it 13 mock exams is higher than icai level so if you solve those papers it will really help you along with answers are also given 13 mock exams which are divided into tests of 50 and overall 100 if you have already purchased before like last time and all if you have purchased no need to buy part a but if you have not purchased at all both part a and part b will really help you but those who have already bought i always keep telling you you keep asking me last year i bought a book should i buy again not needed 
will be only few changes why do you want to waste money right honestly i am telling you but if you have not got the q and a i would suggest you to buy but if you already got the q and a at least part b you buy because that has lot of good stuff and all there are so many mcqs which are given in the previous q and a i have removed most of it and only retained the relevant ones and i have added more uh, integrated mcqs etc so only that is enough so these books etc keep changing so you need not keep buying again and again right as similarly there will be no like what are the statement of changes etc which are there that cannot be given also the books keep changing so you need not keep purchasing already whatever you have that is more than enough if you have like some four year old book then it's a different thing but you would have just purchased six months ago eight months ago one year ago don't keep wasting money on you know these things unnecessarily unless you don't have the book at all then yes of course but if you have the q and a book already then part b would add value because it has some extra stuff which is not there in the other thing so in part a anyway we have redesigned everything and added questions so every attempt or every once a year at least we'll keep adding questions right so that obviously is part of the deal so nothing can be done yeah moving on uh this is done next uh such related part is appointment to any office or place of profit we discussed a uh, director over and above remuneration related party of director any remuneration up to 250 monthly remuneration board meeting resolution ordinary resolution for monthly remuneration more than 250000 rupees and uh, yeah the thing is what if to avoid this ordinary resolution what if i draw 240000 per month at the end of the year i draw some 6 lakhs bonus what do you think now is this uh, what do you say violation of 188 there was a case law ravinder kumar singhal case law where they say that perquisites accruing on monthly basis only should be included because they have used the word monthly remuneration so whatever may be whatever you feel correct that that it is wrong etc but the law is the law it says monthly remuneration so annual payments like bonus leave and cashment are not to be included in the monthly remuneration and lastly if it is uh, underwriting if any related party is giving underwriting services of the derivatives etc all cases bmr and the transaction value exceeding in all other cases it is amounting to only in this case it is exceeding exceeding 1% of the net worth here it is not amounting to it is exceeding 1% of net worth resolution ordinary other points anyway it's not there in that so some extra shots the notice of the board meeting at which the resolution is proposed to be moved shall disclose all these things name of the related party nature duration of the related material terms of contract any advance if you have paid etc what are the pricing and commercial terms everything but guys one thing now if you are a director and also a shareholder and you obviously are a related party to the company can you be present in the meeting when you are voting as a shareholder in 184 i said it is possible but in 188 only if it is a related party transaction beyond arms length price a specific exclusion is there where any director is interested in any contract or arrangement with a related party such director shall not be present at the meeting during discussions on the subject matter of the resolution this is anyway 184 we know then you see fourth point no member of the company shall vote on such ordinary resolution to approve any contract referred to in this section if such member happens to be a related party this is a specific exclusion for members in related party transactions this is anyway 184 and i have to give an explanatory statement this is in addition to 102 all these things must be there name of the related party name of the director or kmp who is related to it nature of the entire relationships relationship nature material terms monetary value and particulars of the contract or arrangement everything any other information relevant or important for the members to take a decision this also has to be taken into account now all these things uh, were there now as i already told you if there is a private company private company let us say 184 abc 
they are only the shareholders they are only the uh, directors whatever now first one it is coming to the board meeting level can they vote at the meeting can they vote at the meeting we have already seen yes they can vote under 184 they have to disclose and they can vote now let us say it's going against the beyond the threshold beyond alp board meeting resolution they'll vote no problem then the same will come to whom abc as shareholders are the related party yes can they vote actually no but then for private companies there was an exemption where they say same on 5th june 2015 that second proviso it spoke about this members this one this one will not apply to private company 188 subsection 1 second proviso member cannot vote will not apply to private company so a private company can definitely vote this was an exemption given way back in 2015 188 subsection 1 second proviso will not apply this is sorted listed company no tension directors will uh, i mean not all will be interested at us quorum will be formed anyway they will vote it and when it comes to shareholders lakhs of shareholders will be there in that some 10 20 30 related parties doesn't matter they will uh, go out others will vote but the problem was with unlisted companies unlisted companies are like private companies only but they are actually public companies unlisted public companies so there uh, what do you say the in some institutional investors will be there so predominantly out of 10 people almost around nine will be related parties or relatives only one institutional investor would have invested such companies there was a deadlock created why directors also cannot vote when it goes to the shareholders only one shareholder is there meeting can it be with one person except is Nithyan, except your nithyananda no so then the problem is this was the problem with lot of unlisted companies so to give some exemption to them this line is added this restriction is not applicable or shall not apply to a company it's predominantly actually unlisted company in which 90 percent or more members in number are either relatives of promoters or they happen to be related parties in these closely held companies my grandmother will be a director my grandfather will be a director right so the grandson or granddaughter will just go and get some document signed that's it correct my great uncle will be md it happens you also have seen but we have to obviously support these kind of family businesses and of course since they want to go public some large institutions would have invested or at least some venture capitalists would have invested if you show promise in the entire deal. So the thing is, in that case, that's why this point. This though they say a company, private company anyway is not called because it's called under the exemption before. Listed company immaterial. It's actually for unlisted public companies. Then ordinary resolution and restricting on voting is not applicable to what government company in respect of contract or arrangement entered into with any other government company. So, if BHEL enters into a contract with Bank of India, it will not apply if the ministry approval is taken. Similarly, if Airports Authority of India enters into a contract with Cement Corporation of India, unlisted government company, ministry approval is taken, not apply. Then, uh, if the related party transactions are happening both in holding and subsidiary, should I pass resolution in both or in only one? Because if you see directors of subsidiary, etc., holding, holding are anyway covered. That company, holding company are anyway covered. So they are related parties. Now, if the transaction are happening between them, where will you pass the resolution? Holding or subsidiary? So if you see, only in case of wholly owned subsidiary, ordinary resolution passed by holding company shall be sufficient. Normal subsidiary, both companies you need to file, you need to pass. Only in case of wholly owned subsidiary only. Wholly owned subsidiary. As already discussed, the interested director in the related party transaction under section 188. 
shall disclose his interest in the board meeting as specified in section 184 and shall also not participate in the meeting as specified in section 184 unless you are a private company private company of course you can do so normal company cannot this we have already seen interested director yes however interested director of a private company can participate in the meeting after disclosure of the interest and as discussed 188 second proviso will not apply to a private company already discussed and in 188 uh, there is also in 177 audit committee if you link both there is something called as omnibus approval omnibus approval that is blanket approval so rather than going through 188 etc under 177 you can go for a omnibus approval you can tell these are the prospective related party transactions that are going to happen during the year so kindly approve so that's a fundamental difference in 177 all transactions whether in the ordinary course of business or not whether arms length or not everything requires approval under the omnibus route that's another point omnibus approval so all related party transactions are required approval of the audit committee and the audit committee may make omnibus approval for related party transaction proposed to be entered into it shall take the approval of the board of directors and make omnibus approval based on certain things they will only fix a maximum value of transactions allowed under the omnibus route they will only fix the maximum value per transaction which can be allowed they will only give the extent of disclosure that are needed they will keep on reviewing at such intervals this is a separate provision under 177 because of the strict guideline under 177 and also because of uh, lodr uh, you know other regulations and sebi regulations that are stricter than uh, this particular 188 188 is a toothless tiger honestly because first of all you should only apply when beyond arms length price all things are anyway covered in omnibus approval so to that extent of the thing uh, practically it is not that great then uh, in what do you say section 188 was lodr if you want to link it related party definition is linked to 2 clause 76 for seeking authorization but for accounting purposes they have taken in day s 24 right it's a wide definition related party definition in uh, the lodr which is linked to in day s they say transfer of resources services or obligation regardless of whether a price is charged or not deadly here we are seeing beyond alp within alp there everything is covered whether you charge a price don't charge a price whether it's alp beyond alp everything is covered and material related party transaction should be more than 10% of the annual consolidated turnover and other things are fine and uh, there no related parties can either abstain from voting or if they feel that it is not benefiting them they can also vote negatively under lodr here i cannot vote only no so there i can vote negatively imagine either abstain not voting for either abstain or vote negatively these are the additional points which are there in the lodr now this is a very very important chart guys comprehensive penal provision chart of what 185 186 184 188 comprehensive chart everything is covered here all the what do you say penal provisions which are applicable under these four uh, areas first who is penalized come in 185 company director and other person other person is all those uh, related parties that we have seen firm private company body corporate all that how much 5 lakh to 25 lakh fine 5 lakh to 25 lakh director or officer in default or the any other person imprisonment section it is up to 6 months or 5 lakh to 25 lakh or both generally i will tell you do not remember any penal provisions because you will not remember but this entire chart is important you have to remember every single thing up to 6 months or 5 lakh to 25 lakh or both now this is a compoundable offense compounding yes what are compoundable offenses whenever they use the word fine or imprisonment or both you can escape imprisonment by 
paying the fine uh, of course by approaching the relevant authority some cases rd some cases it is nclt so they will give the compounding provisions compounding offenses was a part of your ca final syllabus removed not there i mean they will not give you what are the features of compounding but you need to know that this offense is a compoundable offense the beauty about 185 is the contract is no way affected contract is not affected contract will go on but penal provisions will apply in the old law 1956 if you by mistake gave a let's say 10 lakh loan and then immediately got it repaid then there was no penal provision here no proportionate reduction in penal provision even if you rectify the mistake so once if you have breached it gone and this will not entail any disqualification it will not entail any vacation 185 186 who all are liable company every officer in default 25000 to 5 lakh 25000 to 5 lakh for the company whereas for the officer in default 25000 to 1 lakh and deadly if you breach 186 provisions officer in default and any director who is responsible for this it is a non compoundable offense which means under 186 you cannot escape imprisonment non compoundable offense and you can get jail time up to 2 years contract again is not affected here no proportional reduction also no disqualification no vacation on the other hand under 184 if you do not follow we have already seen penalty of not up to 1 lakh penalty of 1 lakh from 21st december 2020 after the amendment and what happens to the contract contract is voidable at the option of the shareholders here contract will get affected no relaxation compounding yes no disqualification nevertheless we have seen vacation of office under 167 1c and d vacation of office 167 1c and d moving on to the last part 188 related party transactions who is penalized director director or every officer in default will have to indemnify the company for loss indemnify means compensate and if you are a listed company penalty of not up to penalty of 25 lakh other companies penalty of 5 lakh that's it direct and again here it is voidable at the option of the board of directors or shareholders voidable at the option of the board of directors or shareholders why board of directors bmr wherever shareholders needed shareholders that is if you do not take the required permission within 3 months that's what they say relaxation no generally we have seen the word prior ordinary resolution but because of some other subsection they have told prior ordinary resolution is not needed you just have to take the approval within 3 months basically you can enter into a related party transaction and take approval within 3 months if you don't take it then this will come contract will get affected voidable at the option of whom board of directors slash shareholders no relaxation uh, any there is nothing like that compounding is available because anyway it's just a penal penalty so now disqualification will come guys if you have been convicted though though the wording said you are convicted if you are convicted in the last 5 years of any related party transaction conviction is almost impossible so it is bad framing but in the exam they will ask you please note that the answer only should be that since he is not convicted is not disqualified and of course if you are by chance convicted then automatically vacation of office under 167 1a this is a comprehensive penal provision chart covering the whole of 180 uh, 8 all this i studied and went they asked one more question they said the company has taken uh, what do you say old furniture from the director actually worth 10 lakhs but they recorded it as 1 crore and in exchange they have given shares worth 1 crore now this is not related party transaction this is not loans to directors this is not book debt it is an exchange of assets right that is why we have one more section 192 restrictions on non cash transactions involving directors section 192 
a company can acquire or sell assets for consideration other than cash from a director or person connected with director means what emotional connection what is this connection not defined anywhere guidance note says 185 list that's why that list is so important icai guidance note mind you icai guidance note somewhere hidden they have told person connected with director means 185 list not defined anywhere right from a director or person connected with director thank you of the company holding subsidiary associate company everyone only if what ordinary resolution is passed now here also they are saying you can acquire or sell assets from for consideration other than cash exchange of assets you can do so from a director or the 185 list if where of the company holding subsidiary associate everybody covered here only if ordinary resolution is passed so it's prior ordinary resolution basically shareholders should know ask the shareholders seek their permission simple ordinary resolution would do if not done contract becomes voidable if not done contract becomes so basically voidable you will see here also 184 is also voidable then 188 is also voidable similarly 192 is also voidable contract becomes voidable then also one more voidable is what uh, omnibus approval if you do not follow then also it becomes voidable so if you see that is given here there if a director enters into a transaction with the company for less than 1 crore rupees and doesn't take approval from the committee within 3 months transaction will be voidable if it is more than 1 crore you are taking you need to take prior approval of audit committee if you are taking less than 1 crore if you can go ahead but of course you should take the approval of the audit committee within 3 months otherwise voidable so voidable you will see in audit committee point that is omnibus approval then you will see in 184 we will see in 188 we are seeing in 192 so all these things they can ask these are the areas where there it is voidable right that's what it is so that is regarding cluster number 3 uh, connected points in cluster number 4 if you remember is what is the quorum and other couple of points which we need to finish yes coming back to quorum here quorum provisions what is quorum guys uh, one third of total strength or two directors correct right? one third of total strength or two directors which we have seen One tenth of total strength or two direct. So, if some examples we should take. Yes. So, one tenth of the total strength. When I see the total strength, I should see basically there can be two things: total number of directors in the company and the interested directors for that particular item of business are eight. For example, the total number of directors are fifteen, of which of which eight directors are interested. at the meeting at the meeting total number of directors who have come for the meeting are 13 correct and of which the interested directors who have again come for the meeting are 8 which means two disinterested directors here actually two disinterested directors are happen to be uninterested yes or no so out of 15 13 have come interested directors have come for the meeting now the question is when i am computing one third of total strength Should I do one third of fifteen or one third of thirteen? Always one third of fifteen. One third of fifteen always. So one third of fifteen. So that would be five or two, whichever is higher. Obviously, it is five. Five or two, whichever is higher, it is five. However, when I am computing whether there is quorum or not in the company for that particular item of business, obviously I should see who all have come for the meeting. 13 are the total number of interested directors uh, sorry total number of directors of which 8 are interested so how many would be the disinterested directors 13 minus 8 5 so number of disinterested directors who should form part of the quorum as per calculation should be 5 and how many are there 5 that's why quorum is fulfilled no problem second example total number of directors in the company 12 
so basically i should do 1/3 of 12 that is 4 or 2 whichever is i or 4 then i have to directly for the meeting i should see nine people have come of which five are interested so 9 minus 5 4 so of course what should have been the quorum 4 what is the quorum 4 yes quorum provisions are satisfied third example uh, there are 18 directors in the company of which uh, 12 are interested directors let me for this moment make it 14 just for your knowledge 14 now what should be ideally the directors one i mean two third how much one third of 18 six directors or two whichever is higher yeah. now it should be six without even seeing how many have come leave that you see 18 directors are actually there of which 14 are interested so how many are the disinterested directors four even if all four come there will be absolutely no quorum that's why i took 14 now because here 12 is there in this actual example 12 was there so here let's take 14 to understand so the thing is even if four people come there is no way that quorum can ever be formed so it is absurd just because the number of interested directors are higher does it mean i should deprive the other four from voting no on the other hand if you take now this example 12 so actually six directors are disinterested and what is the quorum six again it is impractical to expect all six out of six to end up coming for the mean i should give some breathing space here i feel i should give some breathing space when there are 14 obviously even if all four come also quorum is not met so to ensure that there is a level playing field for other people 1741 quorum provisions will not apply because there is a new concessional quorum provisions under 1743 under the concessional quorum provisions it says if in the company the number of interested directors happen to be greater than or equal to 2/3 of total strength what is the quorum 1/3 So, if two third, in fact, are interested in this example, exactly two third are interested. What is two third of eighteen? Twelve. Correct. That's why interested at disinterested directors are six. So, in a scene where interested directors are twelve, two third of total strength also is twelve. It's equal, which means I can expect, cannot expect the remaining disinterested directors to actually show up. Not possible. So, that's why what they say, if at all there is, what do you say, number of interested directors is greater than or equal to 2/3 of total strength in that case 1741 will not apply what will apply 1743 as per 1743 quorum is two people two disinterested directors so in this example 14 minus 10 4 what is actually needed two definitely quorum is there quorum is there then this example for example so first what i should do first i should always compute 1741 one third of 12 4 or 2 whichever is higher then i should also compute 1743 number of interested directors in the company are 9 not who are coming for the meeting number of interested directors in the company are 9 next i have to compute what 2 thirds of total strength is 8 so i told you if the interested directors are greater than or equal to 2/3 of total strength in this case 9 is greater than 8 obviously so 174 1 will not apply what will apply 174 3 as per 174 3 concessional quorum provisions the number of disinterested directors minimum 2 shall form the quorum 11 minus 9 2 that forms the quorum Moving on, last example. Uh, in the company, how many people are there? Fifteen. In the company, fifteen people are there. So, what should be the what do you say? Now, one third of total strength. One third of total strength is five. Five or two, whichever is higher. Five. Next, I will have to see uh, what do you say? The two thirds of two thirds of total strength happens to be ten. Interested directors happen to be eleven. So is eleven greater than ten? Yes. So what is the quorum? Two disinterested directors. 
two disinterested directors should form the quorum two disinterested directors should form the quorum so here 10 minus 9 only one so 174 1 anyway will not apply will 174 3 also will it apply no generally why because there should be minimum two people here how many are there one so can there be a one man quorum no but you need to understand this yes you need to see what type of company they are asking private limited we have seen in private limited as per section 184 this the directors should disclose and directors can vote directors should disclose and directors can vote should disclose can vote so in this case all 10 out of 10 directors can vote provided they disclose so i can say that the concessional quorum provisions 174 3 will anyway not apply to a private company by virtue of 184 because under 184 i can disclose i should disclose rather and i can vote so those are some of the hidden points now you see you will understand this uh yeah check it out yesterday we read all these things that's okay read this concessional quorum check this out 23 Interested directors, what does it say? Specified in 1842 will not be counted for quorum. Will not be counted for quorum. The power is gone. Interested directors specified in 1842 will not be counted for the purpose of quorum. Concessional quorum 1743, where the number of interested directors exceed or is equal to two thirds of the total strength, then the number of remaining directors. who are not interested but present at the meeting not less than 2 shall be the quorum articles can provide for a larger quorum articles can give a larger quorum no problem so there is an animation video also you can just scan it and watch it at a leisure it will give you all these whatever i discussed in an animated format yes that fellow will explain better than me so it's okay yes quorum should present what not only at the commencement but throughout the meeting for every item of business since the number of interested directors will change for every item of business already discussed where all the directors of the company or more than 2/3 are interested the remedy is we have already seen this increase the strength not found practicable then you know we have seen that ha huh. and the same quorum should be present for what both at the adjourned meeting also and the normal meeting also there is no concept of concessional quorum if the quorum for the board meeting is not present within 15 minutes unless the articles otherwise provide a meeting shall automatically stand adjourned same day same time same place next week and if that day is a national holiday succeeding day which is not a national holiday interesting to note original agm cannot be held on national holiday adjourned agm can be held on national holiday on the other hand original board meeting original board meeting can be held cannot be held original board meeting can be held on any day but if it is adjourned for want of quorum cannot be held on a national holiday a resolution passed at the adjourned meeting will be treated as having passed at the date on which it was in fact passed and not on any earlier date so if you see uh, if i pass a resolution in the original meeting then the meeting is adjourned In the adjourned meeting, some new business was taken over, and or or the old business only was discussed, and a uh, actual resolution was passed there. So when should I take the date as original meeting or adjourned meeting? Adjourned meeting always. Uh, yeah. Then this again, I have given the same thing. Original meeting can be held on national holiday. Adjourned only for want of quorum cannot be held on national holiday. Adjourned meeting for other reasons. chapel mike that reason though that can be held on what national holiday also no problem the adjourned meeting for other reasons okay given can be held on national holiday so quorum master chart if you see quorum master chart in that of course general meeting provisions you can just go through in uh, regular and fast track we do a more in depth analysis that's not needed for us now there's no time that you can go through board meeting what is the board meeting seen one thing they can definitely ask is can the board fix a what do you say can the quorum of a board meeting be more than one third 
can articles prescribe a larger quorum is the question for shareholders meeting uh, they say unless the articles prescribe a larger quorum but there is nothing here which says board meeting should be larger or smaller so the act uses the word shall be act uses the word shall be the quorum of the board meeting shall be one third now when i use the word shall be does it mean it's fixed at one third or is it minimum so there are many interpretations to it but the correct interpretation and more importantly the ici interpretation is what shall be shall be read as at least shall be to be read as we have discussed almost half an hour in regular class let's there's no time but now conclusion only is important shall be means what at least at least what one third at least means that one third is at least articles can fix a larger quorum more the merrier they can say 50% 60% whatever they want so board meeting 174 one one third of the total strength of two directors whichever is higher under 174 3 if the interested director is greater than or equal to two thirds of total strength then 174 one will not apply 174 3 will apply minimum two disinterested directors minimum two disinterested directors under what under 174 3 minimum two disinterested directors 1743 is not applicable to private companies by virtue of 184 already explained 184 director should disclose and can vote should disclose and can vote minimum okay quorum for section 8 companies 8 members or 25% whichever is less minimum 2 already explained this yes adjourned board meeting quorum should be the same as 174 1 we already seen this this is as per ss1 and also i mean this is actually as per the act now in the adjourned meeting also there is no quorum original meeting nobody comes adjourned meeting also nobody comes so will it be further adjourned to go to ss1 they say the meeting shall stand cancelled meeting shall stand cancelled no further deliberations will be taken into account that is regarding quorum master chart Moving on now, last part of this lesson number four would be what? One eighty, yeah. Restrictions on the powers of the board. One eighty. Important again, regularly asked because we ignore this. They'll ask. right restrictions on powers of the board section 180 board should not exercise the specified powers without the consent of the shareholders by a special resolution the board is not bound to exercise the powers even though the company passes such resolution so basically it is board meeting resolution will be passed first or any normal board resolution then i have to take the consent special resolution and again it will come back to the board of directors they can decide whether to go ahead or not just because the company gives the consent board is not bound to exercise the powers just because they passed gave a consent so it should be bmr or br plus sr plus br that's the overall thing only for these items what are those items all the powers under the section are exercisable only with the prior consent by special resolution and this section 180 shall not apply to a private company 180 will apply only to a public company because it talks about certain things which anyway private companies can be uh, ignored now first one 181a 181a speaks about disposal of undertaking to sell lease or otherwise dispose of to sell lease or otherwise dispose of the whole or substantially the whole of the undertaking 
टू सेल लीज और अदरवाइज डिस्पोज ऑफ द होल और सब्सटैंशियली द होल ऑफ द अंडरटेकिंग नाउ वॉट यू मीन बाई अंडरटेकिंग फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल अंडरटेकिंग शेल मीन एन अंडरटेकिंग सुपर गोइंग अहेड विच द इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑफ द कंपनी एक्सीड्स ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ इट्स नेटवर्क सो इफ वन कंपनी इन्वेस्ट ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ इट्स नेटवर्क इन अनदर कंपनी और एनी अदर बेसिकली अंडरटेकिंग कैन बी एनीथिंग इट कैन बी अ डिविजन कैन बी अ ब्रांच इट कैन बी सब्सिडरी इट कैन बी एनीथिंग सो इफ आई इन्वेस्ट ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ माई नेटवर्क इन अ डिविजन आई एम आई टी सी आई इन्वेस्ट ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ माई थिंग इन आई टी सी होटल्स एन इज आई टी सी होटल्स इज इट एन अंडरटेकिंग येस दैट्स ऑल एज पर दर्डेड बैलेंस शीट और आईदर दिस और an undertaking which generates 20% of the total income of the company during the previous financial year either i invest 20% of my net worth or that entity itself is generating 20% i would not have invested in tobacco so much right uh, itc would not have invested in tobacco as much as it has invested in itc hotels but itc tobacco division is giving let's say 60% of the income of ITC is that an undertaking? Yes. The ITC Tobacco Division is an undertaking. We are in, just an example. ITC Hotels is an undertaking, not because it's getting money for the ITC company. It is because of investment. This is undertaking. Now it says whole of the undertaking or substantially the whole of the undertaking. Substantially the whole of the undertaking means what? That also they have given. substantially the whole of the undertaking in any financial year shall mean 20% or more of the value of the undertaking either the whole of tobacco division or 20% of the tobacco division is also called substantial right that's what we need to understand here you need to understand it is sell lease or otherwise dispose will otherwise include gift will otherwise include gift will otherwise include uh, mortgage will otherwise include mortgage all that we need to understand so basically uh, if i there is actually a case law also royal hatcheries versus state of andhra pradesh where uh, hatcheries means obviously it was uh, uh, you know the it was a poultry farm with uh, you know obviously also rearing uh, the poultry for not only meat but also eggs etc but then later i mean the uh, andhra pradesh government was taxing them under various legislations and the example of that particular law it said cat dog sheep cow buffalo horse etc now they said under etc this poultry also will come it went to court so they said will the word etc include tiger first of all no why because as you can see these are all domesticated animals correct but what about uh, you know, will it include hen because the royal hatcheries will it include hen was the question though they are domesticated so basically you should see all the words here if they are part of a genus or a genre so then so if you see if they are part of one uh, particular group then the generic word etc the generic word etc also should be derived from the same meaning so these are all what four legged domesticated animals four legged domesticated animals this is neither domesticated i mean this is not definitely not domesticated hen is definitely domesticated but it is not an animal it's a two legged bird so if you see this is called as uh, interpretation of statute adjustum generis so under adjustum generis if you uh, interpret that here sell lease or otherwise dispose sell lease or otherwise dispose otherwise dispose means what other than selling or leasing so i cannot go to if it says decathlon says sports and other equipment sports and other things i can can't go to decathlon and say give me 1 kg basmati rice it's weird right because you say other other means everything no other means anything related to sports right so similarly here sell lease or otherwise dispose sell means what ownership is transferred lease here to be construed as financial lease ownership is transferred and in return what are you getting you are getting some money in sell and lease you are getting some consideration obviously so basically here i should see first ownership should be transferred in exchange for money 
so otherwise will not include gift because in gift ownership is transferred no money mortgage in mortgage you are not transferring ownership you are transferring possession or part of the control that does mean ownership is going away uh, that's but you are getting money in return that that is besides the point you are not transferring what ownership so this will not include gifts or mortgage the only possible uh, explanation to otherwise is a different type of mortgage which in india they do not do it's called usufructuary mortgage usufructuary mortgage you have to be little careful otherwise some other word will come yes usufructuary mortgage so what is this mortgage all about this mortgage in that ownership only is transferred first ownership only is transferred it's a different kind of mortgage not prevalent in india it's more like sale and buyback transaction it is not prevalent in india actually but in usufructuary mortgage ownership is transferred to you first and then you will give me 1 crore for that and later i can buy back my own property at 1.2 crores that extra 20 lakhs is your income that's how it it works in india it's not there anyway even if some people do that through various agreements i'm not saying it's illegal they said it's not prevalent in india so otherwise would be a usufructuary mortgage that's it it will not be a gift it will not be a normal mortgage english mortgage and all that yes so that is what it is if you see your special resolution passed here may prescribe conditions regarding the use disposal or investment of the sale proceeds which may result from any of these transactions 181a if it is not followed properly this the based on this a four mark question they asked if 181a even if it is not followed properly means what the company without following all the resolutions has given it to one person and that person has sold it to a person already without following the resolutions properly that person has already sold it to a bona fide purchaser it's a good it's an undertaking it's an undertaking now immovable property doesn't matter now the question here is if i come to know that this has not been passed properly can i invalidate this transaction and get the property back was the question asked in the exam for four marks so will the bona fide purchaser get a good title or not in sale of goods act there is a concept which we have deemed to have studied which is one nemo dat quad non habit nemo dot uh, nemo dat quad non habit means you cannot transfer to somebody what you don't have if you don't have a good ownership you cannot transfer a better ownership but there are various exceptions under nemo dat quad non habit similar to that though here it's an undertaking which is immovable this is like an exception where they say even though if it is not followed properly a good title is still passed to the person who buys or takes on lease any property investment or undertaking in good faith any property investment undertaking in good faith if you take it in good faith a good title is passed so even though it is uh, going through a person who obviously did not get a good title it is like river ganga during covid it is cleansed of all the defects correct so it goes through the other person it is uh, the what do you say bona fide purchaser it's as if it is cleansed of all previous defects and he will get a good title will get a good title is what they say that is regarding 181a selling of an undertaking so we have understood what is sell lease or otherwise moving on 181b 181b and 181c have to be linked with so many things because it talks about investment the moment i see investment two other sections will come 186 will come investment in the securities of a body corporate then one more investment 179 3e will come that is investing the funds of the company that's exactly why we did not do it yesterday so 186 and 179 3e on the other hand when i use the word borrow money when i use the word borrow money nothing of 186 will come but 179 3d will come i am borrowing money so borrowing money is one part and 181c is the other part here so what do we do 181b on the other hand invest now otherwise than in trust security invest otherwise than in trust security amount of compensation received by it as a result of any merger or amalgamation what do you mean by that trust security means what risk free investment government bonds and all those things in amount of compensation so here the source of the money source of the money should be what guys compensation received by it as a result of merger or amalgamation so what is the source of money compensation 
so i merged with some other company i received compensation now that compensation i am investing this company is investing compensation merger includes demerger so let's say this company got demerged and it got some consideration now i want to invest that con consideration if i invest it in trust securities no problem this section will come only if i invest otherwise than in trust securities if i invest in risky investments only then 181b will come to give some context to it so let us uh, check this out investment are covered under three things 17931881b and 18622c 18622c is what investment in the securities of a body corporate so checking out here the source is what i need to see source can be purchase consideration from mergers and amalgamation it can be purchase consideration from mergers and amalgamations or it can be what anything else normal money that you get now i have to understand what is the use of that money where am i investing i can invest in three things i can invest in trust securities that like bond issued by cg i can invest in the shares of a company or for example i can invest it in mutual fund by any uh, you know company which is run as a trust example let's so one let's see one by one if i am investing it in trust securities for example if i am investing in bonds issued by central government then what will happen obviously i am investing what is the source merger amalgamation where am i investing trust security and what am i investing in of course uh, risk free trust securities and money i have received from that no problem so 181b will not come what will come then 17930e board meeting resolution and yesterday i told you as per 117 whatever resolutions you which go through special resolution has to be filed and whatever goes through 17930 also you have to file mgt 14 MGT 14 has to be filed even for 179 three provisions. That is point number one. Second, come to this. This is very easy, guys. Any money source is not purchase consideration. Source is generated funds from the company. No problem. I am investing it where. If I am investing in the securities of a body corporate, then what? Section one eighty six. We already know that up to sixty or hundred percent of PUC FRSP BMR unanimous. Beyond that, by special resolution, we have seen all that already discussed. If it is other than that, any other than that, then it's very easy. One seventy nine three, investing the funds of the company. But here the tricky part is this: if I am using it, if I am using it. to invest in the shares of a company source of the money was mergers and amalgamation purchase consideration i should use it in trust security no problem but if i am using it somewhere else then it is an issue issue means i have to obviously follow two sections one 181b one more is what i am issuing the shares of a company investing in shares of the company so 18622c 181b and 18622c both have to be followed how 181b and 18 so basically if it is less than 60 or 100% now before that we'll just finish this part because it's very easy if i am investing in mutual fund units of raha mutual fund which is run as a trust 18622c will not come because it is not securities of a body corporate so but 181b will come because it is otherwise than trust securities and 17930e also will come 17930 is the normal uh, provisions of investment so i have to pass a board meeting resolution and a special resolution and again a board meeting resolution where i can delegate it to a managing director also under 1793 but since i am passing a resolution under 179 i have to file mgt 14 i have to file mgt 14 now let's come to this now 181b plus 1862c i am investing what money that i have received from purchase consideration am i investing in trust securities no i am investing in otherwise than in trust securities where for example shares of company so the combined reading of 181b and 1862c how does it work if it is 
less than 60 or 100 percent I have to see LGSI already made plus to be made less than 60 or 100 percent first of all board meeting resolution plus unanimous approval plus PFI approval if at all there is a default generally I did not require any special resolution but because of 181B because I am investing otherwise than in trust security I require a special resolution under 181B are you getting it plus MGT 14 plus MGT 14 if you are not understanding this point once the YouTube is released pause me and coolly see no problem next greater than 60 or 100 percent greater than 60 or 100 percent it is what prior PFI approval slightly is little trickier that's right prior PFI okay plus prior special resolution the beauty is same meeting but two special resolutions have to pass one special resolution for investing otherwise than in trust security one special resolution for investing in the securities of body corporate simple plus board meeting resolution plus unanimous approval plus MGT 14 this question all will not come like that if you think see December 21 paper again right that's why so anything they can ask I'm not trying to scare you but that was one of the best papers in the recent history December 21 excellent questions they had given so they can ask any question any line anything they can ask you because they are now moving towards that open book exam only I am very sure even the people are discussing the next like maybe two years or something not now in the near future they will move on to what an open book exam even for paper 4 good for us right so 181b where you can carry the bear act imagine so 181b and 186 2c plus board meeting resolution plus unanimous plus mgt 14 so they can ask any question guys and slowly and steadily they are changing the way questions are being asked in the examination it's no longer direct questions as such i'm not saying all the 100 full 100 marks will be difficult definitely around 40 to 50 will be very easy 20 to 30 will be okay okay but yes 20 to 30 will be extremely standard questions so we have to earn the marks that's as simple as that i am not saying all 100 marks will be difficult 100 percent you can pass there is no thing that you cannot pass you will definitely pass 50 you can get but here we are sitting here not to get 50 you are sitting here to get 70 plus because that extra 20 25 marks if you get in law then it will you can you know distribute to other people correct no problem uh, earlier others used to distribute to us now we are distributing correct so if you see that's what it is yeah so source m and a and then anything that's all simple so that is regarding what uh, simple only 181b 181b next 181c last part 181c is to what borrow money correct some of you are seeing time when is lunch break yeah. one dialogue i'll put time will pass will you oh no you will also pass yeah yeah so section 181c correct 181 all of us will pass guys 181c borrow money i told you to get food start eating no problem 179 3d section 181c is what borrowing money borrowing money 179 3d is one thing which you already know this borrowing money is what then where the money to be borrowed together with the money already borrowed will exceed how much aggregate of its paid up share capital free reserves and security premium account nothing but net worth so basically up to net worth 179 3d up to net worth 179 3d beyond net worth 181c beyond net worth 181c up to net worth beyond net worth so uh, just to quickly revise money can be lent also borrowed also borrowing i'll come to it now money can be lent also borrowed also if i am lending money up to 60 percent same dialogue puc frsp 100 percent bmr unanimous pfi we already seen this beyond net worth prohibited we already seen this but if i delve into it further can i give it to directors or interested parties is a revision of what we have discussed 
sir vision only is getting blurred revision yeah uh, to directors or interested parties 1851 prohibited 1852 restricted we have seen what is it special resolution explanatory statement principal business activity 185 3 185 is not applicable so i need to obviously go to 186 or 179 3f whenever i pass 179 3 obviously mgt 14 also welcome this we know already now moving on others now other than these fellows uh, that is will include 185 3 also if it is md or whole time director as you know only loan covered part of conditions of service or scheme special resolution scheme on the other hand if it is uh, employees if it is employees or employee if i give any loan normal loan if i give 186 is not covered and we have already seen 179 3f but i mean linking little bit of winter also in a sense in the chart i will do it if i am can the company give a loan to employees so that the employees can buy the shares of the company itself won't it amount to buyback actually i am giving loan to you you are buying my shares it will amount to buyback but there's one exception under 673b and 3c where they say if you are giving a loan which is equal to 6 months salary if you are giving a loan which equals to 6 months of your salary no problem employee salary employee can be given a loan equal to 6 months of his salary with the sole purpose of purchasing shares of the company allowed so under that it is 67 3b and 3c plus 179 3f mgt 14 has to be filed mgt 14 has to be filed very very simple then for others for others what is the scene very simple body corporate or person if it is uh, lending money to that 186 apart from that all the others which are covered under 186 11 where 186 will not apply then 179 3f mgt 14 179 3f this was the scene with respect to lending but what about borrowing that is again a, a, a question that they regularly ask in the exam nowadays one is what now because you have seen beyond net worth so i can split it into two that is within net worth beyond net worth if i am borrowing up to mind you up to 100 percent of puc frsp if i am borrowing up to 100 percent of puc frsp then 179 3d board meeting resolution board meeting resolution and mgt 14 and this can be delegated to whom managing director or principal officer now the senior if it is beyond beyond 100 percent paid up capital free reserve security premium account now these things will only include that is the part given here when i say borrow money what they say apart from the temporary loans they have said temporary loans means what guys loans repayable on demand or within six months loans repayable on demand or within six months from the date of the loan such as short term cash credit arrangements discounting of bill and other issue of other short term of a seasonal credit anything which is less than six months is called temporary loans now will that temporary loans also be counted in that uh, you know borrowing no temporary loan should not be counted what is temporary loan repayable on demand or within six months from the date of the loan such as short term cash credit discounting of bills and issue of other short term loans of a seasonal character but does not include does not include what this is again if i take a four month loan is it a short term loan yes but i need to see the purpose of the loan if i take a four month loan but i take that four month loan to buy an asset financial expenditure of a capital nature the company borrows has a very short term four month loan car loan they take and they buy a car company buys a car with a five months four months loan is it a short term loan actually yeah because it's a short term borrowing but the law specifically says temporary loan does not include loan raised for purpose of financial expenditure of a capital nature even if it is a three month car loan it is deemed to be borrowing it is deemed to be borrowing it is deemed to be borrowing so if i borrow uh, you know 40 lakhs from icici bank to buy a 
car though it is short term it is deemed to be borrowing it will come in my calculation it will come in my calculation if i take for example a 5 month working capital loan from sigma working capital limited then will it come in the calculation or not what do you think if i take a working capital loan of 5 months from uh, sigma nbfc will it come in uh, what do you say working capital requirements or not i mean will it come in uh, temporary loan or not it will not come in temporary loan wrong answer or will it come in temporary loan will it come in the calculation or not it will come in the calculation asked in the exam by the way see temporary loan obtained from companies bankers only banking companies here and that to companies bankers any other nbfc or any other company which is lending money just like that is not covered asked in the exam already sigma only was the example that's why i told the same thing right so again important point loans from other bodies corporate loans from other persons shall not be considered here if i take a 5 month working capital loan from one more company it is uh, who is not a company's banker who is not a banking company what do you think will it come no in the sense will it be part of my calculation yes it will be part of the calculation it will be not part of the exclusion it will be not part of the exclusion these are all small points that we need to see so if you check this again yeah only long term loans plus capex loans any period plus temporary loans from other than companies bankers everything will be taken into the calculation of borrowings and it says on oh, small point it says long term loans more than 6 months so exactly 6 months not there 181c plus 179 3d board meeting resolution plus special resolution and uh, it's a combination of 181c and 179 3d so an mgt 14 both the points you should fill one for what 179 3d one for 181c because you are passing a special resolution so this is regarding 181c every special resolution shall specify the total amount up to which monies may be borrowed by the board of directors amount borrowed in excess without approval will be valid only if the lender proves that he advanced the loan in good faith and without knowledge that the limit imposed by that clause has been exceeded so amount borrowed in excess without approval so you have gone beyond the net worth not taken approval so who will will that bind the company is the question or will what do you say uh, doctrine of indoor management apply they say doctrine of indoor management will apply only if the lender proves that he gave it in good faith and without knowledge that the limit imposed by the clause had been he has to prove it if he does not prove it then doctrine of constructive notice will apply i will tell the lender you have given money beyond what they are we are supposed to take and you gave the money to director thinking that he'll pump into the company he has not pumped into the company so now you can recover the money directly from the director not from me doctrine of constructive notice ignorantia juris non excusat you are expected to know the law right so 181d last part to remit or give time for the repayment of any debt due from a director to remit or give time to remit means contract of remission accepting lesser fulfillment of the promise to remit or even give time for the repayment of any debt due from a director so any director who has given who has required to pay anything for example that say managing director can he take a loan yes as per what conditions of service or scheme now he has given a loan has taken a loan of almost 1 crore rupees at uh, 10% per annum interest for 5 years can the board of directors change the terms and conditions and make it 6% in this 10 years can they do so no that is why this section is there remit or give time remit means what changing the years 5 years to 7 years and all those i mean 5 years to 7 years is give time 10% to 6% that is called remission cannot do so without again special resolution so this completes what cluster 1 2 3 4 done so after the break it will be cluster number 5 so obviously it is like torture for you but this torture is good because you are finishing off everything today only later then it will only be 
you know this thing so if any of the feelings come that what i can go home and sleep now control those feelings attend the class finish of the things because if you go home four more will happen so i should have gone to the particular class so that's why finish it off right you just need to sit here i am doing the talking so just sit and grasp everything okay guys see you 40 minutes